classification is you can label them in retrospect as what they are supposing a 6 month old child come to you with the second episode of bees you won't be able to say whether it is transient persistent or late onset so it is a retrospective diagnosis whereas the current diagnosis or the running commentary would be your episodic or your multi trigger bees so these phenotype are interchangeable and they are not always stable and there are multiple contributing factor other than your genetics is being contributed from the environmental uh, pressures so the viral infections are the common thing which triggers a wheeze most of the time when we say viruses we always think in terms of only rsv but the most common one is the human rhinovirus and rhinovirus there are more than 100 serotypes and they don't have any cross protection that's why you can have a running nose now and you can also have a running nose after 2 weeks or 3 weeks so that by itself can trigger a episode of wheeze and uh, this most of the time it is common viral triggered wheeze is common in children but this can also happen in older children and in adults by 50% so what are the risk factors for asthma the moment we say risk factors we talk about modified asthma predictive index that is more than four episode with one major or two minor criteria the major and minor criteria are episodes of eczema or parental asthma or allergic sensitization to either aero allergen or a food allergen and also is a full person more than four in that particular child but here the problem is the positive uh, asthma predictive index substantially increases the probability of future asthma but a negative uh, index does not mean that the child will never have an asthma so it is uh, just like uh, placing a blind bet just because the asthma predictive index is positive you cannot vouch and say you are going to be an asthmatic and put on any intervention just because it is negative you cannot say you will never develop an asthma and uh, leave them spot free so it is only over a period of time we need to wait and watch how things unfold for you and overall now the recent understanding is a child who is a recurrent beezer in early childhood if it continues to be even in future or later childhood that is called as a true asthma if there is going to be a component of atopy in the child this is called an atopic asthma otherwise overall it is only the persistent of symptom or we is manifesting over a period of time so with regards to risk factors as clinician what we should be worried is if there is frequent symptoms of bees in the first year of life or if there is an eczema in the child or if there is an elevated ige or a maternal history of asthma or maternal smoking these are probably a increased risk factor for the child predisposing to asthma later in the life so when do we investigate so asthma as i said is a clinical diagnosis most of the time nothing is required investigation or reserved more so in younger children to diagnose mimics if there are red flags we'll see what red flags are and to see the severity and certainty of the persons of comorbid condition and in real difficult situation where we are not able to differentiate what is what with recurrent wheezing so the red flags here are daily moist or productive cough antony is there and any child with running nose or sneeze right from birth also think in terms of uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia children with feeding difficulty choking drooling any chest pain exertional dyspnea hemoptysis change in the voice any noisy breathing don't uh, take it for granted don't always live in terms of laryngeal malaria any child with a voice change uh, persisting voice change any voice change more than one week or 10 days better be careful and uh, any child with failure to thrive or not gaining adequate weight or oscillatory finding either in the cvs or rs any child with uh, digital clubbing or persistent hypoxia or cyanosis these are the red flag sign you have to be doubly sure and these are the group where we cannot label them as asthma even if they present as asthma as an add on or a uh, additional uh, asthma presentation and not a basic uh, diagnosis of asthma and we have to be careful with any children with orocranial facial anomaly and any child with uh, thoracic skeletal abnormality any child with neuromuscular or neurodevelopmental anomaly and any other multi system disorders or an immunodeficiency in them before labeling it as asthma you have to be careful that there can be many other uh, etiology operating in them which are manifesting with recurrent wheeze so you always remember about the red flags 
before we labeled it as asthma irrespective of age more so in younger children less than 5 years of age and the investigations most of the time what we do is dc dc esr man2 and the ige with a chest x ray and man2 here it tells you it's a tb infection but it will not tell you whether it is an asthma or not and att should be reserved only to tb infection and for tb uh, uh, disease and increased eosinophil and uh, skin test for rast and ige just tells you there is an atopic tendency this again has to be correlated with symptoms and uh, diethyl carnosin is used as an anti eosinophilic drug whereas it is an anti filarial drug where filariasis can cause increased eosinophil count so these things we have to have in mind and chest x rays are not diagnostic of asthma and they can have a normal x ray can have an hyper aerated x ray or a perihilar infiltrate or microatelectasis hyper aeration just tells you there is significant air trapping and rarely with uh, complicated asthma acute exacerbation that can be secondary pneumonia atelectasis or air leak and many of the time when we take uh, children x ray with wheez you tend to see some perihilar or parahilar infiltrates more so in younger children that is because the pores of cone that is intraalveolar pores or pores of lambert that is the alveolar bronchial connections uh, which provides collateral for uh, airway aeration or underdeveloped more so in children less than 3 to 4 years of age because of that there is no collateral uh, air circulation so when that particular place is blocked there is mucus plugging and microatelectasis this leads on to lot of microatelectasis changes which mimics like a pneumonia that's what we call it as a bronchopneumonic picture so we have to be careful on that when do we treat here treatment is we all know about asthma qualifiers and we all know about recurrent wheezes here we treat uh, wheezing only for if there is a recurrent wheeze component or if there is an exacerbation to it recurrent wheeze in young children look for alternate to diagnosis and also watch out for red flags in recurrent wheeze with polypheas i'll tell you what the polypheas are in case if there is a recurrent wheeze in younger children without polypheas and if it is severe meaning they are getting admitted more than once or if it is persistent even between episode they are not totally fine and if there are frequent episode that is more than one episode in a month or more than three in a season meaning if they are getting almost every month symptom despite the recurrent background then even without polypheas you can treat them like asthma so the qualifiers for asthma are uh, recurrent wheezes with uh, afibrillar episode or personal or family atopy of asthma nocturnal exacerbation exercise induced or ac- activity induced symptom trigger induced symptom like smoke and uh, uh, other irritants seasonal exacerbation relief with proper dilator with or without oral steroids so this is the traditional one which you all know with regards to persistent asthma overall if you see all the uh, recommendation including the gina which keeps uh, changing every year it leads on to a lot of confusion less than two times three times four times what we are talking about nobody you know when we are classifying we cannot be having a uh, tabular column by the side and correlating with the child symptom overall the conceptually we need to know this is assessed over a period of time the reasonable period of time would be the last three months at least that is the level of uh, memory which we can rely upon when with regards to the history with certainty if it is an intermittent asthma uh, we have to have four qualifiers meaning it has to be occasional brief mild and non life threatening so if one of the four is not been met out properly then we have to call them as persistent symptom so what are these four to have certain objectivity occasional meaning it is not more than uh, one per month or less than two in three months meaning you are not having more than or equal to one every month and it has to be brief episode four to five days and it should be mild meaning it should not be affecting your sleep play eating or your school attendance and it should not be life threatening night threatening meaning it should not warrant a hospitalization or er visit other than anxiety purpose if it is for a real medical indication then probably it is taken as uh, life threatening right so occasional brief mild and non life threatening say for example even if you are having recurrent wheeze 
you have the last week more than 6 months ago but still if it is going to be an acute severe exacerbation requiring hospitalization for all practical purpose you would be categorized as persistent symptom and not as an intermittent symptom that is one thing important and with regards to exacerbation this is one thing where the parent themselves will want you to treat any presence or worsening of signs and symptoms of airflow obstruction which was not there before is considered to be uh, exacerbation and it can happen secondary to an external agent like your infection or pollution or it could be because of poor adherence to control in some without any known risk factor just like that it can manifest with exacerbation irrespective of whatever exacerbation is exacerbation and frequent presentation warrants controller medication and why to treat and how to treat why to treat in sense you should have a symptom free good quality of life and you should have a normal life pattern normal growth and development minimal use of relievers and minimal side effect because of the medicine in which uh, which we are using so in less than 5 years what is been said is always start with low dose inhaled corticosteroid then double the dose uh, whereas in older children we uh, tend to add laba in younger children laba doesn't come first in the role we always start with low dose of steroid then we up the dose of steroid then we can add a ltra to it then if it still doesn't uh, subside then as a last resort we can uh, look in for a role of laba though that's not been straight forwardly approved by guidelines so with regards to inhaled steroids what we should understand is just by increasing the dose of inhaled steroids we will not be able to control all uh, symptoms of asthma so the maximum dose of steroid in younger uh, children less than 12 years with regards to budesonide is 400 with regards to fluticasone is 200 whereas in more than 12 years with regards to budesonide it is 800 and fluticasone it is 500 so never breach this dose with regards to the steroid uh, inhalers watch we use as a controller that is one thing which we have to remember overall with regards to preschool wheezing first episode in a natural first episode always give a trial of bronchodilator if it responds you proceed uh, like any other wheeze if it doesn't respond systematic care with as like bronchiolitis with regards to recurrent episode in an younger age group watch for red flags and risk factors if it is present always immediately well wait for alternate diagnosis if there are no red flags or risk factors label them as episodic or multi trigger wheeze based on the phenotypic presentation and keep watching for qualifiers over a period of time if there are qualifiers still you can straight away respective ways call them as childhood asthma if there are no qualifiers persist to follow up with follow up you have no other alternative or wanting diagnosis then still they could be inching towards childhood asthma so we have to remember here preschool wheeze it doesn't mean that we should not utter the word of childhood asthma in a preschool age group so we have to have certain with certainty ruled out uh, other uh, diagnosis or there should not be any other suspicion for any other alternative diagnosis then over a period of time with the phenotypic background with or without uh, qualifiers you can still call them as childhood asthma for want of treat uh, appropriate treatment otherwise we will not be treating them as they should be uh, supposed to be handled with so with regards to the management recurrent episodes with or without qualifiers what happens is any recurrent episodes you can put them on low dose of inhaled corticosteroid that is 200 micrograms per day of budesonide and if there is good control then you probably call them as asthma you stop after 3 months and if it is going to recur you can restart on that and previously there was no clarity on the other wing if it is not controlled then probably what they thought was only alternative diagnosis here i beg to differ and the latest uh, diagnosis uh, latest gina have also addressed this aspect if it is not controlled evaluate and follow up it could have an alternative diagnosis or if there is no alternative diagnosis it should still be a component of uncontrolled asthma so here again you treat them as asthma so in preschool wheezes even if you are inching towards calling them as asthma first give a three months try then you stop if it happens again you can start for three more months and the second time or the third time 
if it is going to happen again with certainty you can treat them as like your older children with asthma so that's the uh, overall uh, uh, difference in the management of preschool visas and there are few changes what we need to know which will not apply for preschool children for now that is your mart that is your maintenance and reliever therapy in children over 6 years now uh, people are of the view that we should not be using only beta 2 agonist in isolation uh, in older children and whenever a beta 2 agonist is being used it has to be always in conjunction with the intel corticosteroids so the mart that is your single maintenance and reliever therapy that is a proticosone and butisonate combination here the long acting component is only uh, formatrol and not your salmatrol and uh, this can be used or whenever you are not using the combination when you use only beta 2 agonist you have to also use uh, separate inhaled corticosteroids in conjunction over that period of time and children with mild asthma previously intermittent asthma and mild persistent asthma was called as mild asthma and now they say there is no difference uh, distinction between intermittent and mild persistent asthma as both are at a risk of severe exacerbation and this risk can be decreased with uh, giving them inhaled corticosteroids and children who are on high dose inhaled corticosteroids and laba are considered to be severe asthmatics so that is a, a new definition which we have to know and people who are already on high dose inhaled corticosteroids and laba azithromycin 3 days a week can be added in uncontrolled patient and they say this decreases exacerbation due to eosinophilic and non eosinophilic asthma and lama that is your long acting uh, muscarinic anti uh, anticholinergic like your tiotropium and all can be used after 6 years of age in people who are not controlled with uh, in high dose inhaled corticosteroids and laba these are for older children which i am trying to enumerate now lot of talk is about covid and asthma and asthma medication <clears throat> irrespective of whatever you have been prescribed irrespective of covid uh, pandemic you need not panic and stop away with them you continue with your prescribed asthma medication the way they have to be and there is no increased risk of covid 19 in people with asthma unless they are having uncontrolled asthma or those who have had recent oral corticosteroids for an acute exacerbation and flu vaccine is recommended for all asthmatics more so in this pandemic and the minimum of two week gap between flu and covid vaccine is what has been recommended and overall many conditions causes wheezing and may mimic or coexist with asthma in a younger age group and noisy breathing or are not synonymous with wheezing and phenotypes vary with time and it's not a water tight compartment so i uh, see the revolution over a period of time diagnosis is most of the time clinical even in preschool uh, children younger the child greater the possibility of alternative diagnosis that is the most important caveat which you have to remember think of alternate diagnosis always when there is an unusual symptom or a poor response in either scenarios think about an alternate uh, diagnosis uh, most of the time you will be able to pinpoint on one investigations are predominantly to rule out alternative diagnosis only in rarest of rare situation to confirm the diagnosis of asthma there is no disease modifying therapy uh, meaning uh, the treatment initiated is to have a good quality of life at that particular point in time and to have a normal growth and development and not to modify the future happenings uh, because of that disease thank you uh uh thank you dr sirvalan uh, i think dr sirvalan has excellently covered uh under 5 weeks and uh, is uh, any questions i think uh, probably sirvalan has touched the most uh, not only under 5 weeks as well as asthma uh sorry are you hearing sirvalan yeah yes yes and uh, i think uh, one question somebody asked that uh, he already stressed that point 
uh, any trial with a recurrent base, uh, kindly enlighten the ICS trial. I think you already sent up on that. Uh, you want to uh, uh, highlight? Just you, you just to tell them, uh, Siva. See, uh, uh, with regards to asthma, it is a over a period of time diagnosis. So if you are not clear about why, if it is asthma or so, you can wait for the next episode to happen. But you cannot keep waiting endlessly years and months together to label them as asthma. So if there is any recurrent bees with an uh, without an, any automated diagnosis, irrespective of age, you can put them on a trial of inhaled the corticosteroids. That is the low dose that is 100 microgram in the morning and evening with a spacer and a mask for three months. And uh, if it is good on control, you can stop and see how it is. In future, if it is found wanting and the child continues to have recurrent bees with the infection or without infection, then probably we can restart on inhaled corticosteroids and go ahead in the way as we treat older individuals. Some people say second time give a three-month uh, trial and stop. And if it is found wanting the third time with no other alternative diagnosis, then treat them like older children with asthma. Have I answered uh, the question, sir? Yes, sir. I think uh, Sir Val has uh, highlighted about the ICS trial. And uh, he has broadly covered everything, mostly about the phenotypes and how it is confused and what should be followed according to the ERS, ERS guideline in under five years. At one point of time, you should make a diagnosis of asthma, you should not miss it. And at that point onwards, you have to treat asthma even though it is occurring below five years. I think uh, uh, its points are very well taken. And somebody has in between asked about uh, the role of uh, uh, osteometry and all. I think I can advise them say that uh, till it is not validated. I think below uh, five years, uh, your clinical parameters are very, very important. Okay. Uh, he has been telling about the qualifiers and uh, how the family history, personal history, and uh, personal history of he is also talked about that uh, asthma uh, modified asthma predictive index. I think these will be very useful and all. I think uh, I have not have met any other questions from other side. And the last one thing is uh, touched upon many things because he's a bronchoscopist. Sometimes even the uh, V's could be due to structural causes. about the structural causes that I made up. You are asking me, sir? Uh, yes, yes. You finished? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Airway malaria, any noisy breathing, uh, it can be associated with airway malaria. The upper airway malaria is your laryngeal malaria. The lower airway malaria is your bronchial malaria or your tracheal malaria. Meaning the upper airway malaria are quite obvious with regards to the external sound. Whereas the lower airway malaria are uh, more evident with your internal sound like your wheezing. So here again, <laughs> Uh, uh, there is a common misconcept, like uh, it's not a misconcept, there's a common belief that uh, if there is a bronchomalacia, the 101% the cause of wheeze is due to bronchomalacia. That attains with severe uh, uh, certainty only if it is a persisting wheeze not responding to anything. Otherwise, here again, a child with bronchomalacia, if it is as an intermittent or a recurrent wheeze, meaning the child is normal in between, so bronchomalacia is there. Top and above, something is causing further constriction, presenting like a bees. So here, irrespective of bronchomalacia, treat the bees as a bees it is for the merit of its recurrent presentation and not name on the bronchomalacia alone to stop a, a controller therapy in the child. But it's true that in severe bronchomalacia, there can be paradoxical collapse of your airways with beta-2 agonist, causing further trigger uh, to the extent of a sudden dropout like episode, but that will happen only if it is more than 75% collapsibility presenting with a persistent or a severe manifestation and not with recurrent manifestations. Yes, I think already we are exceeding the limit. He also talked about the dietal conversation. He warned about that uh, uh, not to use uh, randomly and all. With this, uh, I think uh, if there is no questions, I will call upon the next speaker, uh, Dr. Sarath Balaji. Uh, I thank Dr. Sivabharam for his center, a wonderful lecture on uh, under five Vs. Uh, thank you, sir. 
thank you very much and we will give a gift clap to him uh, now we the next important talking that is recurrent pneumonia recurrent pneumonia by psychology sir is it audible and clear sir audible sir sir vijay sir and sir can you proceed sir sir balanji but i could not see your uh, introductory slide but still i, uh, I do want to introduce dr sarath balaji uh, he is is one of the excellent pulmonologists very academician and uh, he is a well appreciated uh, i think now he is assistant now he is a professor assistant professor at uh, institute of child health he is holding the post and uh, uh, he is a very good bronchoscopist okay and uh, i think uh, he is a uh, Uh, he, uh, he is going to talk on recurrent pneumonia. Recurrent pneumonia uh, revisited. I welcome Dr. Uh, Sarad Balaji. Uh, good morning to my teachers, friends, as well as as well as my postgraduates. <clears throat> the topic for today is recurrent pneumonia. So I am Dr. Sarad Balaji from uh, Institute of Child Health, Chennai. So we are going to approach it uh, as case to case basis recurrent pneumonia in children so before that i would dedicate all my works to my past present and future chiefs assistant professor fellows and to all my dearest post graduates right so you all know this is a age old definition what do you mean by recurrent pneumonia if it occurs two episodes in one year or three episodes ever in between you should have a complete radiological and clinical resolution a well known point nothing new persistent pneumonia uh, clinical symptoms along with the radiological abnormality some book says four weeks some book says six weeks so let it be one month or more despite adequate treatment with the appropriate antibiotics uh, uh, but the so recurrent uh, one sec okay so the one thing is there are certain features certain etiologies that can cause recurrent pneumonia there are certain things that can cause persistent pneumonia but it is not a clear cut line which demarcates these etiologies will cause recurrent pneumonias and these etiologies will cause persistent pneumonia so a foreign body can present with persistent pneumonia or recurrent pneumonia an immunodeficiency can present with persistent pneumonia or recurrent pneumonia a cf can present with persistent pneumonia or recurrent pneumonia so as a result of which we need to discuss it as a whole topic we cannot separate this one as disease persistent pneumonia disease recurrent pneumonia it all depends upon the competency of the physician and availability of resources in that particular center so but one point that is is x ray a mandatory after each and every episode of pneumonia no guidelines whether indian guidelines bts guidelines or uh, any other guidelines recommend recommends x ray chest for mild uncomplicated pneumonia because it is often diagnosed on based on tachypnea retractions and danger signs so whether we need to take an x ray for each and every case of suspected pneumonia see but early identification and treatment may be beneficial if you take an x ray and practitioner should consider radiographic confirmation at least from the second episode or even in the first episode in the presence of abnormal clinical findings like localized persistent crepitations or reduced air entry even after resolution of fever and tachypnea so is x ray mandatory after the first episode of resolu clinical resolution of pneumonia if you have a doubt whether i am dealing with a case of localized crepitations or localized reduced air entry yes you can take an x ray even after the first episode of resolution of pneumonia so this is my first case so how we are going to deal with our case this is our first case this is a 2 year old thrice admitted with cough and breathlessness fever doubtful history treated with iv antibiotics and nebulizer referred as a case of recurrent right lower lobe pneumonia 
So this is my first case. So a two-year-old thrice admitted referred as a case of recurrent right lower lobe pneumonia. So what is this? This is the X-ray. The X-ray revealed a radio dense lesion on the right side, retrocardiac area. But on CT angiogram, because the child did not have any fever, did not have any cough, the child child had a mild desaturation and mild clubbing along with signs and symptoms of minimal CCF. When we took a CT pulmonary angiogram, it revealed a large dilated pulmonary vein draining into the IVC. On X-ray, there is right lung hypoplasia. So this is a case of scimitar syndrome with enlarged dilated pulmonary artery presenting as a case of recurrent pneumonia. So what does it mean? So another case, first case, second case, father recovered from COVID, took X-ray for his asymptomatic kit, treated with IV antibiotics, no response. So this case was referred as right lower lobe pneumonia. Look at this dense lesion. Some uh, pediatrician uh, treated this case as a pneumonia uh, with uh, IV antibiotics and oral antibiotics and are referred because the child did not show any resolution with respect to the radiology. As far as the child is concerned, clinically he is stable. But when we took a barium swallow, it revealed a esophageal duplication cyst. So what does it mean? Rule number one, find out whether it is a true pulmonary infiltrate or extra pulmonary infiltrate, yeah, an enlarged thymus, an esophageal duplication cyst, an abnormal dilated vessels, lymph nodes, and anatomical masses can present with can present with persistent patch, which cannot be pulmonary, it can be extra pulmonary. Point number one. Point number two. So what is this? This is with respect to case three. This is a six-year-old. Recurrent pneumonia for the past one and a half years. Six times admitted in Vellore. Now presented with the tachypnea. So recurrent pneumonia past one and a half years. Six times admitted. Look at this. Pneumonia involving many lobes. Are upper lobe and lower lobe of, of right lung. As well as some infiltrates on the left lung in December. January, again, left upper lobe is involved. March, again, upper both right and left lungs are involved. Is this a case of recurrent pneumonia? The child is admitted with a recurrent cough, breathlessness, along with the tachypnea, with some desaturation, with the bilateral infiltrates in all these X-rays. Is it a case of recurrent pneumonia? But when we looked here, each an episode were not associated with the fever. The CBC showed severe anemia each and every time. Hemoglobin of 4.5, 6.5 grams each and every time. When the child was referred from Vellur, this time it was 9.5. When the child reached ICH, it was 8.5. And X-ray showed mild cardiomegaly. So we strongly suspect that blood is leaking into the lung parenchyma, manifesting as a recurrent pneumonia. We did ball. Ball revealed 80% hemosiderin lad and macrophages. Turned out to be a case of pulmonary hemosiderosis. So what is rule number two? If it is pulmonary infiltrate, whether it is a case of pneumonia or whether it is a case of recurrent lung infiltrate or a persistent lung infiltrate, our pulmonary hemosiderosis, your vaginal granulomatosis, your sickle cell anemia, your hypersensitive pneumonitis, your asthma along with the mucus plug can produce either recurrent or uh, persistent lung infiltrates, which might not be due to pneumonia or alveolar opacities or consolidation. So first point is pulmonary or extra pulmonary. Second point is if it is pulmonary, is it a pneumonia or it is a lung infiltrate? So what is the third case? So the third case is, uh, this is a 10 year old, right upper lobe pneumonia treated with the zone Discharged with the cephodoxum in the uh, on October 2020. Look at this October 2020. So look at this on 311. Again, there was a radiological density. 1911, there was a radiological density. 411, there was a radiological density. And 253, there was a resolution. So this case almost took six months for complete resolution. 
but in between the child was totally asymptomatic by looking at these small small air pockets we were thinking in terms of starting an att but the child did not have any symptoms and we waited for about 6 months and the there was a complete radiological resolution so whenever we de- we are dealing with a case of recurrent pneumonia it is not only the lung infiltrate whether it is persistent or recurrent it should also be counted along with your uh, clinical symptoms so what is the third rule is if there is a clinical recovery there are high chance he has to have a radiological persistence so when clinically the child is doing well and my clinical examination did not reveal any absent arentry did not reveal any localized crepitation and my child is doing well without any fever or tachypnea i need to consider this case must be due to slow radiological resolution and there was a complete recovery and adenovirus mycoplasma streptococcus pyogenes are prone for this delayed radiological clearance so this is rule 3 and the next case what is this case an one year old child low grade fever one month cough one month cb not negative manto negative contact negative vf vr increased in the left infraclavicular area air entry is reduced to below so this is a typical case of collapse consolidation in a country like india a collapse consolidation with a low grade fever of one month then cough one man should be considered as a case of tuberculosis so we wanted to rule out whether this collapse and consolidation is due really due to tuberculosis by by but my manto is negative contact is negative so we proceeded for fiber optic bronchoscopy fiber optic bronchoscopy revealed a groundnut and after removal of that groundnut there was a good radiological resolution and collapse resolved so what does it mean Our our foreign body is ubiquitous foreign body can be an epidemic pandemic endemic presentation in pediatric age group whenever you have a recurrent or persistent pneumonia always rule out to foreign body foreign body foreign body particularly if it occurs in a single low and what is this case this is a 2 year old girl cough for the past 2 months no contact manto negative glcb not negative the child was treated with azithromycin amoxiclav but the cough persists mother unhappy but the child is playful otherwise look at this this 2019 there was a radiological uh, infiltrate in the right uh, lower lobe and in the, in the next since the mother was insisting as the cough is persistent sir even though there was no significant fever even though the child was playful no loss of appetite we took an x ray in the next exactly one month later again we could see some infiltrates so we thought that it must be due to poor it might may be due to slow radiological recovery as we thought in our previous case but here the mother is unhappy here we had a localized crepes as a result of which we proceeded for a fiber optic bronchoscopy so this is involve a single lobe is it due to tb is it due to foreign body is it due to congenital lung malformations let us see always 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 same low persistent or recurrent go for fiber optic bronchoscopy we did a fiber optic bronchoscopy and we did a ball ball revealed the here ball revealed a mycobacterium tuberculosis so what is the carry home message when you have a clinical persistent along with radiological persistent in the first thing the child was the sick you have a radio you have a collapse and consolidation in the next case even though the child was happy playful without any significant fever the mother said there was a persistent cough clinical examination revealed persistent low crepes in the infrascapular area and fob revealed foreign body in the first condition as well as tuberculosis in the second okay, condition so uh, what does it mean wherever it may be whether it is a bc or ad your tuberculosis and foreign body in any case of recurrent and persistent pneumonia will be endemic epidemic and pandemic as long as we exist they exist in the world what is my next case this is a 10 year old uh, june 2018 pneumonia right lower low 
January 2019, pneumonia, right lower lobe. Low. This is a 10-year-old child. So what happens? So this is the CT picture of the child. This is the CT picture of the child. Uh, show some form of cystic lesions in the right lower lobe. How can a 10-year-old child, whenever you have a cystic lesion, recurrent pneumonia involving the same lobe, we will think in terms of a congenital lung malformation. But how can it occur in a 10-year-old child? See, this can happen. It doesn't mean that congenital malformation need to be present in either immediately after birth or in the during early periods of infancy. It can occur at any point of time. And we had three cases in which sequestration, your CCAM presenting at 10 years of age group. In the CCAM, we saw the case came in the year 2019. We don't know really whether it is a staphylococcal cyst or a CCAM. We had a great doubt. We had whether we need to explore it or not. But 2010, the child was born when we saw the antenatal ultrasound. It revealed a radio dense lesion on the right lower lobe. So this means what each and everything should be given so much of importance with respect to our uh, with respect to our treating a kid. And what about this case? Recurrent pneumonia, same lobe, same lobe. So this case turned out to be a case of CCAM as well as sequestration, and it is called a hybrid lesion. We did a CT angio on its session. It also revealed a cystic lesion, turned out to be a hybrid lesion. This is recurrent pneumonia involving same lobe. So what is this? This is a eight-year-old boy. Recurrent pneumonia since 2018, same site, Treated as TB, good response, resolved pneumonia, again there is a recurrence. Again there is a recurrence. So look at this, January 2018, 18, there was a, a left pneumonia. This is not January, this is June 2018, complete resolution. And then February 2019, again we had a pneumonia. June 2019, again there was a clear resolution. In this meantime, the child was on ATT. But again, January 2020, the child had a left lower lobe pneumonia. But by this time, we proceeded for fiber optic bronchoscopy, which revealed a luminal mass, which we took punch biopsy, and it turned out to be a case of mucoepidermoid carcinoma of the left main bronchus. It is an unusual diagnosis, but the thing is, pneumonia involving the same lobe again and again, what we need to do and what is the approach. So when you have a clinical recurrence and radiological recurrence in the same site, you need to consider whether it is a unilobar or multilobar lobe. If it is a unilobar, it can be a airway narrowing for which you need to do a fiber optic bronchoscopy. If it is a congenital lung malformation, you need to do a you need to do a CT and CT either CECT or your CT angio, or it can be due to focal bronchiectasis as a result of necrotizing severe pneumonia. So when you have a pneumonia involving same lobe, always first to go for FOB to look for either retained foreign body, endobronchial TB, and the neoplasm such as mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Or if it is a bronchial wall anomaly, it can be a bronchomalacia stricture. Or it can be due to an external compression like lymph node, mass, or vascular ring. So as far as recurrent pneumonia, same lobe is concerned, you need the, invest, the first investigation of choice is fiber optic bronchoscopy. If my fiber optic bronchoscopy is normal, then I will go for CT either with or without angio to look for sequestration, CPAM, bronchogenic cyst, and aberrant upper lobe uh, bronchus from the trachea. So what is the next rule? So next is clinical recurrence, radiological recurrence, different site. So here we saw same site, different site are involving multiple lobes. So what is this? This is a one-year-old child, history of cough since six months of age, admitted twice for pneumonia, 
look at this involving multiple lobes seventh month involving multiple lobes involving multiple lobes so whenever any child has pneumonia involving multiple lobes the first and foremost question that you need to ask is feeding history whether the child is aspirating with respect to feeding so whenever you see a case of recurrent pneumonia instead of thinking cf instead of thinking pid instead of thinking pcd the first thing you need to rule out is whether the the child is aspirating with each and every feeds so if the child is aspirating with each and every feeds with each and every feeds then you need to consider some problem with respect to either you can have a cleft palate which is left identified even i had missed a case four months back the i detected uh, a submucosal cleft palate on the fourth visit itself on the fourth visit only so you either it can be a what is that submucosal cleft palate or it can be an hypotonic child due to mitochondrial issues or it can be a cerebral palsy leading to palatopharyngeal incoordination or cough with each and every feeds an h type fistula with a child having aspiration only after having solid feeds what does it mean esophageal stenosis the child is having problem with the liquid if liquid feeds it can can be due to achalasia cardia rarely it is due to gerd so in any case if it is if you have recurrent pneumonia the first thing is observing the child while feeding asking for whether it is liquid or solid second point is doing a barium swallow either video assisted along with esophago bronchoscopy or a simple barium swallow will yield so many diagnoses so here in this case in this case look at this the simple barium swallow revealed an h type fistula which was confirmed in our fiber optic bronchoscopy so this is the h type fistula so what is this case so this is a 7 year old child uh, consanguineous marriage soya sepsis at 11 months recurrent skin infections eczema present recurrent episodes of cough fever breathlessness everything admitted four times for pneumonia look here multi lobar pneumonia february multi lobar pneumonia again involving right and left lower lobe so here we are dealing with a case of multi lobar pneumonia but a 7 year old child we cannot expect a aspiration in this case in particular so after ruling out aspiration what are all the things we need to rule out so if it is a case of multi lobar pneumonia either it can be an immunodeficiency or it can be a primary ciliary dyskinesia or it can be cystic fibrosis so we have been discovering so many cases of cystic fibrosis so many cases of immunodeficiency as we uh, start learning about all these things so multi lobar pneumonia after mm -hmm. ruling out aspiration can be pcd can be cystic fibrosis or can be immuno deficiency the first thing to rule out in any case of suspected primary immunodeficiency is do an hiv then start doing other investigations for primary immunodeficiency so in this cases so in this case turned out to be a case of an absolute lymphoeosinophil count of 6000 flow cytometry turned out to be normal we did doc8 mutation turned out to be a case of hyper ige syndrome so recurrent pulmonary infiltrates multiple lobes so when you have a recurrent sino pulmonary infiltrate infections after 6 months recurrent otitis media pneumonia sinusitis after 6 months of age the first thing you need to do is immunoglobulin profile second point when you have a persistent pneumonia between 2 to 6 months of age along with the diarrhea then it can be a t cell disorder again do an immunoglobulin profile and do a lymphocyte subset analysis when you have a recurrent pneumonia along with the uh, skin abscess or eczema it can be viscart aldrich syndrome which can be identified by simply looking at the uh, platelet count a chronic granulomatous disease which can be identified by elevated neutrophil count along with thrombocytosis and a hyper ig syndrome which can be identified simply by looking at the absolute eosinophil count remember before doing all these investigation in any case of recurrent pneumonia affecting multiple lobes after ruling out aspiration do an hiv then suspect all these conditions so last but not least never ever underestimate cystic fibrosis uh, we have around cmc ich as well as uh, 
Uh, in Coimbatore, all together, we have around 100 cases of cystic fibrosis so far. So it, it is not so difficult to identify cystic fibrosis, even though sweat chloride is available in only three centers in, uh, in and around uh, Tamil Nadu. A yeah, simple pneumonia associated with the low, low sodium cone because they lose sodium and chloride through salt. When your pneumonia is associated with oily stools, when you are ball, it doesn't mean that you need to do a ball. Even a induced sputum from the nasopharyngeal aspirate will reveal pseudomonas in cystic fibrosis patient. Any pneumonia with anemia, hemoglobin 4, 5 in an infant, think about cystic fibrosis. Any recurrent pneumonia with the deranged LFT, OTPT, Think about cystic fibrosis. And uh, Sneha Madam used to say, when any child during summer period with one or two episodes of vomiting, one or two episodes of diarrhea, but profound dehydration, that is called summer dehydration, comes to you, think about, uh, some, think about cystic fibrosis. So again, uh, is it, uh, uh, do we need to really do a sweat chloride test? No, a simple aquagenic skin test. So what does it mean? You and me, after immersing our hand in a lukewarm water, tap water, used to get wrinkling only after 10 minutes. But this cystic fibrosis patient, even after immersing for about three minutes, they used to get this wrinkling. So this simple tools can be applied to identify cystic fibrosis in our day-to-day -day practice. So what is the carry home? Whenever you have a recurrent pneumonia, the look whether it is pulmonary or extra pulmonary. If it is a pneumonia, is it pneumonia or lung infiltrate? If it is a lung infiltrate, it can be due to a slow recovery. And if it is true radiological and clinical persistent, whether it involves the same lobe, do a FOB, do a CT. If it involves different lobe, they rule out immunodeficiency, cystic fibrosis. Look the child while feeding. So with this, I am completing my topic. Thank you. Thank you, team IAP. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarad Balaji. Uh, I think Dr. Sarad Balaji has extensively current, uh, covered this uh, recurrent pneumonia, starting from the... Uh, actually, he also emphasized it is uh, itself is not a diagnosis, but you confront with such a condition, you have to work the case uh, till the uh, final diagnosis has been made. And he also stressed about the importance of clinical examination uh, along with the radiology. That's what very important. Don't go with the simple persistent radiological findings and all. And uh, he also tell about the common things are common. Even persist uh, this recurrent pneumonia or persistent pneumonia could be due to foreign body or like a tuberculosis also can mimic like that and all. He also showed some very rare conditions like uh, mycoepidema or carcinoma, CCAM, these conditions do present. And uh, sometimes you used to miss some egg type of fistulas that also uh, present as a recurrent pneumonia and other things. I think uh, Dr. Sarat Balaji has uh, done everything. They ask one thing, uh, how often you come across uh, these sort of uh, uh, conditions, uh, foreign body presenting as a recurrent you know, it is always present as a persistent pneumonia. Why you include that? Uh, that that's a question. Um, foreign body, if it is gets embedded in any bronchus, it can present as a persistent pneumonia, sir. But so many times we have been seeing many migratory foreign bodies, which will imp will which will which when gets embedded after forming some kind of granulation tissue after an episode of pneumonia after resolution at times it gets de-embedded and it can be migratory. A migratory foreign body can produce a recurrent pneumonia, and we have seen such cases too, sir. Yes. Uh, and one more question they ask, uh, how early you can suspect that extreme focus plus cause recurrent pneumonia and what is the best way, only by that uh, bronchoscopy or any other thing? Uh... Uh, H type fistula, as far as even for pulmonologists, at times we tend to uh, miss it. As far as this case is concerned, this case was referred from Kanchipuram. Uh, this case presented with recurrent pneumonia from day one of illness. 
the mother was so clear whenever my child takes feet it is used to get cough and the child had admitted thrice in the second admission the child was referred to us we did bronchoscopy unfortunately we missed here we missed uh, that h type of fistula we told the mother whether we we will go for a barium swallow but at that time it is a peak covid first wave no one was willing to take even our radiologist so the mother waited for about a day or two then she went again she come in the month of january we strongly again suspected uh, h type fistula we did a fiber optic uh, bronchoscopy which revealed which did not reveal we identified only during the second time but this barium swallow revealed a clear cut uh, leak in the middle of the trachea so what does it mean the first and foremost thing is history from the mother the mother was so confident whenever my child eats the child used to gets cough and there were pneumonia see there was no hypotonias to suggest you of uh, mitochondrial dysfunction there were no hypotonias to suggest any cerebral palsy and the upper airway was found to be normal no submucosal cleft palate as a result of which we did fiber optic bronchoscopy and barium swallow so uh, we cannot say fiber optic bronchoscopy is the best barium swallow is the best the first best thing is history from the mother and the suspicion should strongly be supported by barium swallow strongly should be supported by fiber optic bronchoscopy but everything starts from the history yes balaji i think uh, dr balaji has covered extensively uh, the recurrent pneumonia how to approach unilobar multilobar and the uh, uh, importance of clinical history as well as the importance of clinical examination and he has been uh, uh, from the beginning he is emphasizing uh, history and clinical examination that uh, shows how he is involved with the uh, clinical uh, uh, history and other things and he only showed enough cases how they manage uh, this side right of uh, recurrent pneumonia i think uh, without any further questions uh, we will move on to the next topic uh, uh, probably uh, we'll give a very good clap to dr sarad balaji thank you sir thank you very much now uh, i think uh, we'll call upon our third speaker and uh, she is going to uh, talk on uh, cystic fibrosis and uh, i uh, welcome dr sneha varki from vellu Uh, the madam uh, i think uh, we met long ago and uh, she is uh, doing a lot of excellent work on this uh, particular issue uh, our interest is in uh, pediatric respiratory medicine as well as particularly in the pediatric sleep studies she is very much and uh, she is going to talk on cystic fibrosis because i came to know that she have a, she is having a very good collection of cystic fibrosis and she is going to tell us how early uh, uh, you can diagnose cystic fibrosis with the available investigations and uh, i think many people say that diagnosing cystic fibrosis in infancy uh, will make the child to live for a long years i think i welcome uh, dr snega varki uh, to go uh, uh, and uh, uh, on the topic cystic fibrosis early diagnosis welcome madam thank you i hope i am audible uh, audible madam audible yeah please proceed thank you, thank you. so i am going to talk about uh, uh, how to suspect and diagnose cystic fibrosis early especially in tamil nadu so uh, before i go on to those specific points we need to review quickly about our understanding on cystic fibrosis so as you know it's a progressive genetic disease Uh, inherited as an autosomal recessive condition the main problem in this condition is persistent lung infections and eventually respiratory failure so it is uh, it is considered a lethal condition and that is uh, the commonest genetic lethal condition among the caucasian so among them the frequency or incidence is very high one in 2500 to 3500 depending on the country 
uh, but much rarer in the other populations, uh, Asian, Indian, etc. Maybe one in forty thousand or even hundred thousand. It is estimated. These estimates are very, very. Um, I mean, it's not based on any study done in India. It's based on studies done on Indians or Asians who have migrated abroad. So it's not very accurate numbers. The phenotype of this condition is very variable. Uh, more often, we see the severe type which ends in uh, uh, you know, death or severe morbidity, uh, but there can be milder manifestations of phenotype also. So how often is it there in Tamil Nadu? Uh, Dr. Balaji has already mentioned that, that there are a number of cases here. So uh, one of the earliest uh, um, reports in the literature is from uh, in our own hospital in the 1980s of three cases diagnosed by uh, post-mortem. So it has existed here very, very long time. I know immediately after the condition was or recognized uh, among the Caucasian population as cystic fibrosis, uh, within about 10, 15 years, we also have recognized that in India. So uh, to look at what goes wrong or what happens in this condition, so this is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein. This is a channel uh, or a gate protein situated on the epithelial cells on the luminal aspect. So you can see if this is the respiratory epithelium, each of the cells on the luminal aspect, these channels exist. The function of this channel is to allow chloride ions from within the cell to move to the exterior, that, that is to the lumen of the airway. So the purpose of this is once the chloride moves in there, the sodium also will move in there together. So presence of sodium chloride will draw water in and keep this mucus very thin, liquidy, and easy to move. Because this mucus has to move, taking all the microorganisms or dust particles which come in, the cilia will uh, kind of transport them upwards to the larynx. So the liquidity or the fluidity of this mucus is very important. That is maintained because this channel is functional and that uh, the chloride ions transport is there. That is why this uh, fluidity of the mucus is maintained and it's very important defense mechanism in our lung. So in a normal airway where the CFTR protein is functioning normally, all the chloride ions can easily move out and you have a nice uh, you know, fluid mucus and a very clear airway. There is no clogging there. Whereas when the channels are blocked, you have a lot of thick mucus obstructing the airway lumen and clogged airway and Some audio disturbance is going on. Madam, I think looks like she has lost her internet connection, sir. I think we just yes, 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 yes. That's what I think madam is telling about how that uh, long airway is a real problem in the uh, cystic fibrosis. Probably her connection is little uh, disturbed. Uh, I think she's coming back. Uh, okay. Yes. Yes, I think probably the Still, the connection has not been proper. Madam is not joining with her. And uh, I think uh, uh, just to fill up the gap, I have been telling something till the madam arrives. Uh, in the newborn, I think you can make the diagnosis uh, with the estimation of uh, uh, trypt trypsin. That is a very uh, early diagnosis you can make in the newborn. I think later onwards, I think probably we can go with the uh, sweat chloride. I think whenever you come across a child presenting with a bizarre presentation of clubbing, failure to thrive, recurrent bees, I think you have go ahead uh, doing uh, 
uh, simple test, but unfortunately it is not available in many places. So once your sweat flow rate is elevated, more than 60, it gives a particular child is a candidate. We have to strongly suspect cystic fibrosis and sometimes you need to go for second time also. Sir, I think the connection is coming. No, sir, she hasn't joined yet, sir. She hasn't joined. Okay, 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 okay. Just waiting. Somebody is out and I just uh, probably if she, uh, she lost her connection. I think some people would like to ask something about uh, cystic fibrosis. You can put your questions and we will keep discussing also. I will put uh, Madam. Yes, she's coming. Sir, we can proceed to the next speaker, sir, and she can join later. Okay, okay. Yeah. You, madam, is, uh, uh, are you coming? Shall we go with that uh, uh, thing? What, what, sir? Yeah. So you will proceed and we will have uh, next uh, speaker join later, sir. Yes. Shall I call the next speaker? Uh, shall I call the next speaker? Yes, yes sir. Uh, I think probably she, Madam has lost the connection and uh, she can continue her cystic fibrosis slides here. Now I will call upon the fourth speaker in the first session, Victor Jerome. She is going to talk on sleep. I think he is going to talk on sleep, sleep disorders. Probably he will be stressing on obstructive sleep of me and other things. Uh, Dr. Victor Jerome uh, is a uh, Lord of Florence, he is a clinical fellow, uh, international and private can, Reed Ormond Street of London. And uh, he, he had MRCPS in 2011 and uh, he also got ERS diploma in Pediatric Respiratory Medicine in 2017. And uh, he is a clinical fellow. Uh, in Ormond Hospital, London, UK, and he is also a clinical research fellow in pediatric respiratory medicine in Leicester Royal in Leicester, UK. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Rajendra, we can call this person. If you want to introduce further, you can go ahead. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Very good yes. morning. Uh, yes. Very good afternoon from London. Actually, like I'm, I'm, I'm just joining in a deferred live kind of situation. Um, it's really, it's really um, very overwhelming to see all my teachers actually in this forum. And then I thank immensely thank all the pediatricians and the Tamil Nadu State Chapter just allowing me to have an op opportunity to talk amongst you. Actually, it's a privilege, and then I'm humbled by that. Um, so sleep disorders in children actually um, it's it's a kind of uh, like pulmonology non pulmonology like like it, it doesn't have a rule book so it was initially the sleep disorders in children was actually more uh, perpetuated into the into their hierarchy only by psychiatrists long time back it it started in america and later it was actually borrowed on by pediatric neurologists. And halfway through, there were actually a good chunk of people who had sleep disordered breathing. And then it actually marched on into um, like into pediatric pulmonologists. And then we have taken it in a big way. And uh, that's where we are actually getting this topic into the pulmonology segment. I don't have any conflict of interest to declare actually this talk is actually for, exclusively for pediatricians. So aim of this presentation, we, I'm just going to touch upon topics which actually has got something to do or like what a pediatrician can do, like screening the screening for sleep studies, uh, educating the parents, medications, what you shouldn't be doing in a, in a sleep concern to, um, or advising a sleep concern to parents. What I will not be covering will be sleep investigations and any detailed system oriented sleep disorders will not be addressed in this talk. It's actually a topic of, of its own, and then it gets a big, bit of more complicated when we go into that. So as I told you, like what's up in the branch? Actually, it's more of a pediatric pulmonologist who are doing more of the sleep work. However, like we can see more of pediatric neurologists also equally interested 
all around the world and of course like i have i have some of my very good friends in pediatric neurology in tamil nadu who are actually interested in sleep disorders so we have very very many limitations when we address to the pediatricians of what they can do and those limitations will be evident in this talk so how do we classify sleep disorders actually just to just to make sure that like you you are aware about the classification and the varieties of sleep disorders it is just not about like obstructive sleep apnea so there are varieties like insufficient sleep fragmented sleep sleep related movement disorders and then there are disorders where like you sleep more there are central disorders hypersomnolence so in insufficient sleep we call it insomnia or circadian rhythm disorders in fragmented sleep you get it fragmented because of obstructive sleep and also by central sleep disordered breathing in sleep related movement disorders we have varieties simple and complex and then in the central disorders of hypersomnolence we have the narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia don't get scared i'm not going to bombard you with all these topics actually so it is going to be very 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 simple so it was very difficult for me when i went through this classification for to remember like i didn't understand any bloody thing so types of sleep disorders to me is there are kids with less sleep there are kids with more sleep they have something kind of jet lag kind of disorder or sometimes they do something what is unwanted during the sleep so these are the four varieties which you can see in any of the children so when you do a decision making or like when you have a broad outlook of anybody who is going to come into a clinic of a pediatrician and then say oh i have a sleep concern these are the first things either there is a suspicion or there is a presentation from the parents for the sleep concerns you better start do the screening and then you classify it either into a sleep disordered breathing or a behavioral sleep disorder because both these topics are a huge uh, huge um, a huge level of investigations which proceeds on after these been suspected and then comes the sleep study it's quite unfortunate that like sleep study as eeg it's pretty complicated and then it is not a very cheap investigation which is available everywhere and that's a reason like the pediatricians cannot or take over that kind of investigations on a regular clinic and it takes a bit of time actually like on that basis to just go through what you can do in sleep disordered breathing because like i am not going to concentrate on all this all these topics actually at the moment like this particular slide will tell you what you know already on sleep disordered breathing either it is obstructive or it is non obstructive what we are going to do in obstructive sleep disorder breathing is about like either you go for a surgical management or you go for a non surgical management in surgical management all, all you know is about like all you all you have been aware of it is actually adenotonsillectomy revision adenoidectomy bpa surgeries if, you, if it is going to be un, unsolvable and then there can be situations where like you land up in tracheostomy when it is going to be non surgical there is a lot of options actually with with non invasive ventilation and then dental interventions when it comes to non obstructive sdbs again this is uh, th- this goes more into uh, a long term ventilation kind of uh, care and so uh, we will not be looking into this in a detailed manner today what can a pediatrician do this is where we start the topic on so is there a sleep problem and if yes what type is the first question any any pediatrician can be can be able to identify it is actually quite simple as we can do it so the normal baseline questioner which actually is available to everyone and then you might have been hearing this many in many other talks is actually the bars questioner what is the bars questioner hold on for you it's b e a r s is an acronym for all the questions you have to ask it is b is the bedtime issues is there any problem at all for your child to fall asleep or is there any difficulty continuing the sleep is there e for excessive daytime sleepiness an a for awakenings at the night time is the child starts to sleep very quietly but like he she he gets aroused many a times in this whole night any regularity and duration of the sleep is there any irregularity which actually happens and finally the snoring without snoring we cannot qualify any obstructive sleep apnea so naturally like we have to have that component of snoring if there is going to be anyone who wants to do the screener in their outpatient in tamil nadu Uh, for parents who actually understand tamil 
I have completely translated into Tamil and then I can circulate it after this meeting and then if you want, anyone wants to, please contact the DNSC office as well and then they can let me know and then I can share this. It's very, very simple. And then during the waiting period, like which actually is not going to be happening in this pandemic, but like if there is going to be anybody who is going to approach you uh, to just ask for saying, can I, can I, can I say, doctor, like there is something disturbing in my child's sleep and then you can ask them to answer these questions. Now, when, whenever parents approach, either they ask for, either say that like my child is snoring or like my child has got like disturbed sleep all through the night. More than that, like I usually hear any infant who's actually like less than one year mothers or fathers who come back to say me that like, it's very, 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 very obvious. And it's very hard to believe them and then to start actually anything like investigations at all. So we definitely need a sleep diary. They have given you a difficult question. So you can give them a difficult task as well. So ask them to plot all the hours of sleep for about a month, minimum a month, actually. Some of my parents, some of my patients actually have been um, doing this on a regular basis, which is very fantastic, actually. So it gives a fantastic profile of what kind of sleep and what timing of sleep is the child going through and then it is evolving through as well. It's quite easy to mark this. This is one of my patients who have marked it, actually. The parents have been very sincere in doing that. If you fold this paper right at nine o'clock into half, it will turn into the, 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 the folded upper part will become the day and then the folded down part will become the night. If the night is completely painted very well, you know that like the child is actually sleeping very well. If the day is being painted with patches of all these things, you very well know that like the child is having an increased daytime sleepiness. Depending on the age, it may be abnormal or normal. But with this, what I do, I do have a small report which I generate. So it is a diary analysis which we can do. The number of days of sleep, the start time and the end time of sleep, amount of disturbed nights, and then the recommended hours, is it breached or not breached and all this stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple and then fantastic tool. There are varieties of sleep diaries available on the internet and this is my own. With this, we can say that like whether there is going to be a normal timing of sleep. But then when they say that like we can tell them saying that like, no, your child is in range or like a little breached out of range and then you can decipher from that. But do we have a normative value? Only American Academy of Pediatrics has given and then published this. There had been some previous reports from Canadian Academy, Australian Academy as well. But however, like this has been very well studied by uh, Dr. Mahesh Babu in Singapore, actually. And then he came back with an answer saying that, like, see, this is more ethnic. It is not actually like we cannot stipulate this with actually an American guideline or the timing of sleep. But however, like we are, we are happy to follow this number of hours, actually. So it gives a range. It gives a fair idea about like how many hours of sleep for any particular age. And you can see that like it grows down and then naturally like there is less and less of sleep when we grow more older. Then comes the sleep screening questionnaires. So the first is actually about like if there is going to be a BEARS questionnaire and then if the parent says like some of the questions which actually are like some of the components which are going to be positive, then we can proceed on to a sleep questionnaire itself. What are the available questionnaires? All these questionnaires are free of cost. So there is a child sleep habit questionnaire which can be used. And there is another questionnaire which actually classifies variety of disorders why are these actually gaining more importance in fact when i when i when i had to talk on only questioners i found a book which had 150 sleep questioners for children just believe me like it is actually there are 150 sleep questioners there available for children and i picked only two of them actually because like these are the questioners which has been validated very well against many of the studies and then this particular questionnaire is from Jody Mindel and team who's actually in USA, like who are quite an authority in behavioral sleep. So it is a 30, 33 item. It's quite like, it takes around like 10 minutes for them to fill. It's only validated from four to 10 years, but they are doing even extremes of age now. It classifies the sleep into eight particular classes. And then it is quite easy to use. I, I can share this with the calculator, which I have made on an Excel sheet, which actually eases your job to interpret on this. This is actually the questionnaire. 
and then it takes around like 10 minutes and we can finish it off and probably like you can classify the sleep into whether it is going to be a sleep disorder breathing narcolepsy or like any type of other disorders which can be classified similarly there is something called sleep disturbance scale for children sdsc i probably think like currently there is a, a pg thesis which is going on in srmc right now on this particular scale and they are trying to classify the available children with their complaints and then see what kind of sleep disorder they are belonging to very similar one in 27 item and it looks like this we have a scoring sheet and then the scoring um, the, the the normative values which can be given and then it can classify you and then give you a very fair idea about it now when we classify that to be a sleep disordered breathing then we have another questionnaire which can go into to see that like what level of sleep disordered breathing it is so one is actually the pediatric sleep questionnaire which the world knows forever actually so it is a very elaborate questionnaire it goes for for about like four pages which again is like a very nice component to fill but like it definitely takes a bit of time it's a pain actually and then there is a smaller component in that is actually the sleep related breathing disorder scale now this last bit of questionnaire actually carries more value the reason why i'm saying it like it is the only questionnaire which has been tested against polysomnography to identify obstructive sleep disorder breathing and it has got a fantastic positive predictive value underline positive predictive value when it scores more than 30% it has a it, it has a 20 21 item questionnaire actually 21 questions are there and that's the questionnaire and then if you score uh, seven or eight questions to be yes or more than that it carries more value that like when you do a polysomnography you will have a positive result however if it is going to be negative it cannot say anything much so naturally we have to go on and then prod on with individual approach so videos are very common these days videos are fantastic these days and then most of the parents have got a beautiful recording of any even during the night time i sincerely appreciate that and then this is more um, more often is a very important modality which needs to be taught to even like this the medical students like in the history what is the video history kind of thing so in sleep it actually is quite important very effective to describe the condition and also a pilot to video somnography now i am talking about something a new term called video somnography we know polysomnography we know cardio respiratory polygraphy but what is video somnography this is actually a tool which is evolving and i am sitting in the city where like there is a hospital nearby which is called the saint mary's hospital who have done some work on this video somnography and they have some qualifying components for the whole night of video actually you just need to get the video of the child sleeping for a night or a sequence of nights and then we can score on many things and then say that like what kind of disorder kind will the child belong to there are several components variables like sleep onset time sleep night duration and then wake after the sleep onset vaso is actually a very important indices now morning rise time night walking and then several other parasomnias can be beautifully recorded which cannot be done by polysomnography which is actually a fantastic component okay so you have screened the child reasonable number of screens screeners and then questioners are available what do we advise the parents i am i am deliberately skipping this main important part of investigations which is sleep studies which is not actually a common investigation available anything be near by your near near by your vicinity but however like it is a very important component as i mentioned in the first slide there are only very few very few sleep concerns which doesn't need a sleep study now when it comes to behavioral sleep issues it's always the pediatrician who actually takes the first step sleep hygiene any number of times we can we can we can talk about this about like any number of times do we all have a sleep hygiene technically not actually speaking like we are all like very unhygienic about sleep including myself sticking to the same time of bedtime and wake time come on like i never do that beds are for sleeping the last thing anybody will follow through i'm sure like every every bedroom like or like most of the houses with bedroom will, will have a will have a electronic gadget which is sticking out there at least a phone to watch a comfy and cozy room it's not a it's, it's a luxury actually in tamil nadu like you cannot ask all the parents to have a comfy and cozy room like they live in one room actually most of the time 
Alarm clocks are for waking up and it shouldn't be disturbing the sleep. Bedtime routine, quiet and calm and relaxing activities, which is not watching uh, teleserials before you sleep. Teaching relaxing techniques, start the day off right with exercise. Of course, yes, like exercise in the morning is the best. Avoid caffeine late in the evening, of course, yes. There are many other caffeine containing drinks than coffee itself. If you can't sleep, get out of the bed, which actually is a very, very, very sincere and then good practice. Put the kids to sleep when they are drowsy but awake. Don't, don't just carry them as they are sleeping, which actually is not the best thing to do. You know why when I'm going to talk about the infants in another few slides. Cuddle with a stuffed animal or a soft blanket. This is actually a controversial advice. There is a very high chance of sleep association, which again, I'll be talking in the next few slides. Maintain a sleep diary, which actually is very important when you are actually thinking about a sleep concern. Infants, the most talked about problematic segment in sleep. I don't think like... And no pediatrician will be left alone uh, without a parent, with an infant coming in and then saying about which actually is a very common complaint. So which is, which is, which is normal, like my kid did it actually for some time. However, we have to make sure that like, see behavioral insomnia, forget about the behavioral adjective, insomnia usually is not considered as a component or a diagnosis or an abnormality if it is going to be a less than six months old child. It's very normal for a polyphasic sleep, polyphasic in the sense like which is very, very normal for infants and particularly less than six months. And we cannot say that like there is an insomnic component in a less than six months old child. Very, very unlikely, very unlikely. Infant sleep is addressed based on only these three components. Take it and then just memorize it and then keep it in your mind. And I probably think like this will be helpful for any pediatrician to say. Are the parents finding the cues for sleep? Is the child going to sleep? Can a parent find that like the child is going to sleep? The second component. Is the parent pampering the child? Literally. parents are. The self-soothing techniques, how far have they achieved? An in-training day and night differentiation, which is very, very important. Actually, this happens in course of time. But however, like, and the type is not actually great. Now, the problem comes either in sleep initiation or sleep continuation. What are, what, what are, we, what are we going to advise in sleep initiation? In the Koran the Arandal, Unu Bomergo, Illa Partergo, Illa and the particular bedergo, Illa Amma la Dapa Pakatalerba. So, this is actually called a sleep association. The problem comes is whenever they get associated with the start of that sleep, they cannot get out of that when they awaken in the middle of the night. The Dean and the Koran the Kail or Teddy Bear or Tunga Aram Chatabina. Halfway through the night, and the teddy bear put in a kid under the Chabina in the Dean and Adula Endrigan and the Koran the Kit, Teddy Bear Irunda and Thirmutuko. That is called sleep association. That needs to get out of that, completely taken out of that. That has been achieved by extinction. Purmiyana say, you know, it is actually like there is unmodified extinction where children will self soothe and then sleep away. Parents can't go away. The second is graded extinction, and then there is a parental presence extinction. Parents will help it out for some nights and then they will stop after some time. Frequent awakenings. How do we address that? Like, but after some time, like it, she like every time already in the So this needs to be addressed only when there is going to be a sleep diary which is showing less amount of sleep. That is where we are coming in here. Scheduled awakening and then preemptive waking schedule. These are methods to do it, and then we have something called a sleep coaching classes which has been taken by experts in Western countries. Of course, like I'm seeing that to be started in Bangalore right now, which are being trained to the parents. Scheduled awakening, the preemptive waking schedule can be done as well. If it is going to be more than an infant, two to six year old, there is a only problem. It's a usual component. It's limit setting, actually. So the child will set the limit and then the parents will budge to it, which actually is not great. So this has to be there. Like you have to sleep at nine o'clock. It will be time at nine o'clock. And then if it is going to be prolonging, 
நீ ரூம்ல படுத்து தூங்குப்பா நான் முன்னாடி ரூம்ல போய் டிவி பாக்குறேன் அது சரியா வராது தட் கேன் நாட் ஹேப்பன் பேரண்ட்ஸ் ஹேவ் டு பிஹேவ் வித் அ குட் ஸ்லீப் ஹைஜீன் தட் இஸ் வாட் இஸ் கமிங் இன் யூ கே நாட் ஓன்லி டீச் ஸ்லீப் ஹைஜீன் யூ ஹேவ் டு மாடல் த பேரண்ட்ஸ் ஹேவ் டு மாடல் ஆஸ் வெல் நைட் டைம் ஃபியர்ஸ் அஃப்கோர்ஸ் எஸ் லைக் இந்த சமயத்தில் தான் அந்த நைட் டைமில் போய் பிசாசு பயம் எல்லாம் வரும் அந்த சமயத்தில் தே கே நாட் டூ தே கே நாட் ஸ்லீப் அலோ அண்ட் தேர் கம்ஸ் லைக் த இமீடியட் சொல்யூஷன் இஸ் அம்மாவை கட்டி பிடிச்சி தூங்குவா அப்பாவை கண்டி பிடிச்சி தூங்க வெரி நார்மல் ஆக்சுவலி இட்ஸ் வெரி நார்மல் திங் ஐ டிட் இட் ஆக்சுவலி ஸோ கோ ஸ்லீப்பிங் இஸ் த ஸ்டார்ட் ஆஃப் அ பிக் அனதர் பிக் ப்ராப்ளம் யூ கே நாட் கெட் அவுட் ஆஃப் ஸ்கோ ஸ்லீப்பிங் கோ ஸ்லீப்பிங் இஸ் அலவுட் இன் இண்டியன் கல்ச்சர் ஆக்சுவலி இன் த சேம் ரூம் ஸோ i will not stop co sleeping if the parents and the team or the family is comfortable senatla tata party kitta thoongura kolangal irupanga which is actually fine I, i don't i don't i don't disagree with that but however when it becomes a problem when it actually only has to happen only with the parent or le tata party dirin uruk poitaanga na enna seiyirudhu andha samayathula then comes the relaxation techniques and then systematic desensitization and imaginations and creativity to draw a monster idhu or nalla payirchi a irundhadu actually ipo indha kolanda edha paathu bayapadudho adhe padama varai solranum அதுக்கப்புறம் அதுக்கு ஒரு லெட்டர் எழுத சொல்லணும் யூ ரைட் அ லெட்டர் டு தட் மான்ஸ்டர் சேங் தட் லைக் டோன்ட் கம் டு நைட் அண்ட் தென் டோன்ட் டிஸ்டர்ப் மீ ஃபார் மை ஸ்லீப் விச் ஆக்சுவலி ஹேஸ் ஒர்க் வெரி வெல் ஆக்சுவலி இட்ஸ் இட் லுக்ஸ் லிட்டில் ஃபண்டி பட் இட் ஒர்க்ஸ் இப் இட் இஸ் கோயிண்ட் பி அ லிட்டில் எல்டர் சைல்டு சிக்ஸ் டு லெவன் இயர்ஸ் யூஸ்வலி தே ட்ரை டு ஃபார்ம் அ பேட்டர்ன் ஆஃப் ஸ்லீப் டென் டு லெவன் ஹவர்ஸ் ஆஃப் ஸ்லீப் இஸ் வெரி நார்மல் ப்ராக்ரெசிவ் ஷிஃப்ட் ஆஃப் ஸ்லீப் ஆன் செட் டைம் மெதுவாக தள்ளி போயிட்டே இருக்கும் எட்டுல தூங்கினவங்க ஒம்பது ஆகும் ஒம்பதுலேருந்து பத்து மணி ஆகும் தே கெட் டிலேட் ஸ்லோலி sometimes they become a night owl some be, some people become a morning lark so they always call like kaalaiyila 4 manikku endrikira kondam onnu irukum sila kondainga night la 10 11 mani varaikum thoongave thoongadu and the type arpaanga but they sleep the normal duration that is for sure so the limit setting will change into the hands of the child the child has to set the limit for themselves innikku evlo tv paapen how much time will i spend in homework and then on the internet and then fade and fade at bed time and then you can say that like see if you don't feel like falling asleep don't go to the bed but if you go to the bed like make sure that like you sleep within about 15 minutes time but then emission taand da get out of the bed and then make sure that like you do something else and then get back to your bed that's important bed at bed time with the response cost that's what i said like you have to resume after a break actually you have to come back to the bed later of course yes like again 6 to 11 as irundalo there is actually a predisposition for darkness ghosts and everything and then that also actually causes a problem we have cognitive behavior therapy for that as well but all essence they are their individuals of their own nama control illa the age group very tough don't don't think that like actually they are delaying their sleep just because like they like to do it it is by their biology actually there is a delayed release of melatonin which is happening and there is a social availability of gadgets apa da friends kitta pesa mudiyum nareya chat pannuvaanga so those things happen and then the television video games everything actually takes a place in their life of course yes like increase amount of time in the bed actually is very 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 problematic actually they just toss in the bed and then they don't sleep at all sometimes in the adult diagnosis will come into adolescents group as well psycho physiologic insomnia it's nothing you know special illa they cannot sleep in the bedroom but they can sleep in a chair in the front room balcony எங்கே வேணாலும் தூங்கலாம் பட் அங்கெல்லாம் தூங்குற மாதிரி ஆரம்பிச்சாங்க அப்படின்னா தென் இட் இஸ் கால்ட் ஆக்சுவலி சைக்கோ ஃபிசியாலஜிக் இன்சோம்னியா இஃப் யூ புட் தம் பேக் இன்ட் த பெட்ரூம் தே கேன் நாட் ஸ்லீப் அது ரொம்ப கஷ்டம் இந்த ரஜினி படத்தில் காமிக்கிற மாதிரி ஒரு கட்டாந்தரையில் தான் தூங்குவார் அங்கேருந்து பட் பெட்டில் போய் படுத்தா தூக்கமே வராது அப்படின்னு சொல்லுவார்ல அந்த மாதிரி டைம் ரெமடிஸ் ஸ்லீப் ஹைஜீன் ரிலாக்ஸேஷன் டெக்னிக்ஸ் அகேன் த சேம் ஹோல்ஸ் ஆக்சுவலி வித் ஆல் திஸ் ஸ்டாப் மெடிகேஷன்ஸ் திஸ் இஸ் அ லாஸ்ட் பெட் ஸோ ஐ சி தட் லைக் தர் இஸ் அ லாட்ஸ் அண்ட் லாட்ஸ் ஆஃப் மெடிகேஷன்ஸ் கம்மிங் இன் டு பிளே Uh, in sleep disorders amongst pediatricians which is which is a welcome ground actually they it actually indirectly means they are actually trying to address these sleep issues but what are the medications available if you see the list of medications which are available you will be stunned there are many types and then many varieties of medications which is available in the books and in the market but there is only one medication which has been well studied melatonin nothing else where in the medicine may for the purpose of sleep has not been studied in individuals or in normal individuals i would say there are neurodevelopmental problems which need special drugs but that is actually not included into this so normal children when they cannot sleep not everyone needs melatonin that's important endogenous melatonin is a very normal hormone it is actually synthesized from tryptophan so melatonin is not actually a medication adu odambla irukra oru pagadi it's nothing wrong in that 
it has got a circadian rhythmicity and the higher levels before when you know, when are you going to approach the bed or like the night time and then it actually is very less during the daytime the sunlight and then the light intensity will actually make it secrete or not secrete at all dose is 1 to 3 mg it usually starts to act around like by 30 minutes um, ideal will be that is the timing you have to think about like you cannot 10 manikku thoonguna 9 o'clock e eduthirunom andha marunda adukku adukapra eduthingina 11 manikku dhaan thoonguvaanga andha mari type aanu so melatonin reduces sleep onset latency latency this is to be stressed please note that like melatonin saapta they cannot sleep all through the night it is very 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 impossible unless you take a sustained release tablet which is available only in specific formulations i don't think like anything have started available in india it is only available as a tablet as in or very difficulty uh, not all children are very comfortable with tablets and so they have to uh, use this syrup which actually is not going to give sustained effect sometimes in some of the neurodevelopmental problems which i will be addressing about autism in the last slide you can have a second dose in early morning 2 o'clock so to advance the sleep wake pattern smaller doses are to be started jet lag is only the problem you just want to advance the sleep phase you don't need a heavy dose it actually is a very small dose which can work remelteon is actually a synthetic analog which is almost like creeping into indian market no it has not been approved for children not yet now i'm just going to present like what is going to be a melatonin prescription pathway which actually is very very like very new for anyone to see that like melatonin ku edhuk pathway abdin paapanga please note that like these are the criterions for prescribing melatonin if your ch- if a child comes with you like padukka vechi 30 nimisham anadukaprama padute thoonga maatengira avla abdingra mari irundhalo and if it is going to be like a, like in daytime fatigueness or attention difficulties and then this actually means that like there is a reduced amount of sleep uh, and then the parental opinion like in a nichayama enak or marundu kuduthuta paravalinga doctor abingra nayangira type a irundha then we can take it the problem is like where do we stop this is actually the target outcomes the sleep latency reduce aichina try to stop the medicine after a particular period of time and then the total sleep time and then the longer sleep period like those things actually gets into place then you can stop that medication initiate melatonin in 1 to 2 mg one that is 30 minutes before the agreed bed time but i have to tell a tell a thing like you cannot stop uh, start melatonin to be given something like en kondha 8 manikku thoonga paravala appdi solli 7 manikku kudu kuda adu romba kashtam adu actually the child usually was sleeping at around like 11 o'clock na you cannot start it at 7 o'clock you have to advance it by each and every hour if your child has to be sleeping at like some point of time start it at like 9 o'clock where the child will sleep at 10 o'clock after about a week move it to 8 o'clock and then you can make her sleep at 9 o'clock and the mari da seiyam mudiy it is a natural phenomenon namma body avlo seekrathula maaradu actually illa na jet lag la namma pilot and the pilots jet plane drivers la easy adala maathiruvanga it is not possible at all assess improvements in one week time actually and then make sure that like if the dose is adequate leave that actually in the same dose don't change it now annually or varsha anadukaprom you have to just give a break you have to have a break in melatonin if that break is evaluated and then the child sleeps very well then leave it off if there is going to be a problem you have to have two pathways one is the basic dose once again the original dose e marudi vela seida illa na incremented dose mattum da vela seida angiradha poruthirukku if there is going to be no effect on the smaller dose they are actually fast metabolizers and then if there is going to be effect on the smaller dose go to go back to the smaller dose and then you can go on with that now if there is going to be no effect after increasing the dose until 6 mg mark it 6 mg and beyond 6 mg it's usually in the hands of specialist the sleep specialist to increase up to 10 mg which is a bit risky because like it gives an anti climax effect it, it actually reduces sleep after some time so that needs to be considered if it is not please discontinue melatonin it is not going to work at all this and all has to happen within about like 3 to 4 weeks time sleep problems in autism this is a special concern because like we are seeing autistic kids and then autistic kids are at sometimes like adhd kind of kids the sleep problem becomes the reason for the whole behavior or the behavior actually causes sleep problem mutta kodi kind of thing so mostly associated with behavioral deterioration when they are actually not okay during the day actually there is a like there is a problem at the night time 
it will be very interesting to see i diagnosed uh, autism child at 8 months of age because the mother presented with a sleep problem and later behavioral concerns and by around like 1 and 1/2 years the child was a full blown autism the sleep issues can be a presenting symptom for autism it's very very new it is possible common pattern there is an offset in circadian rhythm they cannot sleep in the particular period of time not like frequent awakening so these two are happening all the books all around the world autism training network or like many any guidelines nice guidelines in the guideline edutinganalo there is only one thing which is being presented as the treatment behavior therapy please do behavior therapy as the primary and if you fail go for melatonin if you have a refractoriness to melatonin we have other drugs like zolpidem and uh, esclopusin and a lot of things actually can be used in this child children actually and that actually takes a second seat now there is there is always a question about like the antihistamines will come in that cold medication sometimes for these kids also you guys sali pudikum odane one antihistamines put on the problem i have seen is like as soon as the antihistamine is started within about like one week time the whole behavior completely distorts and then they behave completely like the parents feel literally very deprived sir nalla irundha paiya sir nan indha marundu kuduka aarambicha adukapram romba mosam aayidan sir abdin vaanga so antihistamines actually has got a very fantastic predisposition for sleep alteration and then that actually disturbs disturbs their future sleep as well try not to use antihistamines as a or like try to avoid it actually completely right idella do's if or don'ts don't step on all these things apnea monitor velinatla available irukku india la sophisticated parents have started using apnea monitors and then see that like my child thoongudha nu theriyala sir thoongum bodu edavadhu moochu vidradhukku bayama irukke nu solli na apnea monitor vaangana amazon la no to it it actually gives rubbish results home oximetry monitoring finger oximeter on a regular basis your oximetry and then it is going to be there for children forever you avoid it panna mudiyada or problem going to say it is impossible for them to download understand what actually is a rem and non rem based breathing and it can happen all these things are problematic sleep studies which you can't score remember velila nariya kadaigal aarambikku bodu seegrame it will start there will be more sleep studies which will be coming into your front if you if you can't score if it is an automated score please don't believe it actually sleep monitoring devices this is new <clears throat> apple company has introduced this bedit 3.5 apple phone la you can monitor how you are sleeping the most useless gadget i have ever seen and then it is actually been graded as the worst product from apple itself ballisto cardiography abding the technique la there will be a small strip underneath your bed and then you have to sleep only sleep on the bed to score the sleep there are many other companies which has come it's been proven that like it is absolutely not useful it is only a fashionable device never for it no melatonin for all and sometimes this is cultural sleep associations la rocking thuli la pechu aatradhu abdingiradhu vandu is a sleep association it's it's, it's quite or madri it's, it's a very dicey area i wouldn't start with advising against rocking the child to make him sleep if the if the child is actually sleeping in the thuli for a very long time and which is acceptable i wouldn't uh, argue against for that to be avoided sometimes gramathala that actually is a protective mechanism irumbu palli poochi paacha thel idilirund kaapatha porade and thuliya irukum so beware of these sleep associations and then keep off and then don't advise against it and that's where i end excellent uh things about uh, sleep hygiene victor jerome has uh, covered everything probably is a very big topic sleep is a very very big topic it is a 
eloquent speech. He made it very lively and uh, telling how some children sleep with a teddy bear. And still, I am thinking one of my grandparent granddaughter sleeps with a uh, pink towel. I don't know. That may be a without that pink towel, she won't sleep. I think she kept this for even up to five years. I still remember. And uh, uh, Jerome was telling very nice points and all. And one question uh, from the audience, Dr. Nedigan has asked this. What are the food to be improved? What are the food to be avoided? Uh, is there any role in uh, disturbing the sleep? I think. True, sir. Actually, the, the food to be avoided is actually caffeine and caffeine containing products. So caffeine containing products is actually includes chocolate. Chocolate la kunja caffeine irukka, actually. So chocolate is not the ideal food like if you are having or facing children who have got sleep problems. Now, foods which can be given to make you sleep. Actually, like pongal sata nalla Carbohydrate diet and then particularly with some lentils gives you excellent sleep. As far as like it is not going to disturb your tummy, please have enough amount of carbohydrate, particularly for children, to make them sleep. Night time, le, Thayir Saadam is very good actually. Very good, Jerome. I think, <laughs> I, think uh, I, I love to take Pungal. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, all of the, uh, our team, I congratulate you for your excellent talk. And uh, probably... Yes, Yes, and like for the audience, I, I should say that like I was I was a small kid changing the slides for, for Professor Vijay Shagran when he came to Kumbhakonam. And the first talk was about like what is actually Salvatamol do? Uh, Anga Aramcha Pulmonology. <laughs> the the, the all, I thank all of you. Really you very nice. I think we all enjoy. And because in, uh, if the time is more, we'll try to listen to more from you and all. Because sleep yes, design, nobody read. Nobody is uh, in a position to reach sleep separately. But sleep hygiene is a very important thing because after the COVID, many people lost their sleep. I don't know what is the reason. Probably only I will talk to you in person. Some people are calling me. Well, sir, I am not sleeping for 10 days. What is happening to me and all? I think we are already uh, exceeding my uh, time. Sir, uh, I think Jerome has done an excellent thing. Now, I will call upon uh, madam, thank you, sir. Thank you for your thing. Uh, thank you, Rajaram. We have good clap. We have good clap. Now, I call upon madam because uh, she stopped her uh, talk because of the disturbance. Uh, I, I call madam Snake working to continue cystic fibrosis. Uh, sorry about that. So, picking up from where I stopped. Uh, so, in the GI tract, abnormal CFT or protein leads to mainly a problem with the pancreas. So in this um, slide, you can see that uh, the normal pancreas has got a nice patent pancreatic duct, which drains the enzymes into the duodenum, where the mainly the fat uh, digestion and also protein and carbohydrate digestion happens with the help of these enzymes, uh, lipase and other enzymes. Uh, but in uh, when the CFTR uh, protein is affected in this duct cells, there is a problem in chloride bicarbonate tra transport, and eventually the, the duct is blocked, inflamed, and destroyed finally. You know, eventually this pancreas is almost, uh, you know, fully destroyed. It will become cystic and fibrous, and there's hardly a duct there. So this may take some time. Initially, they may have some amount of pancreatic function, and then over a period of time, they may become totally pancreatic insufficient. So uh, that's, some, uh, that's the reason for steatoria and malnutrition mainly. And also in the GI tract, you can we are familiar with other manifestations like meconium ileus, hepatobiliary involvement, et cetera. Rectal prolapse is another important uh, feature to remember. Uh, in the other system, salt loss through the sweat ducts is another important problem. Uh, and in uh, adults, the obstructive azoospermia may result, it will result in infertility in the uh, male members. Now, in the sweat gland, what happens is, uh, so if you imagine this as a normal sweat duct, and this is the ductal lumen, and this is the inside, the interstitium, the CFTR channels are there. So what happens when the sweat is secreted, the, when it is formed initially in the depths of the sweat gland, it's very high in sodium and chloride, like just like our plasma. As it traverses through this tube to come to the surface, the chloride gets reabsorbed back. 
and along with it, the sodium will get reabsorbed. So if you have a non-functioning channel, the sweat is going to contain a lot of sodium and chloride, and that becomes the basis for the diagnostic sweat, sweat chloride uh, testing. So this facility is, uh, like Dr. Sharad said, it's not uh, widely available in Tamil Nadu, but uh, the principle is, you know, induced sweating using uh, pilocarpine iontophoresis, then sweat is collected either in different methods of collection is there, and then chloride and that is analyzed. So that's the basic principle of that. So uh, when you have a level more than 60 millimoles per liter, CF is diagnosed. Uh, borderline level is 30 to 59, and less than 30, it is unlikely that the patient has cystic fibrosis. So one of the ways of collecting is using a macro duct. You can see this baby is very small, and it can be applied on, on very young children, even up to uh, three, four weeks. But sometimes, technically, we find it difficult to do it less than four or four and a half kilo babies. So, but technically, it can be done. So it is collected in this macro duct tube, and then it is uh, put into this chloride analyzer where the chloride result will come up. Um, you know, it, you can read out the chloride result in that. So uh, the cost benefit of sweat chloride. So like we said, it is not very widely available. So why not? So the question is, uh, how often is it needed? Uh, you know, if, if you consider cystic fibrosis as a very uncommon disease, we are not going to see it at all. Then obviously no one is going to invest on a sweat chloride machine. But that is not the case. We are finding more and more cases of cystic fibrosis recognized. And children with recurrent respiratory tract infection and many other combinations of clinical manifestations ideally should get the sweat chloride test done to rule out this, this problem uh, along with the other, you know, the, the, the etiological um, workup, sweat chloride also should be done. So, it, uh, you know, I would say all the district hospitals or one hospital in the district should have a sweat chloride testing uh, uh, ability. Now, how valid is the test? You may have some amount of set, uh, false positives and occasionally false negative, uh, but these are rare. And you know, if at all, if that happens, that just needs to be repeated if the clinical suspicion is high. Now, one thing about sweat chloride is this is this is uh, you know diagnosing cystic fibrosis is a life-changing disease. So it is better to invest. On, you know, on that equipment, though the cost of the equipment may be, you know, the one which I showed you, it may be costly like nine to 10 lakhs. But if you think of, uh, you know, COVID PCR testing, you do a test for 2000 rupees. That is just valid for that day. You know, the next day or the next day, whether you have COVID or not, uh, you know, this negative result doesn't give you any assurance. Whereas sweat chloride, if it is positive, that is a life-changing diagnosis. You know, you, you have a definite and clear diagnosis. So, uh, you know, compared to, it, it is similar to CT scan or MRI or, uh, you know, other equipments which are costly. But if, when you feel, when, when we realize there are a number of cases around our place, especially, and I can vouch for that in Tamil Nadu, there are a number of cases. So there should be more sweat testing um, equipment available in the in the state at least. So other screening tests which can be used are sweat conductivity. Here again, sweat is collected by pilocarpine iontophoresis. And the conductivity test is not exactly measuring chloride. Conductivity will also take into account other ions. So it is considered a screening test, but a level more than 80 closely corresponds to a level more than 60 of sweat chloride. So that also can be used because the cost is slightly less with the sweat conductivity testing. Aquagenic wrinkling, Sharad Balaji uh, uh, referred to it. Uh, this, um, this Dr. Cabra study, which was published in 2019. So here you can see a value of three minutes they have taken us. When you take a value of three minutes that the patient is uh, palmar skin wrinkles, within three minutes of immersion in water, that test has a sensitivity of 80% and a specificity of 56%. So the specificity is not very high. So if it, just because it wrinkled, you can't say it is cystic fibrosis. So it's, a, it's just a screening test with the appropriate clinical testing. It may be useful to give you one more clue. That's it. This study is done in uh, US. I um, mean, it is just published now. Um, uh, so this is done by Dr. Grace Paul. She is also the collaborator with me for the Cystic Fibrosis Project India. Uh, here, what they have done is they have done this on infants, very young infants to see, can we screen infants and decide if they have 
you know, whether they should go for a, a diagnostic test or not. So you see cystic fibrosis patients have very low, you know, at, a, at an early time, three minutes, they wrinkle with a confidence interval just spanning two to four, uh, you know, up to four minutes. Whereas controls and the carriers, carriers are also, I mean, they are proven to have one mutation. These patients are all genetically proven cystic fibrosis. The carriers have one mutation. The controls are healthy. They don't have any mutation. So you can see they are far apart from this. So this is, uh, you know, it could work as a good test, but remember it does not have a very high specificity. So we can't diagnose anybody based on this. Genetics is the other uh, uh, test which we usually do for diagnosis. Now, if you look at how the CFTR protein is formed, the information is inside the cell, the DNA. So as we know, we, we receive it from the mother and the father, one uh, gene. <laughs> and in an autosomal recessive condition, we need two mutated genes to manifest the disease. If you have only one mutated gene and a one, one normal one, you are going to be a carrier and the patient does, will not have any manifestations or the disease. So the instructions from the DNA are transferred to mRNA and the protein is formed. Uh, you know, it has to mature into a mature protein and reach the surface of the cell and function as a chloride channel. This is what normally happens. But there are, uh, you know, known to be about 2,000 mutations. These mutations can interfere, you know, can, can result in a problem which may affect any of these steps. So the, based on that, it is classified into different classes. So class one mutations, there is no proper instruction to make RNA or the protein at all. So the, all the mutations belonging to class one will not result in the formation of any amount of CFTR protein. Class two mutations, some amount of protein may be formed, but it doesn't mature because it is improperly folded and hence it will not reach the surface. So this also finally will not result in any type of uh, you know, proper CFTR channel and the patient will have all the manifestations. So these two classes of mutation will lead to a severe phenotype of CF. Class three is the, the protein somehow reaches the, you know, it's, it's okay till now. It, it reaches here, but it doesn't open properly. Then there are class four, five mutations. All these mutations, what they do is either the, either the, the number of channels is less or they are unstable, etc. So eventually they don't work well. The channels don't work well. So they may have a lesser phenotype. Now the treatment, I'm not going into details, just to you know, summarize, the, one of the problem is in the lung, the clogged airways. So you use hypertonic saline as a thinner to move this, you know, thin this out, use airway clearance maneuvers, you know, chest physiotherapy, breathing techniques, et cetera, to clear this. And when you need a lot of antibiotics because pseudomonas, staphylococcus, et cetera, colonize there. The next problem is with the pancreas. So nutrition, uh, pancreatic enzymes along with food, fat soluble vitamin supplementation, and also remember salt loss is excess. So in the nutrition, you must add salt also. The basic defect, as we know, is in the CFTR channel. Now there are new medications for this. These are uh, molecules, small molecules, which are called as correctors and potentiators. So either the folding, they help, or they help an uh, improper channel to open up. So combination of characters and potentiators, one specifically called Trikafta, which is a combination of three drugs, is, a, is almost could be called a magical drug, which has really changed the way cystic fibrosis patients look at their life because they were looking at a bleak future, going to die in the you know, near future kind of thing. Now they are looking forward to you know, having a career, uh, uh, you know, living longer, having children, grandchildren, <laughs> and anything, you know, a long life. So that is a life-changing, uh, you know, drugs are coming into, uh, into use now. So uh, now my topic specifically was, you know, early identification of CF. So the question is, why should we identify early? I mean, what's the point that we should identify early? So what is the strategy that should be used? What has worked world over? Uh, is that the same thing we should be using in India? So now in India, if you look at all the statistics, on an average, the children may be diagnosed between four to six years of age, sometimes as late as 20 or 25 years. But on an average, many studies, it's about four to five years. By this time, patients would have developed bronchiectasis. And from then, it's a downhill course because bronchiectasis by itself causes more infection and more destruction of the lung. 
so you have lost the opportunity to give them a good quality of life and the life expectancy proportionately will be shorter so and even if these new drugs which are working miracles abroad right now which comes to us if the ch child has got a very established bad bronchitis and a very poor nutrition then you know the effects of these drugs are also going to be suboptimal so definitely we need early identification to 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 get the best quality of life and prolong their life appropriately so the best strategy is newborn screening so the principle here is the pancreatic problem the pancreatic injury starts in utero itself so when the baby is born a uh, heel prick and that blood sample taken on a filter paper or a, or a or paper and tested you can you can store it and test it in a few days time you look for uh, elevated immunoreactive trypsin so that's a pancreatic enzyme so the pancreas is injured this enzyme will leak into the blood stream and you will have a higher level so this will help to identify the babies by 2 to 3 weeks in most countries and the this is only a screening test after that the confirmation has to be done using sweat chloride testing and that will help in, in early initiation of treatment before you know by 3 to 4 weeks of age before severe malnutrition has set in and patients can have better bmi better lung functions and longevity of life multiple studies have proven this i'm not going into the details of those studies but you know almost every single study has definitely proven this so the protocols may be to use two types of irt or some some countries where the mutation you know the, the most of the population 85% of the population may have the same mutation in that case they can you know look for that mutation along with the irt and then you can have the genetic diagnosis also uh, at at the same time so different protocols are used in western countries the question now is is india ready is the logistics of you know um, doing this newborn screening on a national level you know you have to follow up the positives follow up the negative i mean you know follow up the negatives follow up, follow up the positives call them back for sweat testing counsel them advise them provide the correct treatment so are we ready for it uh, you know it, it may be debatable right now with a lot of other priorities that may not be you know immediately work and what strategy will be used are we going to use irt or if if you have to use dna it may not be very suitable because our uh, genotype is very kind of uh, colorful i must say there are lots of uh, mutations which are present here the most common mutation in the caucasian which is del phenotype is only about 20 to 25 or 30% at the most the rest 70 to 80% are different types of mutations in india so we can't have we can't choose one or two or three mutations to screen so that's going to be a problem then what what can we do then are there any other strategies so one thing we can do is to be proactive so one thing uh, we have noticed is growth failure is an early feature this is a this has been noticed in western countries by the time they finish the screening for the you know uh, the screening with the newborn screening and call them back for the sweat chloride they notice by 2 to 3 weeks itself the patients are failing to thrive so what about here in india this is uh, a few babies who had their diagnosis in infancy we just uh, looked at to see how they are uh, how their growth is so this is the weight for age uh, z score so that is this picture weight for age z score on the uh, on this y axis so you can see you would expect you know normal to be somewhere close to zero so even up to minus 1 minus 2 is okay but at the time of diagnosis at an average time of 3 to 4 months it was minus 4.68 and with treatment it improves but you know it takes more than a year for them to get back to something reasonable so that is very severe malnutrition very difficult to get them up to normalcy now we asked one question at that point of time what was the birth weight birth weight was all very good it, it was normal it was very much acceptable close to zero zero c score but to the question what was the weight at the time when you went for vaccination we asked all of them that question the first vaccination when they went around 6 to 8 weeks of age by then their weight had fallen actually very very much so someone could have picked it up before this diagnosis which happened 3 4 6 8 months later someone could have picked it up right then when that growth failure started so there was a missed opportunity so with this we started a surveillance of failure to thrive infants so we just started this in february 16th my team of nurses and one of the pg students so it's only about 3 and 1/2 months so 
just keeping a close watch on the weighing machine. Wherever babies are weighed, somebody was watching what is the weight being recorded. This is only babies who are born with a normal weight, not low birth weight, no, pre uh, no, no very low birth weight babies. If they had birth weight more than 2.5 kg and they were failing to thrive, that is less than third centile, we identified 96 infants. Remember, this is half the time is locked down. So the, you know, the, the patients coming to the hospital is very less. So this is probably half what you would expect in normal times. And uh, we did them clinical screening history and all those, you know, uh, etiological screening. Also, we did an aquagenic test, aquagenic wrinkling test. So 12 of them out of this was screen positive. But they were not, uh, not all of them were CF. We identified three infants out of this. So in this short span of time, uh, we were able to identify three infants. So these three infants had other features also. They were not only failing to thrive. By the time they came, we, our intention was to find when they when the first problems happens, that is failure to thrive happens, but these babies we picked up a little later. The other problem is, uh, Sharad uh, referred to this about summer dehydration. This is this, is, this um, case, I keep showing it because Looking through this chart is what really changed my outlook uh, about cystic fibrosis. This is a baby. I mean, he's a, a teenager now. He came in 2008 with the acute gastroenteritis. That was the first visit. We treated him, sent him. He came with bronchiolitis. We treated him, sent him. The next year, he came with dehydration. Two years later, he came with dehydration. Next, he came with severe dehydration. Year after year, he came back with dehydration. Every time he was appropriately treated. But what got missed is the reason that this child is coming in the summer every time. And finally, the diagnosis was made only by the time when he was four and a half years, because at the time when he was admitted in the ICU with uh, the dehydration, he had all the you know, typical metabolic uh, derangement. So watch for electrolyte imbalance with dehydration. This is summer, May, June, July, Tamil Nadu, the worst of summer. Um, in a, in a way, summer is a blessing in disguise, I would say, because these babies are brought to us. Brought to us because even with lockdown, they can't stay at home because they will become lethargic. They start vomiting because they develop hyponatremia and the parents will bring, bring to them. And the, the important the thing is, it's very easily correctable. One pint of IV fluids and this will correct. And if you send them off, you lost the chance. You lost the chance to pick up that diagnosis. So if you find hyponatremia in the summer when a baby who is presenting with lethargy or uh, you know just a vomiting. So the vomiting is not the reason for hyponatremia. The vomiting happens when the hyponatremia reaches a critical level. This has been observed in the World War also. When the soldiers were exposed to extreme heat and then they develop hyponatremia, at a particular point, they will start vomiting. Okay. So when these babies come with this presentation, that's our chance to pick them. So again, we observe that around Velo, Tiruvannamalai, Chittur, etc., this type of phenotype is very common. It may be common in other places also. So this is a typical uh, ABG. This is this patient. We, I mean, you can see the date, 30th of April. You can check the temperature of Velo that day. It was high temperature that day. And this is the baby came to one of our peripheral hospital. Even the peripheral hospital, we had alerted. This kind of a situation will happen. And they were able to pick up and send to us. And you see the results, you know, sodium is 122, potassium is 2.7, chloride is 78, bicarb is 33, and pH is 7.57. This is the typical feature you will see. Even if you don't have ABG, don't worry. You know, just the hyponatremia, the scenario, if you see, just, yeah. you know, monitor that patient. The other way to recognize these patients is to maintain a syndromic approach, a pattern recognition of sick babies with specific pattern of results. So patients who are getting into ICU with history of uh, severe pneumonia, if they have very severe airway obstruction picture, you know, sometimes recurrently they keep coming or, con you know, the bronchiolitis doesn't seem to resolve. Hyperinflated x-ray, you know, bronchiolitis is, is a very common condition. Uh, so every patient who comes with bronchiolitis does not have cystic fibrosis. But when it keeps happening again, think, think of it. Give it a thought whether are we missing a cystic fibrosis case, especially if there is failure to thrive or any sibling death or any, any kind of other features are present. Pseudomonas, you find in the airways when you do a bowel or a intubated patient tracheal culture. This is not a common bug in a normal child. 
only an immunodeficient or a cystic fibrosis patient will have pseudomonas in the airways. So immunodeficiency, you can rule out very easily. If not, then it is probably cystic fibrosis. Also, patients who have been in ICU for a long time may pick up pseudomonas. That's another matter. And metabolic alkalosis, when you expect acidosis, you are sick child, dehydrated, shock. You are expecting metabolic acidosis, but here you find metabolic alkalosis. So this kind of a syndromic or a pattern recognition, if you use, you may be able to pick up early. This is a triad of, you know, we call severe acute malnutrition. Really that, you know, quashiocar is really about an age of, age of about one, one year, one and a half year age. In an infant who presents with severe acute malnutrition, skin changes, with anemia, this kind of yeah yeah. I, I hope you can see that the hemoglobin is very low here, and um, uh, albumin is also very low. In the same frame, you have hypoalbuminemia and hypoalbumin hypo um, sorry anemia and hypoalbuminemia in an infant. So less than six months, there are very few reasons why you will develop anemia. You know, you think of bone marrow failure or blood loss or something like that. But, you know, less than six months, you don't get anemia very, very commonly. So when you have that kind of anemia requiring transfusion along with hypoalbuminemia in a baby who is failing to thrive, don't forget to think of cystic fibrosis. So this is not a new information. This was recognized long, long time back. I mentioned, uh, you know, the, uh, the article from our hospital. There also those babies had the same problem. So dif differential diagnosis, many common differential diagnoses are easily possible. <laughs> Any of them is possible. I am not saying it's all going to be cystic fibrosis, but keep cystic fibrosis also in mind. Suppose uh, if, when they have diarrhea, sometimes we may think of cow's milk protein allergy because that will also have the similar kind of uh, features. So uh, consider this also and uh, side by side evaluate. And um, one thing is that the, the confirmation of diagnosis is going to take time. Sweat test cannot, most likely can't be done when the child is edematous and very sick like that. And genetic test is going to take two months for you to get the result. So at this point, what you can do is to start treatment empirically. You know it is empirically, so that's okay. You can start empirically, give a pancreatic enzyme supplementation supplement ADEK because E is the reason for vitamin E deficiency is probably the reason for the uh, anemia or some hemolytic component and A also may interfere with the airway epithelial integrity. So these are all life-saving in that situation. K may cause severe bleeding at some point or the other, sometimes intracranial bleed. So these are life-saving supplementation you may be able to give at that point of time. So this kind of phenotype we see more commonly in the central and southern districts of uh, Tamil Nadu. Delphi notate homozygous also present very frequently like this. Meconium ileus is well known. It is cystic fibrosis, but you'll be surprised that many surgeons, they treat meconium ileus, but they don't, uh, they might think of cystic fibrosis, but they may not make the appropriate referral. So make sure your pediatric surgeons, your, your uh, group of pediatric surgeons who you refer to is very much aware of meconium ileus as a presentation of cystic fibrosis and refer the patient to you especially if the patient has had uh, ileostomy, the fluid losses from the ileostomy, the malnutrition, it is going to be very, very difficult to manage these babies. A lot of them die. So treat these patients very aggressively right from the beginning. And of course, always search for po positive family history, infant death in this families with any of this presentation or any suggestive uh, history is there you must suspect that a child, you know, in that case, you can do a, uh, at the time of birth, you can do an IRT because it's available in our country. It's not like it's not available, but as, as a national program, it may not be available. So you can order that IRT test and uh, uh, diagnose in, in, in the at time of birth itself. So to summarize on the ground, what can we do? So the main thing is suspect, always suspect, Keep cystic fibrosis as a possibility in many of these conditions. Don't think of it as a Caucasian disease or something which does not exist in Tamil Nadu. It does exist in Tamil Nadu. Uh, my uh, you know, rough estimate will be, it will be like one in 10,000 babies born, at least in the Velo district, I think have cystic fibrosis. It's a very rough es estimate. I can't prove it right now, but one day we will prove it and uh, screen them using clinical clues and uh, sometimes aquagenic wrinkling may be a good screening test to do. Uh, I mean, it doesn't diagnose, but it will give you another clue. 
and start temporary treatment because this treatment is not going to damage. It is, it's not like chemotherapy or something. It will damage the baby. Giving a little pancreatic enzyme creon is not going to do any harm because we are, it's, it's a minuscule dose compared to what our body is producing, but it can be very, very life-saving. So use, start it, counsel the parents that the treatment is not finalized. It will take time. They have to be patient but we don't want to waste time. That is why we are tra uh, treating this. And also counsel them about recurrence risk because it's an autosomal recessive condition. There is a 25% chance, 25 in the next pregnancy. 25% chance may sound like a less chance, but it is for each pregnancy, 25% chance. And in many families I have seen, uh, you know, pregnancy one, two, three, four has been in a line, have been affected babies. Antenatal diagnosis is available, so they can make use of that. And, uh, you know, use the available opportunity to diagnose. So uh, DNA sample for diagnosis, in the, you know, in the algorithm, sweat chloride is the test for, gold standard test for diagnosis. If you go straight for, when you, if you just have a clinical suspicion and you go for genetic test, you may get a result which you don't know how to interpret because many of these mutations are not mentioned or uh, you know they will come as uncertain significance and after spending 17 or 20000 rupees you won't have a result to give the family so first diagnostic test to do is sweat chloride followed by genetic testing if you want to use that information for antenatal diagnosis but if it's a sick baby or if it is the first baby of the family and especially the baby is likely to die, it's in a very sick condition, please save a sample of DNA. You know, they may not be able to do the test right, then they may not have the money or the, you know, uh, facility to do it. But that saved sample can be used later and that parents can avail of antenatal diagnosis at some time if they wish to. So save that sample. So where can you find help? Clinical decision-making, uh, meaning you need to, you know, consider all the differential diagnosis keep going using all the algorithms for different differential diagnosis you have considered, you can keep proceeding, but keep this on. I mean, I am, I am happy to be contacted anytime to talk to, through this uh, cases to see which test to order, how to go about it, etc. cetera. Uh, sweat testing in Chennai, there are a couple of places I am told, KKTCH and Surya Hospital, etc. cetera. Uh, in our hospital, we do it. The cost of sweat testing may range from anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 or a little more than that. But uh, I am able to do it at a much cheaper rate because we have a project going on here. I'm happy to help if you if you have a case with, uh, you know, uh, significant uh, doubt. Fecal elastase is another test. This fecal elastase, elastase is an enzyme produced by the pancreas. It will come in the feces. So if elastase is very low, that means the pancreas is not functioning. And in children, the commonest reason why the pancreas is non-functional is cystic fibrosis. So it gives a very good clue if you have a low fecal elastase. So some gastroenterology centers you may find they will do fecal elastase. Genetic test, I already mentioned. Uh, so you have to be careful when you're using a panel. If you don't get a positive uh, panel, it doesn't mean that the patient does not have the test. You might have to do the full sequencing to make that uh, uh, So we are happy to help with diagnosis anytime. This is our email and contact number. The aim of the project we are doing is to raise awareness and help doctors make diagnosis of CF. So we would be, in, after this COVID pandemic is over, we will be, you know, we have traveled uh, before with the sweat machine to uh, make diagnosis, help doctors make diagnosis. We'll resume that. We may be, if you want to set up the, uh, the facility, <laughs> you may be able to give training also. So uh, that's from our side. Thank you for the opportunity. And again, sorry for the interruption. Uh, thank you, madam. Thank you. I think madam has covered almost every point. Even the questions in between somebody has asked about uh, with the clinical suspicion, uh, whether you can start treatment as a clinical suspect. If madam already has given uh, permission that we are not using any antibiotic here. After all, we are going to use only the pancreatic supplement with some fat soluble vitamins. So the child will be benefited. You can go ahead. And uh, I think in my personal experience, any child that present with, uh, even with a recurrent respiratory infections or pneumonia or any presentation, if you found to have a clubbing, I think you have to strongly suspect 
uh, uh, see it to be ruled out. Particularly in younger age group, uh, uh, in the form of failure to thrive associated with the SAM, that is severe malnutrition with anemia, I think we have to strongly suspect cystic fibrosis as ruled out. And uh, she has also suggested uh, so much therapy for uh, PCR. Why not we send something more for uh, sodium chloride? Uh, that is a uh, sweat chloride that they have taken. Thank you, madam. You again, a lot of points. Now we move on to uh, the next session. Uh, probably, madam, uh, uh, madam Hale uh, is going to uh, start this session. Uh, I think uh, I, if the organizers uh, may call upon uh, our second moderator, ALRC, madam, to take the next four uh, sessions. Madam, ALRC to take over the uh, uh, podium. Thank you, Vijay Shagar, sir. Maybe I'm happy to invite Dr. ALRC, madam. She is the director and superintendent of Institute of Child Health and Hospital for Children, Chennai, probably Mecca of Pediatrics. So, Kailarsi, madam, kindly take yes. over, madam. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Gaushankar and uh, IAP TNSC for this wonderful opportunity. From last March, I think the, our pulmonology CME was cancelled and from, from then onwards till now, we are unable to hold. So, I should really thank for this wonderful opportunity. Before we start, I thank all the four speakers who gave us an excellent view of recurrent pneumonia under five visas and we learned a lot of about our own faults and sleep patterns and all that and so much so we keep interacting with Sneha madam in CF yes it is not an uncommon I think the message is don't think CF is an uncommon entity it is not uncommon so with that we go to the next session I'm very happy and proud to introduce Dr. Kalpana uh, who worked as an assistant in our department for almost a decade, an excellent clinician and a bronchoscopist. And she was awarded the KL Ahidi gold medal for the best paper in RISPICON 2011 in the indications for outcome in flexible bronchoscopy. She has to credit for more than 2,000 bronchoscopies and 18 papers in national and international journals. And she's editorial board of IJPP and a very good pulmonologist. And now she's in Vellur as the Associate Professor of Pediatric. Over to Kalpana. Thanks so much, ma'am. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Gauri Shankar and the organizers at Tamil Nadu State Chapter for giving me this opportunity. I'll be dealing with TB diagnostics today. So the diagnosis of TB, it goes with a careful history first with symptoms suggestive of tuberculosis and a history of, of a, a good history about the contact a clinical examination, including a good growth assessment, manto, bacological uh, confirmation. You can change into slideshow, please. It is. I'm in slideshow, ma'am. Okay. Right, right. Is it okay, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, only now it came. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Backlogical confirmation in every no, case. No, it's still not no full screen is not there. Full screen. Can I just from beginning? Can I just put it from beginning? The previous was only. Right, sure. Yeah. Can I just click on it? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, you have, you have five to come to the first slide. This TV diagram. F5. Let now. It will start. Slide show. Start was she? No, I think uh, if you go, you know. Madam, see on the ribbon at the top, not from beginning, from current slide. Can, can you just click on the current from current slide, please? From the current slide, either. right at the top. Yeah, yeah. Ne next one, next one. Yeah, for that one. Yeah. Is it visible, sir? Uh, yeah. No, it's, it's still visible, not but in the uh, not test, sir. But it's okay. I think. So. Can I just stop it and then try to share, yeah. share again? Just try it again, please. Yeah, it goes from... 
lightning ல கரண்ட் ஸ்லைட் ஏதாவது ஒன்னு ட்ரை பண்ணுங்களா ஆ கிளிக் ஆன் Adam, you can go to current slides and click on the top right top. Yes, Kalpana, you've got it, right. Hello. Dr. Kalpana, please proceed. Who is that? Regling. Regling. Yes. Regling. Dr. Kalpana, can you hear me? Kalpana? Hello? Yeah, ma, you are not you are not audible ma you, your slides are moving but you are not audible what you can do like uh, even if it is not a slide show you can start okay sir uh, now i am audible sir yeah you are audible madam just inga vand from the beginning irukku adu mel and the right flow idu mattum click pannunga i think it should go yeah adu click pannunga just click make right there now am i am i audible yeah you yeah, are audible but what yeah, like, is it that i need to go in proceed madam okay full presentation varam okay. okay so all is asked for the history of contact look specifically for the closeness of contact the sput and smear result of the index case if it's known the timing of the contact children usually develop within 2 years after exposure to the adult contact and most children they develop within the first year so timing of the contact is also important if you don't have an obvious contact then probably do a contact screen for all the adults in your household always remember the atypical presentations like acute severe pneumonia especially in infants and uh, and hiv infected infants uh, you have to suspect if there is poor response to antibiotics and there is a positive contact so even if they present as acute pneumonia if there is a positive contact in the household always evaluate for tuberculosis second atypical presentation which can be missed is the wheeze the wheeze can be asymmetrical it can be persistent or when it is does not respond poorly to bronchodilator you have to suspect uh, a tuberculosis it might be because of an enlarged node that is compressing on the trachea or the bronchus especially when you have persistent wheeze in a malnourished child it is more likely to be because of tuberculosis rather than asthma per se 
the first uh, investigation that we most commonly use is the chest x-ray but uh, the importance of chest x-ray in evaluation of tuberculosis is classifying the x-ray into whether it is suggestive of tuberculosis or which is it not suggestive of tuberculosis so if it's suggestive hyalur adenopathy miliary tuberculosis and chronic fibrocavitary uh, disease these x-rays are uh, classified as suggestive of tuberculosis and all the other that we usually see like consolidations non homogeneous opacities ground glassings and thin walled cavities all are classified as non suggestive of tuberculosis why do we have to classify the x ray into these two is that is because if the x ray is suggestive of tuberculosis you can go and do an upfront gene expert without waiting for a course of antibiotics but if the x ray is not suggestive of tuberculosis or is non specific like consolidations or uh, opacities it is ideal to give a course of antibiotic and at the end of the course if the child remains symptomatic and the x ray radiologically persists then probably you might have to then go for a tb evaluation but as you dr. know reading kalpana you know, dr kalpana yes. your slides are not moving ma um okay okay you need to click every time i think something is not all right so kindly move the slides after you finish this every slide thank you ma okay, okay sir the slide is uh, visible sir yeah it's visible ma visible okay so reading an x ray can is an important skill so you have to account for rotated x rays the phases of expiration the penetration of the x rays thymic shadows especially in infants and motion artifacts so all these x rays however bizarre they may seem they are all normal x rays so you have to interpret x ray in the context of the clinical findings of the child before we go on to lab investigations i would like to spend some time on obtaining a representative sample like a, because whatever fancy test that we might subject the sample to if you're not going to take a proper sampling then it is not going to help the child so the first thing that we use is uh, the first uh, most commonly done sampling technique is the resting gastric juice so it is something like using a meter dose inhaler with a spacer for every child with asthma it can be done in all age groups and it is the most preferred sampling technique most studies have shown that the highest yield from cultures is from a resting gastric juice who recommends that it has to be done on each of two consecutive mornings and the samples can be pooled for cbnat or culture but uh, so this technique actually increases the yield from resting gastric juice uh no, there are certain caveats like it can be done only in hospitalized children and for performing the test we require two people one for doing the test and one to assist the child should be fasting for at least 4 hours and in infants it should be at least for 3 hours the contraindication is thrombocytopenia other than that there are not much contraindications as well know most of us know the technique of doing a resting gastric juice but the step that is frequently missed is after collecting a resting gastric juice add an equal volume of sodium bicarbonate solution to the specimen so this will prevent the tubercle bacilli the gastric acidity from destroying the tubercle bacilli and will definitely improve your yield in the cultures so this can be a critical step for culturing and definitely the delay in processing the sample should not be more than 4 hours if there is a delay of 4 hours more than 4 hours place in a refrigerator at 4 to 8 degrees centigrade and store until transported so resting gastric juice is not an aerosol generating procedure and children as such that they are not at high risk for transmitting tuberculous disease so it can be safely performed at the child's bedside or in a uh, routine procedure room itself so sputum induction sputum induction does not require overnight hospitalization the so sputum induction you know you have to administer inhaled bronchodilator it is followed by uh, giving nebulized hypertonic saline that is 3 to 5% saline and this is followed by a nasopharyngeal aspiration if the child is not able to expectorate the sputum or if the child is able to expectorate gets a cough after the no, after the nebulization and is able to expectorate then you can go ahead and ask the child to expectorate the sputum and initial studies had shown that the yield from one induced sputum is equal to 3 yeah, gastric yeah, yeah, samples so this yeah, has shifted yeah, yeah. clinical practice guidelines to include sputum induction as an important method of collecting samples in children 
but remember it is an aerosol generating procedure and should be performed only in an isolation room for the child as such it is a low risk procedure tens and thousands of sputum inductions have been done in children and they found to be very safe there are minor side effects which are, that have been reported like coughing spells mild wheezing and nose bleeds and how young can a child be subjected to induced sputum so it is a relatively safe procedure the only thing the technician should be able to uh, he should or he or she should know how to do the procedure otherwise sampling has been done as uh, in children infants as young as uh, one month of age so sputum induction is ca can be done even in young infants are there any contraindication so sputum induction also requires fasting otherwise the child might vomit out the uh, stomach contents so fasting for at least 3 hours is required for sputum in induction in the presence of severe respiratory distress like rapid breathing or wheezing it is not uh, advisable to do uh, sputum testing similarly in the presence of thrombocytopenia severe nose bleeding or a uh, uh, child with a bleeding tendency it is not advisable reduced level of consciousness again gets a contrary contraindication and if the child is a severe asthmatic again it is not advisable so expectoration is expectoration a method of sputum uh, uh collection yes it is in uh, important method it can be done in older children like similarly for when you advise dry powder inhaler that is from 7 to 8 years when the child is able to follow your instructions and able to bring out sputum uh in that age group expectoration can be used as a method of uh bringing out uh, a representative sample but expectoration also is a procedure so you just cannot ask the child to cough and bring out a sputum sample the sample should be coming from the lower airways so the technique is ask the child to take two deep breaths and hold the breath for a few seconds after each inhalation and then exhale slowly a third time the child has to breathe in and then forcibly blow out the air and the last and fourth time the child has to breathe in again and then cough so after the cough they give the container to the child and ask him to bring out the sputum but expectation because it has to be a representative sample you have to give the child time to uh, bring out the sputum if the child is not able to cough out in the first attempt you ask the child to cough out again breathe in and out and i encourage the child to bring out a representative sample this method next method that we dealing is nasopharyngeal aspiration nasopharyngeal aspiration is now picking up as an attractive diagnostic procedure because it requires minimal facilities and training it is just to measure the uh, the length from the tracheas to the nose and using under a suction you aspirate the nasopharyngeal contents initial studies had shown that the uh, yield was very good from actually studies from peru and uganda in children with a mean age of 4 or 5 years had shown that the culture yield from nasopharyngeal aspirate was very similar to that of gastric aspirate but a subsequent st study from peru itself uh, showed the yield was very little finally zara et al had shown that it could be used as an alternative specimen when you can do two nasopharyngeal aspirate and you subject it for gene export the yield can be as good as cultures coming to bronchial alveolar lavage bronchial lavage is not a very popular sampling technique for endobronchial tuberculosis because it is an invasive procedure can be done only in tertiary centers where the facility is available and earlier studies had shown that the yield was lower than multiple gastric aspirates but in st studies from tertiary centers have shown that the diagnostic yield of bal can be better than a gastric aspirate uh cabra sir in 2011 had shown that uh you can combine one gastric aspirate and bronchoscopy to improve the afb yield in children with uh, uh, suspected pulmonary tuberculosis and uh, the subsequent study was again done in 2018 where they suggested that bal can be used as a diagnostic aid in children with smear negative so that is what we follow in ich also or in the other tertiary centers when the initial evaluation with induced sputum or resting gastric juice is negative the child is subjected to bal because advantage is that you can visualize uh, can take specimens from the involved lobe you can take a representative sample both for the uh, smear uh, cultures as well as gene expert and the second advantage is that you can look you can assess the airway for 
any abnormalities in 15 to 40% of children with advanced tuberculosis they will have rva abnormalities so for assessing endobronchial lesions bronchoscopy will have a definite role the next specimen would be your fine needle aspiration cytology it is a very very satisfying technique because it can be done by ourselves uh, in the bedside especially if the node is very fluctuant and it is node is fluctuant or it and the is peripherally accessible the uh, specimen can be processed for several things one is cytology which is almost 100% sensitive and specific for tuberculosis if carefully assessed it can yield the afp smear in 10 to 15% it can be uh, culture positive in 20 to 50% and gene expert positive in 35%. Suppose the node is not peripherally accessible, you can try ultrasound or CT guided aspiration. The next test that is used in adults is the string test. It was first evaluated for evaluation of tuberculosis and HIV infected adults. You just have a capsule. Uh, the first end of the string is just uh, strapped to the cheek. And then this uh, person is asked to swallow the capsule. The string unravels after digestion in the stomach contents, a dwell time of given for four hours, and then the string is withdrawn and subjected to cultures. So the yield was found to be better than induced sputum in adults. And subsequently, the same technique was also proposed in children and found to be well tolerated with a median age of eight, eight years. And another study had shown that even if you reduce the uh, dwell time of less than one year or uh, one hour, again, you can have a good yield uh, you needn't have a loss of field. Uh, so studies in children have been done with the string test. Uh, it was tolerated by children as young as four years of age, but as you can see, it cannot be done in, our, uh, in most uh, children less than four years. So this is about the sampling techniques. You have to attempt microbiological diagnosis in all cases of suspected tuberculosis. How many samples can you take? If it's a smear sample, that is for AFB smear, you need to take two samples. If it is for gene expert, one sample, culture, one sample, but pooling of samples can uh, increase the yield. If the CSF is obtained and the uh, amount of CSF is very small, WHO recommends the sample be processed for gene expert in preference to smear or culture. Take a uh, representative sample of CSF. 2 ml can be, at least up to 2 ml can be removed safely in units. In older children, 3 to 6 ml of CSF can be safely removed. Plural fluid, again, is a suboptimal sample. A plural biopsy is be preferred. So coming to the tests that are available, there are a lot of tests that are in the pipeline as well as in Vogue. But as you can see, most of these studies which are evaluating TB tests are done in adults. The publications that have come up with children as their study population, especially when the sample is uh, other than sputum, is dismally low. The most of the uh, reports are or the results are extrapolated from adults. So this is a nice classification which uh, gives uh, classifies the test that we can use to diagnose tuberculosis. One is uh, looking for direct evidence for mycobacterium tuberculosis and second is looking for indirect evidence for mycobacterium infection. So the direct evidence includes smear microscopy, mycobacterial cultures, normal uh, culture systems like microscopically observed drug resistance, drug sensitivity, Nucleic acid amplification methods like gene expert, line probe assay, and LAMP, microarray, and gene sequencing. There are indirect evidence for mycobacterial infections like T cell assays, uh, including MANTO and IGRA. Tests that are based on biomarkers that those related to the pathogen are lipoarabinomannan and transdermal MPV64 antigen. Those related to the host, including adenosine deaminase. So we'll deal with uh, each of the tests in a very brief way. The first will be smear microscopy. It has actually gone out of work in places where gene expert is readily available, but still in peripheral centers, smear microscopy is being done. Even if you do it properly, the yield from smear microscopy in children is very dismal. WHO recommends that you do two smears in the same visit in order to reduce the dropout lace, uh, dropout uh, percentage. Conventional microscopy has to be replaced by more sensitive methods like fluorescent microscopy. But even if you do a fluorescent microscopy and concentrate the specimen before that, the smear positive from gastric la lavage in children is only up to 20%. WHO has recommended to replace smear microscopy with the LED microscopy. 
So LED microscopy is just a smear microscope which uses LED to visualize the stained, the ornament fluorescent stained smear. It is less expensive, it requires less power and can run on batteries. The bulbs have a long half-life and they can perform well in the light room while fluorescent microscopy requires a dark room. The WHO recommend, has recommended that LED microscopy should replace conventional microscopy in both high prevalence as well as low prevalence settings. There are certain newer diagnostic like the TPDX system, which is an automated digital platform and the capture X3 system, which actually concentrates the bacilli into small chambers and then fix, uh, does the smear. Kalpana, can you move this slide? Yeah. Thank you. Coming to the molecular detection methods, uh, the most commonly that uh, we do or we are all very familiar is the gene expert. It is a fully automated uh, nucleic acid amplification test. It is uh, done in a self-contained cartridge. There is no processing of the sample. There is no cross-contamination. So in the same cartridge using microfluidics, the DNA is extracted, it is amplified, and it is detected. It can identify the MTB directly from the samples in less than two hours. The limits of detection is it can detect up to as minimum as 131 colony forming units of typical bacilli per ml of sputum. So is it the magic test that it was initially proposed? In children, it differs because when it was initially uh, introduced, it was pro proposed as the, as, the, as the positive rate was projected from the smear positive culture positive tuberculosis. In smear positive culture positive tuberculosis, the sensitivity was 98 and the specificity was very good. But in smear negative culture positive tuberculosis, the sensitivity fell down to even up to 68%. And clinically diagnosed TB, which is most common population uh, that is actually existing, gene expert doesn't do magic because it can detect only up to 4% in induced sputum and 15% in gastric aspirates. But in spite of all these for, for, uh, shortcomings, because of the improved sensitivity over smear microscopy, because of the rapid turnover time, that is by two hours, and the ability to detect interferon resistant, smear uh, gene expert has dramatically changed the diagnostic capacity of children with tuberculosis. Moreover, all the samples, almost all samples can be subjected to smear microscopy except urine and blood. But remember, it should not be used as a follow-up test. When a child is on uh, ADT, when the child comes back with a poor response or just for follow-up at two months or so, we cannot use gene expert as a follow-up test because it can give false positive results. The other two nucleic acid amplification tests that are available are the expert RIF Ultra. It is a next generation cartridge. It is more sensitive than gene expert with a sensitivity as low as 16 colony forming units per ml of sputum. It is proposed as uh, the preferred uh, CBNAT uh, in children with HIV positive in pediatric specimens and extra pulmonary specimens, exp uh, especially CSF. Refambicent resistance is also detected more accurately with the uh, gene expert ultra. It might re uh, replace expert ultra in the near future. But not to mention TrueNAT. TrueNAT is the Indian variation of gene expert. The main advantage is that it is battery operated and it has drastically brought down the cost of uh, doing the, uh, nucleic acid amplification testing. But the disadvantage is that it is not fully automated and samples like gastric aspirate, which is the most common sample that we send from children, they need centrifuging before they can be subjected to TrueNAT. That is why most of the RNTCP centers now are doing TrueNAT for adult samples, but they are refusing to accept pediatric samples. So what are some of the other uh, nucleic acid amplification assays are the loop-mediated isothermal amplification assays. This was a temperature-independent method of DNA amplification. It is a simple to use test. It provides a visual display that is easy to read and is suitable for usage in peripheral health centers. The WHO has recommended the uh, lamp, uh, lamp as a diagnostic tool in adults, especially when they come for follow-up and a smear negative. The sensitivity is found to be better than smear microscopy and they, it has been in children. Uh, one other way is the microarray. Because of all these problems in taking specimens from children, we have diagnostics have now shifted to other methodologies where you can just 
take blood samples or sputum samples and look for pattern of RNA expression. In some studies, it has been shown that certain RNA risk scores can be highly specific and sensitive for culture-confirmed tuberculosis, and can they, they can differentiate active from latent tuberculosis. Again, these tests did not perform well in clinically diagnosed tuberculosis. And moreover, all these studies, I mean, all these methodologies, they need modifications to make the technology more feasible to be workable in the peripheral centers. Coming to the gold standard, gold standard is mycobacterium culturing. It is the current gold standard. The sensitivity is as low as 10 coliform units per ml of sample. The uh, great advantage is that we can do a species identification and we can do a complete drug sensibility testing. Suppose we are going to uh, uh, isolate the organism in the culture. The specimen type influences the sensitivity of the culture. The highest yield for, of mycobacterial cultures comes from gastric aspirates. It is more than from induced sputum or nasopharyngeal aspirates or bronchial larval specimens or from stool samples. Again, the sensitivity is high in children with advanced disease and infants. Remember that the specimen that you are suspect uh, that you are subjective to culture should be a representative of the uh, site of infection. For example, this was a child who had presented with chronic draining sinuses for almost one year and was pouring out pus. And every time the pus was sent for gene expert and cultures, did not yield any of the M tuberculosis. But ultimately, a bone biopsy, the osteomyelitis, which was the source of all these sinuses, actually proved to be culture positive. So you have, when you would subject a case, when you are evaluating a child for tuberculosis, you have to take a representative sample and send it for culturing. The culture should be collected aseptically in order to prevent the overgrowth of the other contaminant bacteria in the uh, uh, midget systems. The after processing is also important. As I said, you have to add sodium bicarbonate after you uh, collect the specimen. The second is the specimen should arrive in the laboratory on the day of collection. If the delay is more than one hour, you refrigerate at four degrees. This should be done not only from the place of transport, it should be done also in the uh, laboratory until it is processed. If suppose a prolonged storage or transport is expected, Preservatives can be added like sodium carbonate, cetyl pyridium chloride, and sodium borate. So the current recommendation of WHO is to use uh, continuous monitoring liquid cultures like the mycobacterium growth indicator tube or midget because of its better sensitivity and faster results. The cultures can be got as early as two weeks and additional two weeks for drug sensitivity testing. When compared to solid cultures, we can take it up to four weeks for culture another four to six weeks for drug sensitivity testing. Liquid culture platforms that are available include the Bactec 960 widget, Bactec Alert, and Myco ESP culture system. The sensitivity of culture is only 30 to 40% of the clinically diagnosed cases, even though we consider it as a gold standard. But as I said, the major advantage is that we can get the good complete drug sensitivity testing, susceptibility testing. Species identification, it is recommended that we have to do in every culture isolate, we have to identify the species at least to the point of differentiating mycobacterium tuberculosis from environmental bacteria. Sometimes we would specifically ask for the uh, species, for example, in uh, disseminated besiciosis in children with skid or MSMD. Classically, species differentiating is done using biochemical reactions, but uh, uh, we have more and more of PCR assays which are highly sensitive and highly specific uh, for species identification. Like the Acuprobe test and the genotype uh, mycobacteria CMAs. These are, these are PCR based assays which are highly sensitive for differentiating mycobacterium TB uh, complex from non-tuberculous mycobacteria. So are there other culture methods? There are non-commercial culture and DST methods which are WHO approved. These are less expensive than the commercial systems, but they are prone to errors because of lack of standardization and local variations in methodology, and their performance is highly operator dependent. So WHO recommends that these tests only be done in uh, national or reference laboratories where uh, you can maintain the high quality of uh, laboratory practice. Our specific interest is this microscopic observation drug sensibility or MONS, as it is uh, uh, said. 
it is uh, it just inoculating the specimen into small microbes which contain the medium some of the medium can also contain uh, antibiotics that is uh, anti tuberculous drugs to inhibit the growth and then this these wells are observed by using microscopically by an inverted light microscope the good thing is that they can detect growth as, as early as 7 days and they can also detect drug susceptibility uh but as i said this can be they are very labor sensitive and they are operator dependent and cannot be done in a peripheral setting coming to gene sequencing this might be a, a important investigation in the days to come you can do either whole gene sequencing or next generation sequencing whole gene sequencing can detect drug resistance conferring genes and at the same time can also give the species of the mycobacterial isolates they have good agreement with the current genotypic and phenotypic techniques the next is the next uh, generation sequencing unlike whole gene sequencing which can be done only in uh, in uh, culture isolates because they require a large sample of the dna next generation sequencing can be performed directly from the samples and uh, could be the next uh, mean the future of tb diagnostics coming to the test which are based on indirect evidence of mycobacterial infection these includes manto and igra so manto is an age old test uh, we still use manto for evaluation of active as well as latent tb infection we use the 2 tu strength of rt23 it is read after 48 to 72 hours with an induration of 10 mm in children with hiv a cut off of 5 mm is taken if the 2 tu is not available 5 tu may be used the limitation is that it is neither sensitive nor specific for diagnosing active tb that is the presence of a positive manto does not tell you whether the child is currently suffering from tuberculosis or not at the same time the interpretation also can be difficult because the outcome of the test can be uh, can be highly dependent upon the technique that is adopted the age of the child the immunological status as well as the nutritional status and the future issues are that tuberculin the lot source from which manto is uh, is got is going to be exhausted and equivalent lots are not going to be the same and another problem is most of the tuberculins which are available in india are not standardized so these are issues in the future so we have new manto test like the ctp test or the copenhagen tp test it is not available as of now in india but it is proposed as a point of care test the antigen it uses is esat6 and cfp10 antigens of mtb so it is highly specific for mtb infection unlike uh, unlike manto it is unaffected by bcg vaccination status and in duration of 5 mm is taken as evidence of infection coming to interferon gamma release assays again these are only another method of in the detecting latent infection the principle is suppose a child has a prior tb infection the t cells would be sensitized and once they are pre stimulated with mtb specific antigen they will respond by secretic interferon gamma and this interferon gamma is measured by these assays the two antigens that we use is the early secretory antigenic target that is esat6 and the culture filtrate protein 10 or third antigen that is tb7.7 is used in contiferon gold assay these antigens are absent in bcg vaccines and it most non tuberculous mycobacteria so it becomes highly specific for m tuberculosis the two commercial platforms one is the contiferon tb golden cube and the second is the t spot test these assays have a sens- uh, sensitivity which is similar to manto that is they do not give you any more information than manto they cannot distinguish latent tb infection from tb disease and they can be falsely negative because tb disease advanced tb disease itself can be immunosuppressive so the t lymphocytes will not have been adequately cannot be adequately stimulated at all but in developed countries igra has replaced manto because of its better sensitivity specificity and it is unaffected by bcg vaccination and non tuberculous mycobacteria but who recommends that neither manto nor igra should be used for the diagnosis for active tuberculosis disease and it should not replace manto in low and middle income countries because it is costly it is technically complex to perform you don't have any additional information rather than what is given by a manto and relatively a large volume of blood is required 
and moreover in children less than 2 years very often we get indeterminate ekra results which are difficult to interpret so and moreover it, it, the performance is poor in immunocompromised children so ekra it's not at present it is not used as a technique for latent tuberculosis in india coming to biomarkers you could classify them as those related to the pathogen that is markers that are secreted by the mycobacterium tuberculosis and those that are uh, related to the host among those that are related to the pathogens we have lipoarabinin manan which is the most investigated and is a commercially available biomarker assay it is a polysaccharide component of the bacterial cell wall it is detected in the sputum and the urine it has good specificity but again the sensitivity comes low in heterogeneous population with low hiv prevalence another test is the transdermal mpb64 antigen skin patch test uh, which has good sensitivity and specificity and uh, volatile organic compounds that are produced by the pathogen the patient's sputum they are again being developed as a point of care test biomarkers related to the host uh, time and again we try uh, we are, most of the time we get the uh, samples we get results uh, of adenosine deaminase it is a non specific test it is an enzyme which is stimulated or uh, which is secreted by mycobacterial antigens stimulate t lymphocytes it can be measured in various body fluids and as i said it is very poor sensitivity as well as specificity and is not recommended as a diagnostic test especially the evaluation of tb pleural disease the last two slides will be on drug susceptibility testing so how do we detect drug susceptibility either can be by phenotypic methods or by genotypic methods phenotypic methods is the conventional that is we do a culture and then depending upon the presence of the anti tuberculosis drug and the response to the growth of the organism or the inhibition of the growth of the organism we uh, get uh, give the resistance uh, pattern although the phenotypic methods are very slow the complete susceptibility profile of m tuberculosis can be done with a can be got with the uh, phenotypic method so it is the preferred method of uh, drug susceptibility testing in children especially when you are evaluating cases of multi drug resistant tuberculosis but the importance of genotypic methods cannot be underestimated especially gene expert when the results are available in 4 hours and uh, available in two less than 2 hours and the second is the rifampicin resistance is usually used as a predictor of multi drug resistance that is it is used as a predictor of inh resistance also so we can make child, uh, shift the child directly from drug sensitive tb treatment to drug resistant tb treatment then uh, another no one uh, test or uh, pcr based assay which is uh, less utilized in children is the line probe assay line probe assay is not uh, advised to do uh, to be used as a diagnostic test for m tuberculosis because it requires uh, high uh, positive bacilli it can be performed only on smear positive samples and um, but the use in children comes in when you are evaluating for drug resistance in culture so once you have a culture either by liquid culture or in a uh, in culture rapidly can you can apply the line probe assay and you can detect resistance not only to inh and rifampicin you can also detect resistance to the fluoroquinolones and the uh, second line injectables like uh, capreomycin amikacin and canamycin so this is a test which is very useful for deciding the regimen for drug resistant tuberculosis so it can detect high level and low level moxifloxacin resistance and it also can detect resistance for the second line injectable for example if the rrs mutation is detected then you cannot use any of the second line injectables but if the eis eis mutation is detected you can still include amikacin in the regimen similarly uh, high level and low level inh resistance can also be detected so so these are the genotypic methods for drug resistance so with that i come to the end of my topic thank you thank you kalpana for this excellent talk on diagnosis of tuberculosis as she said like uh, uh, this uh, true nat has been introduced but only thing they need a large specimen so we don't uh, get to do and one more thing which i like to mention is uh, that uh, we don't get ctb in the near future so our uh, uh, rntcp is advising for bigger children igras 
and they have started this project already in Tiruvallur district because of the COVID. Actually, our ICH was identified as the center of excellence for this uh, region, but unfortunately, we are not able to implement due to COVID. So soon, maybe we also will start doing IGRAS. So any questions? Welcome. Sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, it's okay. Somebody has asked a question. Uh, Kalpana, you can stop your uh, slide sharing. Role of biopsy and CT chest. Uh, somebody has asked that question. Uh, yes, more than biopsy, first go for FNSC. FNSC will give you a very good uh, yield of uh, that same FNSC specimen. You can subject to CDNAT. You can do a microscope and all that. So it's a very good specimen. So it, uh, it reduces the workload of the pathologist to... But then if your biopsy, if the FNS is not conclusive, yes, there's a role for this. And then Kalpana, the, they've asked a question for CT chest, the role of so CT, CT chest. CT chest, we don't do CT chest routinely. As you said, when you have a pulmonary tuberculosis, we do a uh, gene expert, uh, we do restricastic juice or induced sputum. So that becomes negative. We subject the child next to is, uh, to subject the child to bronchoscopy. So we increase the yield. I don't think CT chest gives you uh, any additional information except when you're looking for some uh, nodes. When some sometimes the medial adenopathy will not be at, uh, visible in an ordinary chest X-ray. So a CT chest or a CT contrast can pick up, especially when you put a contrast, you'll be able to uh, detect these caseating nodes. So when you're still strongly suspecting pulmonary tuberculosis in a symptomatic child and the X-ray remains normal, probably you might go in for a CT chest, but it is not advised or it will not give you any additional information when you are more than an X-ray or an ultrasonogram while evaluating a child with CT chest. Somebody has asked which is the one best for TB. I think the question was about a, a TST and uh, IGRAS, I think, or biopsy, I don't know. Dr. Javid Khan has asked which is the one best for TB. If you mean for the specimen, it is the resting gastric yes. juice will be the best will be the best specimen, the best sample for culturing as well as gene expert. He has only asked. I don't know what he meant. I think I've answered his question. Yeah. Okay, so shall we move to the next session? Okay, the next speaker would be Dr. Muttaya Periya Karpanan. Or, madam, sorry. it will be Anthony Terrence, madam. Anthony Terrence, okay. Yeah. So the next uh, speaker will be Dr. Anthony Terrence, who works in, uh, I think he's attached to GK in the right? Yeah, he's a, uh, uh, he, he's an MDMRCP with the European Diploma in Pediatric Respiratory Medicine. He's a consultant pediatric pulmonologist and a bronchoscopist in GK in the He has got 15 scientific publications in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, journals and he has got the award of Professor Henry Claman Award from CNC Valor in 2009 and then Professional Excellence Award for GKNM Hospital and he has delivered the Subramaniam Oration in 2018 and his special interest in PCB and I think uh, he's going to talk a lot about the pneumonia pre-COVID and maybe the post-COVID also. Well, uh, the, over to Dr. Anthony Terence. Um, no. Thank you, madam, for the kind introduction. Am I audible? Yes, yes you are audible, Teddy. sir. You can go ahead. Okay. Uh, respected teachers, fellow pediatricians, and my dear friends, it gives me immense pleasure uh, to be here and talking to you on management of uh, childhood pneumonias. It's a very common topic. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank um, IAP TNSC team for organizing this event. And I will also like to thank... Uh, my teacher, Dr. Gauri Shankar, for this uh, opportunity, excellent opportunity. Um, this is a brief outline of my presentation. In the next 30 minutes, I will try to define uh, pneumonia, and we'll also define the burden of uh, the pneumonia in children. And then we look at uh, management of pneumonia and complication using illustrative case capsules. And uh, this is being a COVID season, COVID era, we'll touch upon COVID disease. And then finally, uh, we'll talk uh, about preventive strategies and then summarize. And uh, we all know that, uh, we all know, but uh, our respiratory tract is uh, silently you know, fighting off infections. Uh, we are continuously exposed to 
invading our desperate tract is exposed to invading pathogens but it fights very silently and very efficiently and uh, how it does is like we have a three layered uh, you know defenses uh, is the barriers to infection or mechanical barriers we have we have the innate immunity and adaptive the system has both cellular components as well as molecules they are efficient in fighting off invading bugs therefore we don't know exactly you know what's happening inside but at times at times uh, when uh, when the invading organism is uh, smart or when our immune systems are down uh, we get an infection and uh, if we get in the lungs we call it pneumonia and what do you uh, mean by pneumonia pneumonia is a condition that typically associated with fever respiratory symptoms and evidence of parenchymal involvement this is very important evidence of parenchymal involvement this can be elicited just by clinical signs who says we can just go by respiratory rate uh, this is for healthcare workers for, for pediatrician we need something more uh, more lung signs like reduce air entry crackles and a grunt these are things we need to look at and when you make a diagnosis based on clinical sign we call it clinical pneumonia and uh, if you take an x ray if you are able to demonstrate opacities then you say it's a radiologically confirmed pneumonia and uh, what is the disease burden uh, you know um, we are making lots of fuss about covid uh, but uh, you know pneumonia is a silent killer uh, about uh, 1 million children die every year because of pneumonia is, uh, and it contributes to 15 to 16% of under 5 child mortality and where all this mortality happens uh, in developing countries uh, sub saharan africa as well as south asia india Uh, stands only second next to nigeria uh, according to this report and uh, about uh, more than 1 lakh deaths occur every year in india due to uh, this uh, you know childhood pneumonia therefore uh, we need to do better you know we need to have you know public health interventions uh, uh, you know have to improve and over the period of from 2000 uh, the good thing is from 2000 you know 2000 Till date, the uh, number of pneumonia deaths has been decreasing. That's a good sign. And uh, we'll see illustrative case capsule. This is a three-year-old child who is unwell for three days, and uh, this child presented with fever, cough, and hurried breathing. And uh, on examination, the sick uh, child is sick-looking, normally nourished, and tachypneic. Uh, if you go by WHO, here itself we can say it's pneumonia, but. Um, child has got chest severe chest contractions and we did a pulse oximetry as well child is hypoxemic and tachycardic there was a reduced air entry on the right side in addition to that there is crackles and grunt we all know grunt is again a forced expiration against a partial that indicates you know uh, the child is um, having a parenchymal lung disease therefore based on this we can easily make a diagnosis of clinical pneumonia but uh, as pediatricians we need to qualify further further variables we have to add further variables that's very important for the management the two important variables we have to add is which setting this pneumonia is occurring that's very important therefore this is a community acquired pneumonia this uh, the patient has acquired infection from the community not from the hospital and second is we have to mention the severity that's very helpful for clinical decisions therefore from looking at the you know a clinical signs you have hypoxemia severe attractions and marked tachycardia this is a severe pneumonia therefore it's important to add the qualifiers severity as well as setting therefore this is a community acquired pneumonia and this is severe pneumonia what next as we evaluate it's very very important to take care of the abc because child is hypo hypoxemic we have to give oxygen and if needed other respiratory support as well once you do that the important decision next decision you have to make is whether i am going to treat the child as an outpatient or i am going to refer the child for admission therefore uh, in case of severe pneumonia definitely the child will require inpatient treatment and what are the factors we need to consider to make uh, you know pneumonia severe as we already seen uh, one of the one of the below findings like severe respiratory distress severe hypoxemia or cyanosis marked tachycardia altered mental state or if it is a complicated pneumonia this child will require admission apart from this important criteria severe uh, severity other two factors we need to consider in even in, in case of non severe pneumonia the child is less than 6 months of age definitely we need to think about inpatient treatment and other thing is 
persons of comorbid conditions, if the child has got heart disease or immunosuppressing uh, condition, definitely we need to refer this patient for admission. And uh, once you made a decision, you know, you started treatment, decided whether to admit this child or not, next decision you need to do is like, um, what investigations I am going to do. And, uh, and other point I missed is like um, PAC admission, any child with recurring respiratory support, oxygen, or if there is in hemodynamic in instability, you have to admit the child in the PACU. And um, after admitting this child, uh, the next, uh, you know, uh, step is uh, basic ordering basic investigations. Simultaneously, we start treatment as well. And these were the tests done in our patient. Chest X-ray, labs, we did uh, CBC, CRP, and blood culture. We'll see one by one uh, whether these you know, investigations are appropriate or not. Therefore, what are the indications for doing a chest X-ray in acute pneumonia? Definitely, if the child has got a severe pneumonia recurring hospitalizations, you have to do an X-ray, not for an OPD patient. OPD patient doesn't require an X-ray. And uh, if you have an infant who has high grade of fever, and if you don't know the focus, if you do a blood test, if the patient has got leukocytosis, the WBC count is more than 20,000, even without other signs, you can take an X-ray to know whether the patient has got pneumonia or not, and the diagnosis is in doubt. When you suspect a complication, definitely you need to take an X-ray. These are the instances where you need to take an X-ray upfront. What about other investigations we have done in this patient? Um, this patient had right upper lobe consolidation with right pleural effusion. And uh, other tests we have done is a CRP and CR, a CBC and CRP. And uh, leukocytosis uh, you know, definitely indicates Sila has got a bacterial infection, but it's very non-specific. It can, you know, there can be leukocytosis in other situations as well. And even in viral infection, you can have leukocytosis. Leukopenia doesn't necessarily mean viral infection because of overwhelming bacterial infection, especially with pneumococcus or staphylococcus, you can get leukopenia. It's a, sometimes a bad prognostic sign. What about inflammatory markers? Again, they are non-specific. CRP and procalcitonin are non-specific. They can be, you now see uh, with, uh, you know, high, uh, NISI, uh, you get a CRP and procalcitonin elevator. Therefore, it can be raised in inflammatory conditions as well. It's not very specific for infection. And uh, what is the value then doing a procalcitonin and CRP? Um, thing is, if it is, if it is very low, uh, the like likelihood of a bacterial infection is very less. If pro especially procalcitonin, if it is less than 0.25 nanograms per ml, the ch chances of a bacterial infection is very less but it's very, very expensive. Therefore, it's not absolutely necessary. There are certain situations where when you need to monitor for response, this is quite helpful. Uh, and um, you can decide on your antibiotic duration. There are adult studies to show antibiotics can be you know, stopped earlier based on procalcitonin. Therefore, to monitor response, it might be useful, but uh, these tests are absolutely, uh, it's not necessary all the time. And what about uh, cultures? We did blood culture, but uh, it's not necessary to do blood culture on an OPD patient or if a child get, getting admitted in a ward, it's not necessary to uh, culture because the yield is very, very low. If the patient is sick and if you feel it's, a, it's going to be a bacterial pneumonia, especially in ICU setting, definitely blood culture will be of use. And other problem is uh, in most of the occasions, you know, we, are not able, we will not be able to isolate the bug because children won't expect red sputum and uh, we can't do lung puncture and, uh, you know, pleural aspirate or bal in all the situations, there are indications for it. Therefore, can't do all this investigative tests for all patients with pneumonia. What about nasopharyngeal aspirate? Nasopharyngeal aspirate, we are doing it quite often because of COVID-19. Therefore, it's very useful uh, for viral infections, not for you now pyogenic bacterial infections. And it's also useful atypical mycobacteria like mycoplasma, chlamydia, and bordetella is useful. Even with viral infection, uh, if you have a virus in the upper respiratory tract, some viruses like you know, rhinovirus, adenovirus, they, they can be there for a long time. Therefore, if you get rhinovirus or adenovirus, this test might not be significant. If you get other viruses like influenza, COVID-19, then definitely they are going to be pathogenic. And other thing is uh, co-infection. Nowadays, we talk about <laughs> viral pneumonia. Therefore, the patient might have a viral infection simultaneously or can have pneumococcal as well as, uh, you know, or staphylococcal infection in the lungs. Therefore, presence of, uh, you know, one virus in the nose doesn't rule out a bacteria in the chest as well. Therefore, these 
tests have their own limitations. Therefore, um, how are we going to manage this patient? Uh, therefore, the chance of getting a bug is very low. And to uh, begin with, we won't have uh, any you know, uh, details about uh, the bug which is infecting. Therefore, we have to make some scientific guesses or calculated guesses. That's called, uh, we are going to uh, give empirical treatment. Empirical treatment is uh, based on two things, which we already said. Uh, two important things is S, S, setting and severity. In case if it is a community acquired pneumonia, the common pathogen between two months to five years, we all know is strep pneumonia followed by staphylococcus and strep pyogenes. We need to cover for these bugs. If it is hospital acquired pneumonia or healthcare associated pneumonia is going to be bugs, drug resistant bugs, mainly gram negative bugs and MRSA from the hospital. And if a patient has got neurological problems, uh, problems with the uh, swallowing and if the patient develops aspiration pneumonia, I think in addition to gram positive and gram negative bugs, we have to cover for anaerobic bacteria. Immunodeficiency, you know, they, they will have all kinds of funny organism opportunistic infections like PCJ and fungal, we need to think about in addition to bacteria and viruses. Therefore, uh, think about when you write a prescription, think about setting and severity before you write the prescription. And what happened to our patient? Uh, you know, this is the flow chart for a patient uh, admitted with pneumonia in hospital. And uh, we'll see the first line drug is going to be ampicillin, the first line drug, because it has good action against pneumococcus. But uh, there are alternatives. Uh, we use third generation cephalosporin, ceftriaxone, it's not bad to use that, or augmentin we can use. And uh, if there is beta-lactam allergy, uh, we can use levofloxin if there is allergy. This is a very, very rare scenario. And if it is, the patient is admitted in the ward, either one of these drugs, either ampicillin, augmentin, or ceftriaxone will do. Ampicillin is a drug of choice. And um, we can manage with single drug. In case if the child is getting admitted in PICU, I think we need to think about MRSA. Therefore, you need to give MRSA coverage. That again depends on, uh, you know, uh, presence of uh, drug resistance in your area. In my in my place, clindamycin resistance is quite high. Therefore, we go for vancomycin. Again, in severe pneumonia, irrespective of age, you need to consider atypical microorganism. Therefore, we do uh, cover for mycoplasma as well. Therefore, we give azithromycin. In case of these are patients, severe pneumonia getting admitted in PICU. And uh, what patient ampicillin, augmentin, or cephalorexin will do? And if it, the patient is allergic to beta lactams, levofloxacin. And uh, uh, um, this is a, like a antibiotic sensitivity of a pneumococcus. Uh, this was recent, uh, published in 2016. This is an Indian study. And uh, this study clearly shows what are the drugs you should not use. Uh, we should not use uh, macrolide antibiotics. I have seen you know, macrolide prescriptions for pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia. Therefore, macrolide, you know, there is high degree of resistance for pneumococcus. Therefore, macrolides better not to use. Quatrimoxol, you know, again, resistance is quite high. And if you see, you know, like uh, we already talked about penicillin and uh, cephalosporins, parental cephalosporins are quite good. But in case of oral cephalosporins, their bioavailability is poor. They, are, they don't, you know, reach sustained drug levels above MIC. Therefore, oral cephalosporin better to avoid. And there are people using cefixin. It has only gram negative coverage and it doesn't cover for pneumococcus. Therefore, avoid cephalosporins and macrolides for com uh, community acquired pneumonia. And what is the treatment of choice if the patient is treated as an outpatient in your office practice, non-severe pneumonia? The drug of choice is amoxicillin. And um, WHO recommends high dose amoxicillin. It's not 30 milligram per kg per day. It's 30 milligram per kg per dose, um, up to 90 milligram per kg per day in two or three divided doses. For LRTA, three divided doses is better than two divided doses because the drug levels are maintained above MIC for a longer period of time. And the failure rates will be much less. Why we are using high dose amoxicillin? Because if in case the patient has got you know, intermediate resistance to penicillin, which can be overcome by do, using a high dose amoxicillin. The alternative drug is amoxiclav. And uh, what is the duration of antibiotics? It's usually five to seven days. Uh, but uh, it's very important to ask the patient to come after 48 hours to check for response. That's very, very important. As I said, we have to 
Avoid macrolide antibiotics for community acquired typical bacterial pneumonias. I am talking only about typical bacterial pneumonias and oral cephalosporins. And uh, this is another child, five-year-old child. This child presented with pneumonia, and you can see, uh, you know, right upper lobe opacity, and therefore this is a clinical pneumonia and a radiologically proven pneumonia. Child was put on augmentin, and after 48 hours, child didn't have a clinical response. Fever was persisting, but simultaneously the patient had a rash, and this rash was erythematous. At areas there was vesicular rash as well. Uh, in the presence of atypical features like uh, you know skin finding or ear uh, you know uh, issues or ear infection or uh, you know uh, arthralgia uh, anemia all those atypical features you need to consider mycoplasma therefore we did a pcr this is from the nasopharynx and uh, this patient was positive for mycoplasma therefore this patient was appropriately treated with macrolide antibiotics when you have uh, in a clinical setting of atypical pneumonia, you can treat uh, for mycoplasma uh, better after confirmation. Therefore, consider mycoplasma when the patient presents atypical features and severe pneumonia. And uh, we'll move on to the next case capsule. This is a three year old child treated for CAP. Fever, uh, the child presented with fever despite being treated with IV antibiotics for five days. In this setting, uh, there are three considerations whether we have not given appropriate antibiotics or adequate dose. And uh, second thing is uh, presence of complications and um, alternative diagnosis. We have ruled out inadequate antibiotic therapy. Patient re uh, received appropriate adequate antibiotic therapy. There was no alternate diagnosis. Therefore, the screening investigation in this scenario is doing a test X-ray. We have already seen in case of complications, suspected complications, you have to do an X-ray. Therefore, with an X-ray, uh, we, we, we can see a plural collection on the right side, plural collection on the right side. Once you have a plural collection, we need to define further, you know, whether the, the quantity of the fluid, that's very, very important for decision making. And um, plural effusion, there are three stages, which stage we are in. And third thing, if at all, if you are putting an ICD, where to cite the ICD. And for these three questions, ultrasound just uh, gives good answer. That's what, if you have a plural disease, especially plural effusion, Ultrasound chest is the investigation. Don't do a CT scan. And uh, this patient had a loculated effusion. I was talking about plural stages of plural effusion. Plural uh, infection is a continuum. And uh, during the first week, it's usually exudative effusion, which will be a free flowing fluid. Here, treatment is mainly antibiotics. But if the effusion is large and if the patient is having respiratory distress, we have to put a chest strain. The second stage usually occurs during the second week. Therefore, it's important to time uh, and by mass. Second week, uh, usually you see separations or loculation. In the presence of patients and loculation, and if the effusion is significant, we have to drain it. And uh, here, uh, you know, just putting ICD might not be you know, helpful. We have to do fibrinolysis, either medical fibrinolysis or surgical fibrinolysis, depending on the center's experience. We have a very good VAT surgeon, Professor Rajamani. Therefore, we go for VATs. And um, usually they do well, the outcome is very good. But uh, if, 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 uh, if the patient is you know, treated with antibiotics for more than two weeks, and uh, if the pus gets organized, it's organization stage. And what it does is forms a fibrous peel along, around the lungs, and the lungs can get trapped in the peel. Therefore, in this stage, we have to do release the lung. Therefore, we have to go for thoracotomy. The here, VATs won't work. We have to go for thoracotomy and do decortication. Our patient uh, was diagnosed in uh, stage two, therefore uh, had VATs and recovered well. And this is again a child treated for pneumonia, poor response to therapy. If you see, you can see haziness in the left, uh, you know, lower zone and ultrasound was done. There was no significant effusion, but ultrasound suggests you of lung abscess. Therefore, if you want to, you know, know further about a parenchymal lesion, CT scan will be the best investigation. If you want to look at the parenchyma. Therefore, um, this patient had a lung abscess. How do you treat a lung abscess? 95% of the time, lung abscess responds to your antibiotics. As, uh, we have to cover for gram positive, gram negative, and mainly anaerobes. And uh, in the setting of um, lung abscess, it's important to check whether the patient has aspiration risk, risk or uh, the patient has got an underlying congenital malformation, which CT scan will give the answer, the uh, CPAM, or sequestration can present as lung abscess. 
Uh, we treated this patient uh, conservatively, but uh, this patient didn't respond to medical management. Very rarely, like uh, we have to intervene. This patient had CT guided aspiration of the as, uh, of the abscess, and uh, this child uh, improved really well. And uh, this is another child treated for left uh, uh, side of pneumonia, empyema. The lung lower lobe is not expanded. You can't see the diaphragm on the left side. And um, this patient, therefore, uh, we subjected for bronchoscopy because in this situation, there are two possibilities. It could be a foreign body with secondary pneumonia or something blocking like a mucus plug. Therefore, we wanted the answer. We did bronchoscopy. And the bronchoscopy showed uh, thick uh, purulent material, no foreign body. It was suctioned out. And uh, immediately, there was good lung expansion. Therefore, bronchoscopy has a role in certain complicated pneumonia, not all patients. And uh, this is necrotizing pneumonia. Necrotizing pneumonia um, is again caused by the same bugs what we have uh, told for community of pneumonia, but it could be the virulent strains of these bugs. And what we have to do differently in this particular thing is like we have to uh, consider drug resistant bugs. We have to treat with antibiotics. There is no need for any intervention. And uh, for necrotizing pneumonia, we might need to give antibiotics for a prolonged period of time. Okay. For uh, same bugs, but uh, could be more virulent strains. No need for any surgical intervention. Uh, they usually respond to antibiotics, but you need to give for a regular, a longer period, and you need to cover drug resistant bugs as well. And um, complicated pneumonia, medical management, we have seen, individually we have seen, but uh, generally uh, empirical, we have to give. As I said, depending on the type of complication, we might need to extend the empirical coverage. And uh, second thing is the duration of antibiotics, uh, you know, is usually up to four weeks you have to give. And uh, it's not necessary in uncomplicated pneumonia to do a uh, repeat chest X-ray. Here, in this situation, after completion of antibiotics, you have to confirm resolution by doing a repeat chest X-ray. There are other indications for repeat chest X-ray. Dr. Sharath's, uh, you know, topic, recurrent or persistent symptoms. Or if you have a down pneumonia, definitely you have to, uh, to a repeat chest X-ray to confirm resolution. And uh, viral pneumonias, like uh, viral infections, are uh, most frequent cause of pneumonia in children under five years. Um, viral pneumonias can have co-infection with bacteria, and viral infection also predisposes to secondary bacterial infection because it damages your airway defenses and your pathogenic bacteria are waiting in the uh, you know nose invade. Therefore, you can have secondary bacterial infections. That's very, very important. Therefore, uh, to be, uh, begin with, uh, it could be a viral infection. Therefore, you need to, even in a viral infection, you have to monitor them closely. They can have secondary bacterial infections. And um, as we already discussed, PCR of respiratory samples is quite helpful. We actually, in our center, we looked at PCR samples sent for, uh, you know, multiplex PCR sample sent for LRTA. We we looked at 60 patients, 69 patients, retrospective study. We found uh, RSV being the commonest, followed by influenza A and B, parainfluenza, and BOCA viruses. And um, other thing, what we noted is like um, the peak of uh, RSV occurs earlier, you know, uh, September, October, compared to influenza in our place uh, during the study. Influenza peak occurred in January and February. Therefore, RSV peak occurs earlier. These are the two things we learned from this retrospective study, and it was published in Sri Lankan Journal of Child Health. And um, what about COVID pneumonia? Does it behave like a viral pneumonia? And there is a study from China looking at a, a cohort of viral pneumonias and a cohort of COVID-19. What they found is quite interesting, and this is what we see as well. Um, Mostly the COVID infections, uh, you know, they get infected from one of the adult family members. It's not like uh, usually child to child, it's usually from adult family member, they get the infection. The median age, uh, you know, if they're present with, uh, you know, respiratory infection, the median age is slightly higher, six years compared to viral infection. The other viral infection is 3.2 years. And uh, lower proportion of severe cases, they they actually evaluated 40 COVID patients and found only one patient had a severe, uh, a severe COVID disease compared to other viral infections. And the number of severe cases were slightly higher. Therefore, uh, severity is less in children. And the other important finding, and we, we also observe, we don't get pneumonias, bacterial pneumonias nowadays. 
secondary bacterial infection following you know, covid diseases were lower therefore with influenza you get secondary bacterial infection with covid chance of secondary bacterial infection is very less and symptom duration is less compared to other viral infections these are quite interesting findings and we all know like uh, the radiological finding is a uh, ground glass opacity is located mainly in the lower lobe and uh, peripheral subpleural location uh, like adults they can also have children if you do a ct scan they will also have uh, the same kind of ground glass opacities but we don't do ct scan regularly for this patient and inflammatory markers are lower uh, in uh, covid pneumonia covid infection compared to other viral infections and um, yeah iap has uh, published you know recently in the april issue like um, guidelines for management of uh, covid 19 disease they classify covid 19 disease into mild moderate and severe within the severe category there is a category of critical disease what is mild any child presenting with just symptoms without any signs like fast breathing skies uh, now is a mild disease the patient had signs of pneumonia hypoxemia It's a severe. It's a moderate disease, and uh, if the patient had features of severe pneumonia or uh, you know general uh, danger signs like pathology, seizures, you know, somnolence or GI symptoms, um, it is severe disease. What is critical disease? Critical disease is organ failure, either ARDS or shock or multi-organ dysfunction or acute thrombosis. They are classified as severe disease. How it helps with the management for mild disease? We all know. uh what we generally do is uh, we talk about supportive care we talk to the parents about supportive care we need to isolate the child because we don't want the infection to spread therefore prevention of transmission is very very important third thing is we don't investigate them uh, you know to begin with we wait for 3 days usually 3 to 5 days they settle down but uh, during review if you find you know the child is continuing to have fever or if there is worsening you need to evaluate therefore it's not necessary to investigate at the beginning all these children therefore usually supportive care monitor for complication and prevent transmission by isolation and uh, these children are treated as opd but if there are risk factors uh, like immunocompromising condition that the child needs to be monitored you can admit this patient moderate disease you need to admit this patient in a covid ward and uh, moderate disease with hypoxemia there is a uh, indication which is mainly extrapolated from adults to give apart from oxygen dexamethasone 0.15 mg per kg 5 to 10 days this is uh, from adults and uh, you also consider if the patient has risk factors giving remdesivir and antimicrobials investigations basic investigation cbc crp and a chest x ray and um, renal function and lft and if it is a severe or critical disease you need to admit this child in a pacu setup and uh, you need to evaluate for organ function apart from whatever treatment oxygen respiratory support um, iv steroids consideration for remdesivir and antimicrobials here might give you know uh, 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 anoxaparin low molecular weight heparin and uh, if the patient has got organ failures we need to support that as well and the pneumonia can be fatal you know even community of acquired pneumonia can be fatal i vividly remember this patient this is an adopted child and uh, this child presented with uh, community acquired pneumonia severe pneumonia icu and uh, we treated but the patient didn't respond to our treatment uh, required ventilation there was failure of ventilation and child had pneumothorax and we eventually did ecmo for this patient and the child was in ecmo for 7 days child couldn't be revived it was a very sad story and uh, retrospectively thinking about this patient we always felt that this child should have received a pneumococcal vaccine which child didn't receive therefore um, prevention is very very important in pneumonia therefore uh, it's very very important to vac- uh, to vaccinate children for preventable diseases especially pneumococcal vaccine in countries where they have introduced pneumococcal vaccine they have found the you know mortality has reduced dramatically by more than 50% the number of infections also has reduced dramatically because the number of infections have reduced there was reduced usage of antibiotics and the reduced usage of antibiotics resulted in you know less emergence low uh, less emergence of resistant strains therefore vaccination is very very important other vaccines which are of relevance are hib vaccine pertussis vaccine measles vaccine and flu vaccine 
during this covid time is very very important whenever patient come for follow up we have to check the vaccination status and vaccinate and what we have learned from this covid 19 covid 19 has teach us very good lessons the, you know what we are doing to the nature and uh, this is the uh, comparison photo of uh, you know a uh, pre covid times um, in delhi you can see in the gate on the left side and during the lockdown you can see the air quality has substantially improved even when they measure the pm 2.5 uh, it, it has dropped uh, for more than four times the norm uh, four times the pre covid levels therefore we have to be gentle with the nature and they, you know if you are not gentle with the nature and the uh, uh, newton's third law will apply for uh, for every action there will be equal and opposite reaction practically we also see the number of uh, asthma exacerbations have come down dramatically we have not done a study but uh, this is something yeah. what we see practically as well and uh, second thing what we see is number of respiratory infection because of simple measures like uh, masking hand washing and social uh, distancing the number of infections have come down respiratory infections have come down dramatically this is australian study comparing previous years from 2017 Show a dramatic drop in empyemas as well as bronchiolitis. Therefore, the infections have come down. Therefore, if you are uh, gentle with nature, I think, um, and uh, we ourselves follow respiratory hygiene, uh, that's going to improve the respiratory health of our patients. Summarizing, while prescribing antibiotics, we have to exert caution. For viral URS, don't prescribe antibiotics. If it is a community acquired pneumonia in the outpatient practice, just prescribe amoxicillin. Macrolides are not, uh, you know. are not like macrolides and cephalosporins are not recommended if you identify severe pneumonia early referral can save lives and um, preventive strategies are very very important this cannot be done by individual therefore iap as an organization you know has to has to be an advocate for you know child health especially respiratory health and force for introduction of universal pcv immunization clean air clean water good nutrition to our kids thank you very much thank you sir stop uh, sharing your slides uh, dr nirinjalian sir has asked what are the poor prognosticators for the outcome amongst uh, community acquired pneumonia as on date in our city um poor outcome measures like uh, you know the um, uh, if the child uh, has a complicated pneumonia definitely the outcome is going to be poor and uh, some studies have looked at uh, you know biomarkers having very high crp looking at the mortality again uh, the prognosis you know is going to be poor um, and other if the child has underlying malnutrition again uh, the you know uh, it's again a prognostic factor so these are the things uh, of hand i know actually yeah Uh, and uh, dr vinod has asked the dose of inoxaprin in children where it is in the uh, where it is indicated in covid uh, i i need to check the dose offhand i don't know thank you actually uh, what are the indications for remdesivir in covid 19 pneumonia actually like um, uh, you know i don't have much experience using remdesivir i heard a talk from cms vellore they don't use it as well only in high risk situation if the child is having immunosuppression in the first week even replication if the child has got severe disease definitely moderate or severe disease you need to consider on a case to case basis like it's not a, you know indicated for all the patient we have to consider for a, a severe patient as well as moderate severe patient especially if they, are, they have additional risk factors on a case to case basis one more question sir is injection ampicillin widely available I think it's available. I think government hospitals, you uh, know, they are very ethical. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, yeah, and uh, we are not as ethical private setups. We use argument in most of the time, but uh, you people are very ethical. It's available. Yeah. So actually, rem. Somebody has asked about the rem. This way, we are not. Uh, we, see, last COVID first wave, we had ICU seeing thousand two hundred patients, including the home quarantine. and we did not require uh, remdesivir and all that so much in the second we were seeing most of them are asymptomatic and home quarantine we have used only for three so as his uh, sir says it's only a case to case basis so i think uh, we need not uh, really but as he says we have to be on the case to case because only this time we have had 
ground glass opacities and all more than the last wave. Last wave uh, virtually was very, very mild. But percentage wise, it is still the same. We have not seen really bad, except yeah. one newborn, which yeah. came with very severe COVID and died. Yeah. We, did, yeah. we, did, we don't have any difference. I think the only the, you know, Missy presence uh, in a very yes, sir. Not, uh, no See, that person. is totally yeah. a different entity yeah, totally also. Entity, yeah. I think then we'll go to the next speaker. I think uh, next speaker is Dr. Muttaya uh, Periya uh, Karpanan, who has a, he's a fellowship in, uh, he's a pediatrician with a fellowship in uh, pediatric critical care and works in St. Metha's Hospital as an advanced uh, pediatric critical care unit. His area of interest is now NIV, point of care, ultrasound, cardiac intensive care and fluid therapy. I think he will talk a lot about the A lines, B lines and slidings of ultrasound and uh, chest. Uh, over to Dr. Muttaya Periyakar. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Today I won't talk about uh, point of care ultrasound. But uh, yes, uh, I'm an odd man out. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm not a uh, pulmonologist among all the excellent speakers. Uh, I would give an uh, next 30 minutes or so. I, I know we are uh, running short of time, 45 minutes late. But uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes or so, I will be uh, giving an intensive care perspective of uh, uh, asthma management. What kind of medicine works, when to use uh, those drugs, and when to escalate uh, respiratory support. And I'll be dwelling a little bit into pathophysiology and uh, concepts of post pressure ventilation because uh, keeping in mind our uh, postgraduates who are listening because I know it is difficult to understand them by reading it uh, once from book. So I'll just start with some uh, case uh, masqueraders or mimics of uh, wheezers in uh, children which has already been uh, uh, spoken in the first session also by uh, Seva Balancer. The first case is a two-year-old male, cough for one day, no fever, Past breathing since last four hours has no significant past history. There is tachycardia, tachypnea, uh, disproportional uh, tachypnea and agitation, but still the child is um, having a normal sensorium, normal saturation, and there is uh, auscultation, there is V's on the right side with decreased air entry on the left side. And this is the X-ray. You can see classically there is a unilateral hyperinflation uh, in the uh, referring hospital. And when it comes to our hospital, it becomes more obvious with a mediastinal shift. So here uh, we are expecting a foreign body, which was removed. Uh, again, uh, again, another case, a six-year-old male with a fever and cough for five days had fast, like, fast breathing and decreased activity for one day. There is tachycardia, tachypnea, there is minimal work of breathing, and there is bilateral scattered Vs here again with a normal saturation. Nebulizations were or ordered as the ER was busy and just X-ray was ordered, but it took two hours. And the child didn't respond to nebulizations. That, that's when uh, VPG was done, which showed metabolic acidosis. And this is the X-ray, where we can clearly see a cardiomegaly. And uh, what was missed here was, uh, you know, since the ER was busy, the resident didn't check for the pulses because a six-year-old, you know, uh, kind of looking okay, but a little dull. But the pulses were weak. There were muffled heart sounds. And in history, there was decreased urine output and there was a large liver span, which was missed. So actually kind of two hours was missed in managing this myocarditis, probably a viral myocarditis child, uh, which was later shifted to a PICU and ventilated. So this is a, another four month old infant presenting with fever and cough since three days, had fast breathing, decreased feeding since three days, extreme tachycardia, tachypnea, significant work of breathing with uh, hypoxia. Chest also had bilateral V's. So this is the chest X-ray picture. Obviously we have a, uh, you know, bilateral, you can say, you know, uh, mediastinal widening and lymphadenopathy probably here with uh, dirty infiltrates everywhere. So this turned out to be a, a lymphadenopathy, extrinsic lymphadenopathy compressing the airways. You can see both the trachea as well as the, uh, both the left and may, uh, right main bronchus compressed by the external lymph node. This turned out to be a TV. Again, we have to be careful. This is a four month old infant where uh, we think it is bronchiolitis but you know, uh, sometimes it can be a totally different entity. Here it was a TB. It was a kind of like from the mother who was an open contact. Coming to another case, a three-year-old male having fever, cough again for three days, difficulty in breathing for six hours. Here, heart rate was 170. Again, a technique with decreased air entry with hypoxia. The child was unable to lie on bed with mother 
paradoxical breathing pattern was seen the child was extremely having you know agitation with moving all the four limbs bad anger child identifies mother but cannot unable to speak and there was no similar illness or significant past history so here you can see bilateral hyperventilation just by looking at the history we think it could be probably a pneumonia because you know there is hypoxia there is fever and cough there is uh, acute onset of breathlessness and decreased air entry but actually here this is actually a viral uh, like virus viral infection induced wheeze with decreased air entry so sometimes we tend to miss this decreased air entry this is actually kind of they they the management goes hand in hand with asthma management actually but we think it is pneumonia and we a kind of you know delay nebulization sometimes so this again is important where we see decreased air entry we uh, kind of miss the wheeze component because it's a, it's a kind of a silent chest you know where giving nebulization may also be difficult so in all these cases the first treatment received by the uh, all the four cases was nebulization with uh, acetylin with oxygen which may be right which may not be right so all wheezes need not be bronchiolitis or asthma we need to rule out the asthma mimics any sick child remember any sick child hyperventilating may have a wheeze any child tachypneic may have wheeze like even we have seen dka children with tachypnea having wheeze and being treated with nebulizations obviously entities which can present with wheeze at er first wheeze at er can be like asthma viral triggered wheeze pneumonia foreign body aspiration congestive cardiac failure or myocarditis uh, and others being upper airway and lower airway obstruction caused by other causes like fixed obstruction in case of vocal cord dysfunction airway hemangiomas and enlarged lymph nodes and dynamic obstruction in cases of uh, laryngotracheal bronchomalacia or vascular sling anomalies so coming back to the case Uh, which we are going to discuss in detail a 8 year old female a known case of asthma with prior history of poor compliance to therapy uh, recurrent ho- hospitalizations with pic admissions uh, in the past came to er with another exacerbation with tachycardia tachypnea and increased work of breathing there is bilateral decreased air entry and saturation is only 90% and in room air and she is able to speak only few words and the, but the sensorium is normal and blood gas done was normal peak expiratory flow was 50% the personal best and she is not responding to initial back to back nebulizations and iv steroids what next so we all know the components in asthma being uh, you know airway hyper responsiveness bronchospasm and chronic inflammation leading on to airway remodeling so stridus asthmaticus is a common emergency in children which uh, where there is progress of worsening bronchospasm and respiratory dysfunction unresponsive to the first line therapy and which may progress to respiratory failure why is it very important because timely treatment can prevent lot of complications which we don't want and this is the uh, simple picture telling you what kind of changes is seen in the airway there is enlargement of submucosa and there is ex- in- excess of infil- inflammatory infiltrates and mucosal uh, you know excess of mucus causing mucus plugging and remember asthma is an heterogeneous disease this is a very important concept to understand uh, there can be environmental trigger in a genetically predisposed individual but it is a heterogeneous disease all the airways are not equally affected and uh, there can be mucus plugging there can be bronchospasm there can be inflammation different causes of airway obstruction which may respond to different therapy uh, and early bronchospasm responds to uh, you know short acting beta agonist and late bronchospasm will respond only to anti inflammatory drugs like steroids coming to this uh, concept of dynamic hyperinflation i won't again bore you with this uh, you know picture which no uh, which is difficult to understand what i'm trying to say is with every like you know with time there is more air trapping that is air enters it is like a ball wall mechanism air enters into the lungs to a narrow airway air enters into the alveoli but it is being trapped and doesn't come out during expiration because expiration normally there is you know uh, the intrapleural pressure swing in that way so that it becomes a little positive so initially in wheezing the expiratory uh, portion of uh, respiration becomes compromised and that is where you have airway narrowing and that's where you have airway trap air trapping so there is uh, you can see the lung volume keeps on increasing and above a certain level the frc itself shifts above so the, uh, the you know the kind of lung kind of collapses after that kind of chokes after that the lungs are compliant but the volumes in the lungs is very high 
the base the basic volume so the frc is increased thereby pushing the lungs to the its closing pressures so too much of concept very difficult to understand right that's why i've gone to a, gone for a simple analogy like balloon imagine a balloon which is being obstructed partially don't think because if it is partially obstructed the balloon will deflate but think of it think of it as an obstructed airway when it is partially obstructed to keep seeing the airway getting filled alveol is getting filled but not able to empty about a certain limit it's going to just blow out right this is what is called as dynamic hyperinflation so either it blows out or you release the obstruction over here and release the uh, balloon that's what we want to do by our therapy and another important thing is this longer time constant you can imagine the speaker traffic in chennai city where you have different vehicles with different uh, you know uh, time constants that's why i have put cars you know two wheelers auto rickshaws buses and everything so that you have all of them going through the same you know uh, narrowed airway or exit and everyone are rushing so it becomes difficult right this is the problem there is shorter expiratory time for the airways to empty that's why we need to prolong these uh, you know expiratory times so that uh, they can pass out easily this is what is the basic concept concept of time constant they they always say time constant no one understand they always say compliance and resistance but actually this is what is it in asthma time constants are longer because of obstruction and we need to uh, dilate the airway and relieve the obstruction so that air goes in and comes out smoothly and in er now coming back to business in er we do rapid assessment like uh, the you know pediatric assessment triangle and the pentagon uh, basically to do a quick respiratory and hemodynamic um, analysis of the child Physi to categorize the patient physiologically and to uh, to decide what kind of treatment the patient requires and where to shift and all history at at er what relevant history quick history of to take is time of onset potential triggers which could have been there and severity of symptoms in the previous exacerbation if there was a known if it is known asthmatic like our case and response to treatment at home or emergency uh, prior to coming to hospital and in physical examination we need to look at the pulse oximetry air entry the characteristic of the wheeze is it inspiratory or both inspiratory or expiratory the level of alertness of the child usually they are hyper alert they are little agitated they are hyper alert if they are dull and drowsy it's omnius the hydration status the work of breathing and to also identify complications because sometimes the child can just land up with a air leak to the er with a pneumothorax or a pneumomeristinum so what are the risk factors or red flags at er when there is a past history of icu admission for asthma when there is a rapid deterioration in the condition in the past with mechanical ventilation preterm micu graduates who had prolonged nicu stay with ox prolonged oxygen exposure chronic lung disease psychosocial ethnic factors and poor you know parental education or poor compliance to treatment there are genetic factors obese children are at higher risk older age at presentation of higher risk and pulses paradoxes also poses a higher risk so at er we categorize them into a uh, critical emergent urgent less urgent as far as treatment is concerned based on the severity of symptoms so wheezing uh, i'll just go through it fast there can be severe tachypnea or bradypnea severe uh, retractions with grunting and drowsy drowsy or lethargic sensorium means it is critical and auscultation you have decreased breath sounds hypoxia and pef low pef and the child is unable to speak or able to speak only few words and as it becomes you know uh, like if the child is having fewer retractions fewer like lesser work of breathing normal saturation uh, but history of you know severe uh, like ex episodes in the past that also needs urgent uh, management and as the child is able to uh, speak sentences uh, when the work of breathing is less it becomes little uh, you know a mild to moderate kind of exacerbation and remember always a severe exacerbating exacerbation child will be preferring to sit in a upright position and there will be difficulty or refusal to feed feeds in a smaller child child and uh, also remember spo2 uh, paco2 or etco2 doesn't grade the severity again we need to use some severity score to severe uh, to grade them so basically they use the work of breathing basically this suprastinal and uh, the suprastinal and the scalene muscle the neck muscle usage is considered severe air entry decreased air entry and uh, is again bad these which is both inspiratory and expiratory is bad 
low saturation is again bad again some scores don't this is the pram which is validated in children uh, which i put it here but there are other scores which include consciousness level and inspiratory to expiratory ratio like when the expiration is prolonged visibly you can see that that also poses a higher risk and was calls for a severe scoring at er what do you do so you have a like severely ill child like our case when there is a silent chest it's an ominous sign when there is altered mental status it is an ominous sign look for asymmetry because don't miss out on uh, the you know foreign body scenario or there can be asymmetric bees even when there is a local atelectasis or when there is air leak it's important to identify two clinical subsets one which is having a history of severe past episodes which is poorly controlled asthma where it's called a slow onset and where anti inflammatory steroids work another subset is a child with mild symptoms in the past or coming with first time bees this is fast onset this is these these children respond better to beta agonists first the importance is these fast onset kids they don't give you long time they just deteriorate very fast so you need to start treatment on them very early at a early time okay so based on the severity you're going to start the treatment mild just requires a mdi puff or a nebulization alone and we prefer puffs because of uh, less aeros aerosols because of the covid thing going on in moderate scenarios better to start nebulizations intermittent or continuous with oxygen and oral or iv corticosteroids need to be given in severe cases continuous nebulizations of with salbutamol is preferred with oxygen and intermittent uh, nebulization with ipratropium three at least three times in the first hour and the advantage of ipratropium is it uh, is a different mechanism and it it is uh, supposed to reduce the the study say it reduces the length of stay and it reduces uh, the um, you know it it and another advantage is it preserves preserves the mucociliary uh, clearance so it is good in that way and in severe cases we prefer iv corticosteroids and also in the first hour we prefer to give a start dose of iv magnesium sulfate and also uh, inform the uh, availability of a psu bit so why do we nebulize with oxygen this is a common question so when you don't nebulize with when normally what happens when there is hypoxic uh, hypoxia in the obstructed airway the blood kind of diverts to the well ventilated zones this is the normal compensation to maintain the vq uh, like mismatch which is happens with asthma when you nebulize with salbutamol alone what happens is these uh, instead of opening the airways first the salbutamol dilates the blood vessels in those constricted zones so there is stealing of blood from better uh, ventilated zones with better vq uh, you know like better vq ventilation perfusion matching so this kind of you know uh, cause, uh, like causes a transient hypoxia because of the stealing of this blood from well ventilated zones to these uh, poorly ventilated zones but with time it kind of the cardiac output improves and the bronch like vasodilation like bronchodilation also ensues but that's why it's important to uh, start oxygen with salbutamol in severe cases to prevent this hypoxia so this uh, said well that said uh, in puffs uh, mdi puffs how to use based on the weight it's 4 6 8 for the first 10 kg it is 4 puffs for 10 to 20 kg it is 6 puffs and about 20 kg it is 8 puffs and also for severe cases you need to start steroids and along with ipratropium nebulizations and sometimes subcutaneous adrenaline or terbutaline rescue may be important at 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 times when there is a child in chest with uh, life threatening hypoxia and remember in severe cases we give continuous nebulizations Uh, up to 0.5 mg per kg per hour to a maximum of 20 mg per hour of salbutamol what is important is repeated assessment to uh, and score trends uh, we start the treatment and we cannot move uh, away because in a severe case repeated assessment of respiratory uh, score the consciousness level basically the heart rate respiratory spo2 will tell many things heart rate settling respiratory rate coming down saturation improving and child being more comfortable able to speak better becoming less breathless is a positive sign and at the end of 4 hours we need to decide what has to be done so this slide is just for telling you the doses in various scenarios like uh, based on the weight and what we have to uh, importantly know is with uh, like nebulizations 
we tend to give lesser uh, dose of salbutamol or ipratropium thereby reducing the uh, overall side effects one thing uh, what is uh, problematic in severe asthmatic is the delivery of the nebulization because many time we think we are nebulizing but it is not reaching the uh, place where it has to work but still that said nebulizations uh, with nebulization we can achieve the response with a lesser dose then with a puff or with a uh, oral substitute so whenever there is non responsiveness think of poor nib delivery we need to use a proper mdi with spacer if you are using uh, like with with spacer but the problem is again cooperation of the child is needed in a severe episode it may be difficult again proper uh, dose with proper carrier solution 3 to 5 ml of saline is preferred with minimal interruptions proper technique the vertical position of the neck chamber is missed sometimes with uh, which is seen as good fume generation which is important uh, for you know effective nebulization the uh, and all phase nebulize with oxygen 6 to 8 liters as told before and also the nebulization should finish within 10 to 15 minutes which is a sign of good uh, nebulization uh, technique steroids any anything can be used but know the uh, maximum dosage Uh, which can be used and the frequency like hydrocortisone is a short acting prednisolone and methylprednisolone is intermediate and dexamethasone is long acting and the maximum dose usage has been uh, put here in this slide the other drugs magnesium sulfate uh, another important drug which we use intermittent high dosing is preferred rather than a continuous infusion this is what is latest evidence tells intermittent high dose Like that is 0.1 mL per kg, which is 50 mg per kg or 50 percent max self to a maximum of two gram, or uh, like can be used, which is one one mL is 500 mg. So you can maximum use four mL of max self, even if the if the child is 60 kg. Terbutalin again a rescue drug can be given subcutaneously or IV. IV is preferred. 10 mics per kg uh, is the loading dose. We don't usually load the children. we start with an infusion of 0.4 mg to uh, per kg per minute and we go up to 3 mg per kg per minute it's uh, it's not available everywhere and in ventilated children or rescue type drugs are ketamine and aminophilin and again ketamine can be uh, given like to a dose up to 1 mg per kg per hour and aminophilin is loaded with 5 mg per kg and followed by an infusion remember aminophilin should not be given beyond 24 hours and infants require a lesser dose because of the uh you know the therapeutic level may exceed in them because of the pharmacokinetics so as i told you when there is good treatment response with a mild exacerbation you just have to observe them for 4 to 6 hours if there is no further worsening you can just discharge them on, on uh, oral bronchodilators or mdis and steroids for short short course probably 3 to 5 days but if there is poor response when there is significant work of breathing despite nebulization proper nebulization when there is worsening uh, clinical status when the pfr is not improving when there is hypoxia we need to escalate care to a setting like hdu or pacu so next 5 minutes or so i'll be spending on you know the ventilation thing where we use lot of niv nowadays which is preferred and niv trial is always warranted before invasive mechanical ventilation because we don't want to ventilate any asthma and at least in the last 2 uh, or 3 years i have not seen even a single ventilated uh, asthma child the because of the benefits of nav there is decreased need for intubation there is improved gas exchange and alveolar ventilation there is it relieves the dyspnea of the child and decreases work of breathing and decreases length thereby it decreases length of stay because we are avoiding invasive ventilation and the commonest nav which we use is hhfnc heated humidified high flow nasal cannula it has a comfortable interface many of you might be using it it works by reducing the anatomical dead space by flushing the nasopharyngeal cavity with fresh gas flow meeting the inspiratory demand of the child and it also kind of stems the upper airway and reduces the work of breathing and also importantly the nebulization can be delivered better with hfnc and the dose is like we say you know 2 liters per kg for the first 10 kg followed by 0.5 liter per kg to a maximum of 40 liters in children and sometimes 50 liters in obese children can also be used and fio2 is usually titrated to achieve a saturation above 94 we usually start with 50 to 60% fio2 and we use these vibrating mesh nebulizers nebulizers these days because it kind of maintains the laminar flow uh, and it maintains the fio2 and temperature with better entrainment of the nebulized cases with good delivery to the 
place where it has to work these are the uh, you know new uh, techniques and these uh, are connected to the wet side of the humidifier that is post humidification we connect them before it it, uh, it reaches the circuit that's where we connect the nebulization chamber so again yeah so again uh, we are having some settings i am not going to discuss in detail just uh, the mode on nav sometimes we use escalate hfnc to nav where we can use bipap or standalone nav ventilators we prefer to use st mode in bipap or tsv mode in uh, nav we may we need to make sure we are using a proper interface proper mask that is important without leak and i'm not going to go into settings if i was again to be maintaining the saturation above 92 make sure the peak pressure don't go above 20 cm of water we usually start with say 10 by 5 or 12 by 5 again we need to be cautious when you are putting a patient on nav because the margin of safety is less and if the patient is worsening we need to go for invasive ventilation we avoid invasive ventilation as much as possible but i tell you nav is an alternate but not a substitute for ventilation and that said endotracheal tube putting a tube into the airway is not going to solve the problem right because the airway is narrowed down distally but we are going to put the tube only up to the uh, trachea maybe upper trachea or mid trachea so the endotracheal tube itself can ex 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 exacerbate your asthma that is the problem that's why we don't ventilate right and but sometimes you know we need to vent like we need we end up ventilating them and uh, and again decision on ventilation is purely mostly clinical rather than uh, you know lab values the indication being imminent cardiorespiratory failure refractory hypoxemia deteriorating sen sensorium or the child going in for respiratory fatigue or coming with respiratory fatigue significant respiratory acidosis not responding to other drugs and nav so how to go about that that's a very uh, dangerous like situation which we do which is a nightmare kind of thing when you are intubating an asthmatic because we have to prepare extensively there can be a, it's a high risk intubation we need an expert to intubate and it's usually done when we have exhausted all the other things the equipment like we need to use a larger et tube probably a cuff et tube and uh, reduce the dead space as much as possible in the circuitry drugs we prefer prefer to use midazolam ketamine a uh, propofol for induction and we always use paralytic we always use paralytic probably a short acting one procuronium or vecuronium and when we intubate we need to have extensive tools to monitor like etco2 and we need to have a good venous access and bp monitoring why because a patient can immediately land up in issues like uh, you know like respiratory worsening respiratory acidosis pneumothorax or hemodynamic instability the principles again i'm going to just summarize in a slide the mode commonly we use is simv volume control or pressure control with pressure support which is the most commonly used mode there is no preferred mode other modes which can be used are prvc psv settings we i will just highlight we need to use a lower respiratory rate for age the lowest like possible rate to allow you know the longer e time that's the uh, rational behind that tidal volume of 6 to 8 ml per kg and maintain the p plateau pressures below 30 and prolonging the ie ratio setting peep that is a you know that is itself is an art i'll tell you in the next slide how to set a peep in a, a, a asthmatic volume control has like uh, advantage of constant flow so that we can keep the i time short but any anything we can any mode we can use neuromuscular blockade remember we should use only in the early phase to uh, you know avoid the air hunger compromising on the ventilation later on we should not use them in volume modes we need to monitor the pressures that is the peak pressure and the uh like difference between the peak pressure and the plateau pressure that is important when you do an expiratory hold we can find the difference and uh, try to limit that and as it is getting better as the asthma is getting the episode is getting better the the difference kind of reduces and in pressure mode we monitor the tidal volume usually the tidal volume keeps improving as the uh, asthmatic episode is improving as far as sedation is concerned we use midazolam or dexmedetomidine infusion analgesia we use spentanil or ketamine infusion we avoid morphine because it it can worsen histamine release and bronchospasm monitor we have to monitor complications obviously it is a high risk scenario as i told you we can it, there can be worsening respiratory acidosis air leak and the patient can go for a secondary ards for a mixed lung disease and there can be hemodynamic instability also because of the peep which we give so a slide on this uh, i know it is beyond the scope of this lecture but still 
what happens is uh, uh, coming back to the first slide which i discussed about the balloon analogy we give more air into the balloon what's going to happen it's going to blow out similarly when when i'm going to give a pressure it's going to blow out right but the reverse thing happens in a severe case we don't obviously give p for all asthmatics this is reserved for severe spec, uh, like subset of patients in them when you use the peep when you use the positive pressure it instead of inflating more instead of worsening the hyperinflation it kind of when you obviously use optimal correct peep it is going to offset your work of breathing it's going to paradoxically deflate the lungs uh, and improve the you know uh, situation how it does how sorry how does it going to help for example we have a auto peep that this is this is called, the concept is like you have heard of auto peep there is a high intrinsic positive pressure in the alveoli like here like we have a intrinsic pressure of 15 and the outside pleural pressure is say 10 till the pressure difference is maintained the airway is open like you know the patient has to maintain somehow this positive pressure and uh, the the outside pressure has to be like trans pulmonary pressure we call 15 minus 10 so as far as it is positive the airway will be open at a point where uh, in during expiration you can see this pressure kind of reduces and becomes 10 equalizes the outside pressure this point is called as a choking point and the lung airway kind of collapses there and there is no more air flow further so by giving an external peep we are going to you know equalize this or you know kind of increases increase the trans pressure so we are going to make it positive above the pleural pressure so that the airway opens and air flow happens so you can see here also when there is no peep the pressure difference is high and the patient cannot overcome it but when you give a counter peep when you give a counter peep the airway opens further uh, the airway analogy like the, when the patients how why the patients can't expire this is explained by the waterfall analogy like where there is the similarly there is upstream and a downstream segment like imagine a waterfall which is not able to fall down there is lot of water over here which is not able to reach uh, which is not able to come down the same thing is happening because of this choking point or uh, called as a critical opening pressure what we do by up applying applying an external peep we kind of you know equalize this or kind of you know reduce the pressure gradient you know thereby when you reduce the pressure gradient the resistance comes down and the flow kind of improves so we can see when we apply an external peep which is equal into the auto peep there is flow of water as well as gas and when but any any peep higher than that is useless like when the extrinsic auto peep is only 10 we have to give anywhere around 10 like we said kind of keep two thirds of the auto peep that is the uh, you know usual teaching like we try to keep seven here but here if you go beyond that the peep is useless and it's going to cause harm affecting your hemodynamics so this is the concept behind that again here it helps not only in expiration but also in inspiration here we can see with no a problem in the airway the negative pressure is only required is only one to start inspiration but here with intrinsic peep only like say there is auto peep of 10 you need to give a effort of minus 11 negative pressure of minus 11 to suck the air in otherwise the air flow may not happen in inspiration also when you give an external peep to this patient say 8 the patient only has to provide like uh, overcome it by a negative pressure of only say 3 so you can see the pressure gradient being reduced in the presence of an obstruction when we provide an extrinsic peep so it not only in allows act like uh, expiration but also offsets the inspiratory work load so this is an important concept i think you would have understood with this uh, analogy and this uh, you know the difference the pressure difference i or i all i just want you to understand that the pressure difference should always be positive for the airway to remain open the trans pressure and by giving an external pressure we are going to reduce the inspiratory negative workload the patient has to take a very deep inspiration right uh, that itself will compromise your expiration by reducing your time constant expiratory time constant so these are complex concepts again always remember it's not only the airway it is enclosed by the pleura with a positive pressure 
So here again, when they are providing the external PEEP, the inspiratory workload has come down. Here without PEEP, the patient has to generate a minus nine. Here the patient can only generate the, uh, can initiate inspiration with only minus three pressure. So this is the advantage of providing PEEP. That said, all the drugs have side effects and we need to monitor them. With beta agonist, the commonest side effect is tachycardia, hypokalemia may happen, hyperglycemia may happen, and they may have tremors. And lactic acidosis is another problem, especially, and it can be even seen with inhalational route. People think it only happens with IV route. With IV beta agonist like turbutylene, we need to be careful about arrhythmia, hypotension, especially diastolic and myocardial ischemia. So that itself may warrant inotropic support. Steroids, again, like dexamethasone causes hyperglycemia, hypertension, and secondary infection risk. With magnesium, we need to monitor reflexes. It itself can cause muscle weakness and hypotension. So that's why we target a magnesium level between three to four, and we don't cross four. Aminophilin can cause, again, we rarely use nowadays. It can cause neurotoxicity like seizures, polyuria, and we need to monitor levels whenever available. Again, some treatments like ketamine, very rarely used, can increase secretions and can cause airway obstruction. Aminophilin is only used as rescue in impending respiratory failure. Therapies like inhaled corticosteroids, nebulized Maxilf, nebulized uh, Formitrol or Salmitrol, nebulized uh, Diatropium or oral uh, Montelukast or Zapirlukast, oral liquidated antagonist, immunotherapy, biologicals don't work in status asthmaticus, don't work in acute phase, but they may be useful for preventing exacerbations. Other therapies which may be used is antibiotics if there is suspicion of atypical pneumonia like azithromycin, mucolytics, plus minus, chest physiotherapy helps when the child is slightly better, manual compression is not used anymore, bronchoscopy, especially when you have secondary mucus plugging and persistent collapse. How to prevent exacerbation? Always all said, all asthma done, status we have to prevent that from happening by educating the parents and proper training to the child as well as parent, ensuring good compliance of the preventive therapy, avoiding the triggers, all the triggers told by in the first lecture, controlling GERD, controlling uh, and weight reduction is important in obese. Nowadays, we are seeing a lot of obese children, especially after the lockdown and all, we have seen all of them gaining weight like five to 10 kg in a, in a, in a year. Treating vitamin D deficiency is also helpful and monitor them with peak expiratory flows. Phenos not available at every place. Uh, again, a very good tool to monitor you know, inflammation. Lung function test, asthma diary, use GINA guidelines. Nowadays, they are telling to add formitrol to uh, inhaled corticosteroids in children above five years. That offers a better co uh, control. And also, they advocate adding Montelukast for intermittent symptoms and exercise induced uh, Vs. Early MDI relievers at home will also help for an acute episode, but never ever give only Saba. Like that is a common mistake. Uh, as practitioners, we give only uh, salbutamol to patients. That it doesn't work. We need to give a controller therapy like inhaled corticosteroids. And always take help of the pulmonologist and they will be referring, uh, like they'll be doing a better uh, management than us. Uh, like general pediatricians probably when in, in, uh, in severe cases. And asthma, this has already been covered, COVID-19 and asthma. We uh, just have to know only one thing. In well-controlled asthma, there is no increased risk of severe, severe disease. In poorly controlled disease and children who have recently taken oral corticosteroids, there is a slightly, not, not children, they've just told people who have taken recently oral corticosteroids, there is a higher risk of severity uh, because their asthma is poorly controlled. But asthma alone doesn't predispose them for a severe disease. We need to avoid spirometry in suspects and cases just to prevent spread. And vaccines like influenza vaccines can be given with a minimum gap of two weeks for uh, a COVID vaccine if, in case it comes for children. And always we need to continue the inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, and in case of such severe therapy, we need to even start oral corticosteroids that, like, that can be used. And recently, we, have, we, have, we are also seeing a lot of children coming with Vs as well as COVID-19 positive status. So we need to be careful in giving them aerosols like nebulizations, and we need to isolate them early and uh, you know try to triage them to prevent further spread. And our IC in inhaled corticosteroids protective in COVID-19, that is also debatable in adults uh, who have taken inhaled corticosteroids, the mortality is slightly uh, reduced. That's what is being uh, told in studies. And always prevent asthma attacks having a written asthma plan and avoid nebulizers and other aerosol genetic procedures as much as possible. So coming to the conclusion, we need to rule out asthma mimics early. Early, aggressive, stepwise, time-sensitive protocol is important 
to prevent uh, to prevent worsening patient phenotype has to be identified and try and use what works because every patient doesn't respond to all the drugs one patient responds to one better so we need to try and see what works and use them timely respiratory support and break the cycle monitor complications so we early and uh, follow uh, give a discharge plan always remember continuous beta agonist with nebulization with oxygen with uh, early steroids prevent further worsening ipratropium helps uh, provides a lot of help in er setting chest x ray blood gas has no role it only helps in ruling out alter alternate diagnosis catch non responders early and escalate support uh, and avoid invasive ventilation as much as possible early nav has a role thank you thank you for taking more time i think i have taken 10 minutes extra i'd be happy to answer questions if there are any Just, thank you, Dr. Muttiya. It was an excellent talk on management of acute severe asthma, uh, and I think uh, we we don't have much questions uh, in this session. Uh, what they have asked is when you said continue corticosteroid, did you mean the oral or injection? Anything, ma'am. Actually, in a mild to moderate case, uh, we can they say say we can oral and IV is the same. They they have the same efficacy. In a in a acute severe asthma setting, yeah. but to prevent uh, uh, exacerbation, that is different. There, inhaled is preferred. Like uh, otherwise, as a controller therapy, I'm not sure. The next question is: What the continuous nebulizing with beta two agonist? What is the risk of hypokalemia? What? Uh, how often do you monitor the child with serum potassium? Because generally, we may yes. not. So that's yeah. Question. Generally, ma'am, uh, what we have seen is when we exceed Q four H, like four thyroid nebulization. we at least make sure we do potassium once in a because many of these children are kept np also they are getting only id fluids with or without potassium supplementation so many a time when we exceed the this q4h that is when they are requiring uh, hourly or second hourly or even continuous nebula continuous nebulization we don't give more than 2 hours maybe but when we exceed this more than uh, q4h frequency we uh, end up doing potassium at least once because that uh, also it can contribute to muscle weakness and other problems In an NPO child. Okay, uh, Dr. Ashwin has asked: In mild and moderate exacerbation, we recommend repeated dose of uh, MDI with Saba. Will this not cause hypoxia as per the paradoxical pulmonary vasodilatation theory? And that uh, so actually, ma'am, that is more important. Like that whole that theory is only for severe cases. Uh, where there is uh, severe, like when there is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and there are more uh, obstructed airways than open airways. Asthma is a heterogeneous disease. Some airways are open, some are obstructed, some are totally blocked. But in cases where there is lot of obstructed airway, which is supposed to be a severe case, then only we see that VQ mismatch uh, contributing to hypoxia when we start, um, you know, uh, only Saba, only uh, continuous beta beta two beta two agonist. But in other cases like mild to moderate, we kind of escape even if we nebulize without oxygen, because there the risk of VQ mismatch is less because the number of obstructed airway is lesser. Then the open airway. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mutia. Now uh, let's uh, go to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Gauri Shankar. Uh, I think uh, everyone knows him well, and uh, he was a colleague in ICH, and I he left uh, pulmonology when I uh, entered, and uh, he's an excellent uh, excellent pediatrician, pulmonologist, and a bronchoscopist. He heads is now the head pediatrics of clinical. Operation and quality. He has got twenty-seven years of uh, experience, and his uh, uh, interest is pediatric pulmonology and bronchoscopy, asthma, and TB. He is an editor of IJPP Active Pediatrician Award, the one in two thousand thirteen. He is uh, the author of Know Your X-rays, the IJPP series two, and he has co-authored the Essentials of Pediatric Pulmonology. And he is the associate editor of uh, uh, eight pediatric textbooks, and he has contributed to fifteen pediatric textbooks. He has done a lot of academic work, and he has got eighteen publications to his credit. So over to Dr. Gauri Shankar. We are waiting to listen to you. Thank you. Am I audible, madam? Uh, audible. Yeah. Please proceed. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm I'm sitting between you and your dinner. I'll try to finish as quick as possible because when you know foreign body aspiration, that means you need to remove it to make the child better. That's online. 
uh, uh, like gist of what I'm going to talk. My humble greetings to all my teachers for helping me to come to this level. Spine body aspiration, it's a common pediatric respiratory emergency which can be life-threatening. Most of the time history is not forthcoming. So you have a wide variation in the presentation. The common age group affected is the first four years of life between one to three years is the most common. If you miss the diagnosis or if there is a diagnosis of foreign body aspiration, it can lead to serious complications. If the child presents within 24 hours of foreign body aspiration, we term this as an acute foreign body aspiration. Any presentation beyond 24 hours, we term it as a delayed presentation. The aspirated foreign bodies can be organic or inorganic. Why do you need to know about this? I'll tell you in a short while. Organic means nuts, seeds, bone pieces. Whereas inorganic means you have beads, coins, pins, small parts of plastic toys, school equipments, including the uh, uh, pen cap. Like um, These are all the common inorganic. Organic is the most common. And peanuts, you know, is the ubiquitous among the foreign bodies. There is minimal reaction to metallic foreign bodies or plastic foreign bodies. But in organic, you have more issues. That means substances which are lipophilic due to its fatty acid content. There is intense airway inflammation and granuloma tissue formation around the foreign body. Also, the organic foreign body has the ability to absorb water by its inherent nature. So because of this, it can swell and it can modify a partial obstruction to a near total obstruction over a period of time. I told you the common age is between one to three years. Commonly, this is due to lack of molar teeth, decreased ability to masticate, chew the food. Always they have a tendency to put anything and everything into the mouth. Not only that, they are more active. They talk, they run, they chew while chewing and they do all sorts of physical activity. Also, they have a higher respiratory rate. So any object which they keep in the mouth, there is more chance for aspiration. The symptoms, the penetration syndrome, we have a triad. That means a sudden onset of choking intractable cough and vomiting. This is the penetration syndrome or the triad of symptoms. It can lead to asphyxia very rarely to cardiorespiratory arrest, but most often it is choking, coughing, sudden onset of acute dyspnea in a well child or sudden onset of wheezing. So these are the common symptoms. Suppose if the foreign body has been missed, it can lead to persistent cough, recurrent fever, pneumonia, hemoptysis, even failure to thrive. Undiagnosed and retained foreign body have more chances for early as well as late complication, including atelectasis as well as bronchiectasis. The final site of the location of foreign body either in the larynx or tracheobronchial tree, it depends on the size of the foreign body and the consistency of the foreign body. Anything which is there in the larynx and trachea is potentially life-threatening because it's going to cause central obstruction. The features of these are, if it is going to be a partial laryngeal obstruction, hoarseness, aphonia, wheezing, and dyspnea. Whereas if it is going to be more distal, that means in the bronchi, there is going to be unilateral wheeze or decreased breath sounds. And I told you retained foreign body, you can have like cough, recurrent fever, pneumonia, and hemoptysis. Very rarely foreign body aspiration can be asymptomatic, especially when does it happen? Only if the aspirated foreign body has got a lumen in it, something like a, a ball pen cap, it allows air flow during both phases of respiration. So many a times it may be even asymptomatic except for occasional cough. 
clinical exam, most of the time they will have respiratory distress with or without, with or without tachypnea. It's going to be a central foreign body hypoxemia and subcutaneous emphysema is very rare. If there is going to be a subglottic foreign body, hoarse voice and strider can be seen. If it is going to be a central foreign body, a biphasic strider or a wheeze will be heard. If the foreign body is localized to one side, it can be localized wheeze or decreased breath sounds. Complications, we know severe airway obstruction and death in young children because of the small caliber of the airway. This is the life-threatening one. It can even cause death instantly too. But the late complication is bronchiectasis. And if the retained foreign body is an organic, because of its ability to induce extensive local inflammation and form granuloma, it can lead to airway obstruction, add on to the airway obstruction, bronchoscopic identification and removal becomes more difficult. Sometimes they bleed profusely too. Diagnosis often not diagnosed immediately because they don't have specific clinical manifestations, but your history, suggestive history of choking. This is the classic clinical presentation with cough, wheeze, and diminished airflow. This indicates most likely this child had had a foreign body aspiration. Differential diagnosis, it can be acute severe asthma. In group, there is strider more than the wheeze. A very dangerous condition by plastic bronchitis. It is diagnosed only after a bronchoscopy. This can mimic a foreign body aspiration. Though vascular not audible, no. trachea, H-type tracheoesophageal fistula, mediastinal tumors, they also present like this, but they are uh, going to have subacute symptoms or slowly progressive symptoms. Whereas your foreign body aspiration, most of the time, dramatic presentation. Investigation, everyone knows that everyone has to have a plain X-ray chest. This is the initial imaging modality. The classical abnormality is going to be a localized hyperinflation. We call it as obstructive emphysema in the affected side. You know, air trapping is there. That means it is going to be one lung is going to be darker. That indicates there is more air trapped in that particular lung but still you will be able to see the bronchovascular markings. You see it's here, you're able to see the hyperinflation in the left side. Your diaphragm is flattened. You always have to differentiate from a congenital low bar emphysema. Always you need to look for collapse of the underlying or overlying lobes if it is going to be a CLE because sometimes if we don't look at it in an X-ray lobby, we can get confused. Always look at the X-ray in the X-ray lobby, even if it means that you need to walk 10 steps to go to the X-ray lobby. Other abnormalities. Yes, you can have localized hyperinflation or atelic cases, or sometimes air leak. You are able to see air like under the heart. This is like pneumopericardium here, you are able to see air in the subcutaneous tissue, surgical emphysema. Here you are able to see atelectasis. Rarely you will be able to see an opaque foreign body. Sometimes you will be able to see, see through even in a chest X-ray, you are able to see a small opaque foreign body. Finally, it turned out to be a small teeth which was aspirated and we were able to remove it by rigid bronchoscopy. And many a times a forgotten technique is an inspiration and expiration. Previously forced inspiration and forced expiration but even with a good inspiration and a good expiration you will be able to make out just like in this film. Here we have a doubt whether there is going to be a because it is slightly darker in the right side, but the expiratory film, you see the air trapping in the right side. This is an inspiratory expiratory technique. It is underutilized despite the contributions it can make. X-ray, sometimes there can be difficulty in, in, uh, in the interpretation. Sometimes if it, the patient has got a rotated film, it can cause a unilateral lung hyperlucency. It can mimic an air trapping. 
how can we overcome by doing the radio density ratio between the right and the left lung if it is going to be only due to positional then your radio density ratio is going to be less than 1 if the radio density ratio is going to be more than 1.1 that indicates there is air trapping and you have to proceed with a bronchoscopy fluoroscopy previously in uh, early 90s late 1980s we used to do fluoroscopy for making a diagnosis of like foreign body before the advent or much wider usage of flexible bronchoscopy computed tomography does not localize the foreign body it reveals only the parenchymal changes due to the effect of the foreign body previously virtual bronchoscopy was being tried in lieu of flexible scopy but it does not contribute much flexible bronchoscopy this is the investigation of choice for a diagnosis of a uh, foreign body aspiration or even when you are not able to when even when there is a possibility of foreign body aspiration because it reveals the site of foreign body nature of foreign body presence or absence of the granulation tissue which will not be revealed by any other investigation this granulation tissue picking up is going to be very important when the foreign body is going to be removed by the ENT surgeon if you tell them there is granulation tissue they'll be very careful while removing and it also helps the foreign body once you are able to find out what is the nature of the foreign body it helps the ENT surgeon beforehand itself to pick up the correct type of the ancillary instrument to remove the foreign body in the first attempt itself and when you are going to tell the ENT surgeon yes this child has got a foreign body in this particular location in the right side of the bronchus then they are mentally prepared even before they do the procedure and like uh, uh the you can remove flexible uh, foreign body by flexible bronchoscopy but the small caliber of suction channel this is one impediment number 2 prolonged time to grasp the foreign body and number 3 when you are going to try to remove the foreign body with flexible scopy the child has to breathe through the space around the scopy and not through the scope as in rigid bronchoscopy so you can remove a foreign body with the help of flexible bronchoscopy but at what cost we need to think of yes definitely the child even though we give oxygen supplementation there is going to be a risk of hypoxemia so wherever the chance is wherever you have the facility to have a rigid bronchoscopy that is the mode of choice for removal of a foreign body in the tracheobronchial tree just this is how a foreign body is going to look like when you are going to do a flexible bronchoscopy a video bronchoscopy here you know this is deep inside the left main bronchus you are able to visualize the foreign body it is a organic it is a groundnut seed there is no granulation tissue no pus outpouring but there is some inflammation ct like many a times when they have a suspicion of foreign body we have a tendency to even do a ct but make sure that ct is not the sensitive modality to diagnose a foreign body even though you can do tracheobronchial reconstruction you can try to find out the parenchymal changes it does not tell what is the nature of the foreign body it does not tell whether there is granulation tissue or not also the risk of ionizing radiation everyone has to keep that in mind see this is a child who had a sudden onset of respiratory distress with cough he was symptomatically treated with nebulis short acting beta 2 agonist the symptoms persisted so x ray antibiotics antibiotics changed the sim but the symptoms persisted he was referred to a higher center once the child did not improve with antibiotics but what did the parents do many times this happens they go to doctor another doctor doctor hopping is one common thing which the parents do and one more x ray 
it shows definitely there is air trapping in one side. So what happens? They immediately go and do a CT as well as a virtual bronchoscopy. This did not happen now. This happened long time back when I was in my home hospital that was in children's hospital. I was able to see this, get this record. This is a virtual bronchoscopy. You are not able to see the details in a virtual bronchoscopy. This is a carina, this is the left main bronchi, this is the right main bronchi. You are not able to see what is there in the right main bronchus, even though you know that there is some obstruction there in the right main bronchus. So finally, what happened? A flexible scopy, we are able to see granulation tissue and a foreign body, a vegetable foreign body, a groundnut, a half piece of groundnut. This was not picked out by any of the investigation, CT, X-ray, or even virtual bronchoscopy. So that is why we always say, whenever you have a suspicion of a, a foreign body aspiration, kindly do a flexible bronchoscopy so that you'll be able to make a diagnosis. This is the same child after removal of the foreign body. Notorious for causing a granulation tissue or these two, betel nuts and tamarind seed. Even a single day with betel nut inside the airway, you can see extensive granulation tissue. So management, removal is the treatment in foreign body aspiration. It all depends on the site of impaction of the foreign body. When do you do an emergency rigid bronchoscopy, especially if it is going to be in the larynx, subglottis, or trachea, when it is going to cause a central obstruction? If it is going to be in one of the main bronchus, then you can do it comparatively less airway problem, so you can do it electively too. Like rigid bronchoscopy is not available in all medical centers and not all ENT surgeons are good in doing a rigid scopy in small children, especially in less than 12 months, it needs a good skill. Otherwise, you can have bronchospasm. Also technical difficulties to remove, to catch the foreign body and remove it. Also, if you are not good in your technique, if the rigid scope or the forceps touches the bronchial wall or if you take a longer time to remove it, it can all lead to bronchospasm. Very rarely you can have complications. One is failure to extract, remove the foreign body. Second, you can injure the trachea. You can cause pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, sometimes injury even to the ocal cords. After the procedure, what complication can set in? You can have ocal cord edema. When it happens, how do you treat? We treat with steroids. Dexamethasone, it reduces the glottic edema in two days, like you give it for two days. If we have granulation tissue, even though none of the textbooks tells like to give steroids, this is what has been followed in ICH for a long period of time. When we see granulation tissue, we give steroids for five to seven days and paper and stop. And you have many algorithms when you have a suspected foreign body. If you have a foreign body, uh, if you have a witness choking, it is one, noisy breathing is one, unilateral reduced air entry is one, New onset recurrent or persistent V's is two, abnormal X-ray is two. If the score is less than one follow-up, score is two to three, then do a flexible scopy. If the score is four to five, a rigid scopy. A score is five means urgent rigid scopy. Otherwise, I will end up with rigid bronchoscopy if any one of the following, asphyxia, radio-opaque foreign body, unilaterally decreased breath sounds and obstructive emphysema, flexible bronchoscopy in all other cases. If flexible bronchoscopy identifies foreign body, rigid scopic removal is the ideal one. Yes, that is the end of my lecture, madam. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Gauri Shankar. Who else but those who worked in ICH, I think you would have seen any number of foreign bodies. 
any presentation central trekki and so many even in this short my of my uh, staying in pulmonology i have seen so many different types of foreign bodies in different places mobile migrate tree stuck with stable one year old three year old foreign bodies and all that so the, uh, thank you gauri shankar especially the scoring that you gave last that was really good when and any time you may suspect a foreign body definitely a scope i think there is no second thoughts about it anyone else there are no questions here i think you have been very clear everybody is hungry yeah uh, thank you madam on uh, behalf of iap tnc i thank uh, uh, dr gauri shankar and uh, as a convener he has organized a wonderful uh, uh, respiratory uh, uh, cme I thank you uh, really thankful to dr gauri shankar sir thank you dr gauri and i thank uh, dr elilar uh, sir madam and uh, vijay sagaran sir as a chair person for this uh, meeting and i thank all the uh, speakers dr somu sobalan dr sarath balaji and uh, dr sneha varki dr victor dr kalpana and dr antony and as well as dr mutiya priya uh, karpan and i thank our uh, beloved uh, uh, president dr ismail sir who has uh, given this opportunity for organizing this uh, event and dr ismail uh, present is that yeah a uh, few words uh, thank you rajendra i think it was a wonderful feast give the, the platter was so good i don't know which dish is uh, better much which is dish is tastier i don't know to say that uh, especially victor spoke in a very beautiful way and my friend gauri shankar and uh, anthony they were mesmerizing today especially sharad balaji all have done their justice to the topics and really though it is getting late i think the crowd it was really close to 250 odd people and i think uh, it is a wonderful feast given by the pulmonology thanks gauri shankar for organizing yes. and thank you for all the uh, speakers uh, iap uh, profoundly thank you for everything and i suppose thank rajendra for also coordinating this uh, big event thank you thank, thank you all wonderful uh, what a thanks dr tirumurugan yeah dr tirumurugan dr tiru yeah ah uh, cholunga sir hello sir yeah. what a thanks all edidinga yeah. yes sir okay sir <clears throat> i think uh, uh, pretty long cme with five hours and still more than 100 people 100 uh, people still listening to it let me start with, uh, uh, with with offering my thanks to dr gauri shankar who has been very patient in organizing a galaxy of uh, for true pulmonologists and intensive care specialists for this program i mean it's very rare to find such good set of uh, people and they are offering some excellent uh, speaker uh, talks and uh, so thank you sir i thank both the chair persons professor vijay sekaran and professor uh, elilarsi madam for uh, and staying throughout the program and uh, uh, organizing the i mean uh, conducting the topics very well thank you both of them uh, i thank all the speakers uh, i think uh, this is one of the very clear and uh, sim- yet uh, complex though the comp- comp- sorry the topics were complex they are well simplified so thanks to all the speakers i should thank our president and secretary uh, for organizing this cme actually dr rajendran takes a huge of, uh, effort in trying to organize so i i especially thank him i thank all the delegates who con- who uh, who stayed sat back till the end to listen to the uh, talks and also to give their uh, suggestions and to clarify questions and then to make this cme an interactive uh, one so thank you one and all so it's been wonderful having you I think the next cme is on pediatric endocrinology so hopefully we'll see you then thank you 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 madam thank you thank you madam thank you sir yes madam thank you dr thank you sir for the wonderful opportunity